excited to be with here, uh, here with you today. Um, welcome to the University of Michigan's um, Ford School and CFLP Conference on Consumer Protection in an Age of Uncertainty. Um, for those of you who have not met me before, I'm Michael Barr. I'm the dean here at the Ford School of Public Policy. Um, welcome to those of you who are uh, listening online as well. Um, and uh, we look forward to a great uh, conversation uh, today. Uh, what I hope we're going to do over the next um, two days is really have a, a look back at where we've been in consumer protection over the last decade and hopefully also a look forward over the next 10 years where we'd like to be um, in, a, in a world where we um, uh, can build a better set of consumer protections going forward. If you think back um, 10 years ago when President Obama um, came into office, um, our financial markets were frozen, uh, the country was uh, losing jobs, uh, we were facing the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Um, at the end of 2008, the beginning of 2009, our nation was losing 800,000 jobs a month, uh, which was just um, devastating uh, to businesses, to workers, to families, to households um, all over the country. Uh, many of us um, who are here over the uh, next two days uh, were in government together in 2009 and 2010. And we were focused not only on trying to repair the economy, but also on the urgent obligation to fix the failures in the financial system that helped trigger the crisis in the first place. Uh, the failures that led to that crisis had many causes. Um, regulators, as we're going to hear, were not really protecting consumers or investors. Households and firms took on risks they didn't understand. Legal loopholes and regulatory gaps allowed large parts of the financial sector uh, and markets to really avoid the kind of uh, oversight and transparency and restraint that was needed. There wasn't enough capital in the financial system to protect against losses. And in many ways, we tried to address all those concerns um, uh, to the best of our ability in the Dodd-Frank Act. And I, I think it did provide, in many ways, a strong foundation um, to build a more stable and resilient financial system, one that protects consumers and investors, that rewards innovation, that is able to adapt and evolve with changes in the financial market. I, I think, however, that that foundation is at extreme risk today, uh, as many of the reforms put in place in the wake of the last financial crisis are being eroded, and new risks are emerging that are going unaddressed. So we're here to really take stock of what has been accomplished so far, what work is still left to do, what progress is being stymied, what repairs will be needed in the future, and hopefully also what bold new ideas we should pursue in a new landscape. For the nearly one in seven American who, Americans who live in poverty or the millions of Americans who fear falling out of the middle class, the fa these families were really ill-prepared to handle the shock of the deep recession. They had little or no savings to fall back on and stood one medical emergency or one major unexpected car malfunction away from a personal economic crisis. They had no financial slack. When the financial crisis hit in 2008, families found themselves over leveraged and under resources. The federal government in many ways helped cushion that impact, but the household still faced huge setbacks. And for many of these families, they have not fully recovered from that crisis 10 years ago. What these families were and are now seeking is some measure, I think, of financial stability. Going forward, American families will undoubtedly need to try and save a larger share of income and borrow more responsibly. But households should not be left on their own to navigate a financial system that has become increasingly detached from their everyday needs. One of the critical ways we can help promote economic security is by making consumer financial markets work better for American families. Low and moderate income individuals often lack access to basic financial services that could help them cope better with a lack of financial slack in their lives. Facing serious economic and structural constraints, these households turn to a variety of formal and informal institutions to meet their financial services needs. 
to receive their income, to pay their bills, to borrow, and to save. But the way our financial system is structured often makes transacting, saving, and borrowing more expensive and less useful for these families, for the families who need it the most. So at this conference, we're going to be talking a lot about financial access. We'll also be spending a lot of time talking about the CFPB. Uh, those of you who are uh, familiar with this landscape know that um, in the lead-up to the crisis, our financial system was largely incapable of supporting a successful regulatory structure for consumer protection. Fragmentation of rule writing, supervision, and enforcement made it impossible to create a comprehensive and well-calibrated consumer protection system. Jurisdiction and authority for consumer protection was spread over many federal regulators, all of whom had higher priorities than protecting consumers. Banks could choose the least restrictive supervisor among many providers, uh, many different banking agencies, and a large number of non-bank providers from home mortgage originators to payday lenders escaped any meaningful supervision completely. With the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, we had a chance and still have a chance to do more than play catch up in regulating consumer financial markets. The Bureau provide, uh, provided a historic opportunity to build a successful regulatory structure for consumer protection, one that is designed to promote financial inclusion, preserve consumer choice, provide for more efficient and innovative markets for consumer financial markets. And the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau provided, for the first time, a consumer agency with the necessary mission focus, market-wide coverage, and consolidated authority. As we'll hear from many of our speakers, under Elizabeth Warren, under Rich Cordray, under many of the speakers who are here uh, today, the CFPB got a lot done. Uh, with new oversight of mortgages, payday lending, prepaid cards, credit cards, arbitration clauses, and the like, and tough enforcement that brought in $12 billion in fees and restitution. But today, much of that work is at risk. Reforms, in some respects, have been weakened. And there's a real concern about the direction of the agency today. We'll have several panels focused on the CFPB's past and future, as well as on the key consumer finance markets and how to make progress. We're also going to be talking about investor protection. There are a host of issues here, from reforms in the mortgage markets to cleaning up derivative rules, but we thought we'd focus today and tomorrow on one particular longstanding problem, advice provided to investors by their brokers. We'll also be hearing a lot about student loans and issues which are really issues near and dear to many uh, of our students and many others in the audience. What protections have worked? What crises lie ahead? And what can we do to reduce the risks of them going forward? The financial crisis led to fundamental reforms of our financial system, but the process of reform is not over. American families can ill afford a financial system that imposes unnecessary costs, confusion, and complications on their daily lives. Our country must take the steps necessary to ensure that the financial system works better for everyone, and this conference will help us move these issues forward. I'm thrilled to welcome so many distinguished speakers from a wide variety of backgrounds, including many old friends. We have an outstanding group of speakers and panelists joining us over the next two days, academic experts and leaders from disciplines, market makers, policymakers, rule enforcers, uh, what John Lewis would call people who make good trouble. Uh, and I'm also especially delighted to thank our keynote speakers, founding CFPB Director Rich Cordray, who we'll hear from over lunch, and Rohit Chopra of the FTC. Our speakers will take up a wide variety of issues uh, over the next two days. I'm really happy to welcome you um, here. Uh, but before we get underway, I want to talk a little bit about some logistics um, for the next couple of days. Um, we're going to stay in this room for the keynote and panel discussions uh, with coffee and snack breaks out in the Great Hall outside these doors. At the end of each keynote or panel conversation, we're going to open the floor to questions. Um, we're video recording uh, today's conference, and we'll be live streaming it as well. Welcome to those of you who are watching online. Uh, let me just say, for those of you who are here but haven't registered, if you wouldn't mind in the coffee break going out and registering so that we can keep in touch with you and you can get access to the materials that um, come out of the next uh, couple of days uh, of discussion. 
Um, our keynote speaker, um, Rich Cordray, is going to speak at lunch, as I mentioned. So when lunchtime comes, we're going to ask you to move out to the Great Hall uh, pretty quickly, uh, bring your lunch back in pretty quickly, uh, and sit here um, uh, and eat in the, um, in the Annenberg Auditorium so we can have the full amount of time uh, with Rich. Um, those of you who are sitting in the back um, rows, um, you'll see little tabletops you can pull up so you don't need to eat uh, on your lap. Uh, those of you in the front, uh, you can certainly move to the front if you're sitting in the back, as I always tell my students. Um, uh, but uh, uh, please um, uh, get organized quickly over lunch. Um, restrooms are out the door to the right and around the corner near the elevators. Uh, those should be um, uh, easy to find. Um, lastly, I have uh, quite a number of thank yous to give because an event like this takes quite a number of people um, to pull off. Um, let me uh, start by thanking all of the speakers, all of you who are sharing your time and expertise with us today. Uh, the Center on Finance, Law, and Policy is working with the Ford School of Public Policy on this event, so I'm thankful to myself for co-sponsoring um, the event. Um, I want to thank a number of our student groups who are working with us, Affordable Michigan, the Bankruptcy Law Society, the Business Law Association, the Consumer Advocacy and Financial Regulation Organization, and Michigan FinTech. Uh, so you'll see many students over the next um, a couple of days. Um, let me thank, um, in particular, the Center on Finance, Law, and Policy staff. I'm Christy Baer, who um, you've been corresponding with, and Tracy Van Dusen, who you've been um, connecting with as well, I think is still out in the, in the hallway. They do um, in extraordinary work to make this event happen. I also want to thank um, Ford School staff who are working with us um, in addition to their day jobs helping out um, with this conference. Uh, Tom Cook, Bill Kelly, um, Eric Vandenveter, Miriam Negarim, Bonnie Roberts, C.U. Nitsos, Damian Swack, Susanna Wisely, and Islam Mubarak. Um, I also want to thank the Ford School communications team, Laura Lee, Catherine Carver, Chris Myers, Becky Molin, Aaron Flores, and Nick Faust. Um, we also um, would like to thank um, financial supporters of the CFLP in this conference, um, University of Michigan alumni Paul Lee, John Loomis, and Bill Marcoux. Um, let me also thank um, all of the um, uh, CFLP's uh, research assistants, uh, especially Maitri and Anathram, Elizabeth Felbrugge, Graves Lee, Abigail DeHart, and Aviv Halpern, who worked on this conference. Finally, um, thanks to all of you for being here today. I'm looking forward to the conversations to come. And with that, I've waited long enough for Lisa to arrive, and we can um, start, the, start the first panel. I, you know, I can, I can stretch out. One of the great things you learn as a, as a faculty member is you can shorten or stretch out your marks to any length needed for the occasion. Um, so I'm really delighted um, to welcome our first panel um, this morning, and I'm going to turn things over to Eric to get us started. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks. Okay. In case we get our moment of levity. Sorry. Uh, do -do -do -do. Sorry. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> oh, I'll set. Thanks, Michael. I'm one of the people that we spent a couple hours every uh, five minutes <laughs> um, <laughs> during the uh, Dodd-Frank process, and it's, it's great to be here in Ann Arbor. The architects of Dodd-Frank established CFPB so it could address the glaring weaknesses in the regulation of financial institutions to protect consumers that were exposed by the financial crisis and which almost sunk the world economy. Root of the crisis was a consumer protection failure of massive proportions, 
where millions of borrowers received mortgages that were designed in ways that made failure more likely than not, in which they were entirely unable to repay. As a result, millions of families unnecessarily lost their houses, causing untold pain and loss of wealth to families and communities. These foreclosures had ripple effects through the financial system because of little-known leveraged bets financial institutions placed on them. These financial system failures had ripple effects through the real economy, causing large unemployment, more defaults, more misery that we're yet to recover from. How were all these bad mortgage loans possible? There are several reasons. First, there was no market intelligence or early warning system to even recognize the problem until it was too late. Second, there was no one entity responsible for tracking or addressing consumer protection problems in the financial arena. In fact, several agencies, as Michael mentioned, several agencies at the federal level had consumer protection responsibilities for banks, and the FTC had limited enforcement authority for non-banks. Um, the Federal Reserve had rule writing authority under a number of statutes, but consumer protection was not their top priority and couldn't really have been expected to be. They had to deal with safety and soundness of banks and bank holding companies, monetary policy to control inflation and promote full employment, payment systems. All this stuff came before consumer protection. Third, preemption of state mortgage lending protections, such as those, those passed by North Carolina, where I'm from. By, fed, by federal banking regulators and limited ability for state attorneys general to fill the breach was another problem. Fourth, there were virtually no substantive rules protecting borrowers in mortgage lending. The classic abusive mortgage during the boom time was the 228 subprime loan. Over half of the loans that minority families received during the boom were these subprime very bad mortgages. They were often originated by mortgage brokers under a compensation structure that incented the broker to put borrowers in these mortgages, even if they um, qualified for a conventional middle-class mortgage. Um, they were often originated on behalf of large, unregulated non-banks, like Countrywide, New Century, AmeriQuest, and usually sold to private label security investors through Wall Street. They often did not document income or assets, promoting fraud in what brokers reported. The loans often did not amortize, so they had teaser payments as interest-only loans, or in the case of 228s, teaser rates, both leading to huge unsustainable payment shock that families simply could not absorb. And to top it off, there was a, often a very large prepayment penalty, which took the family's equity as a, a quid pro quo of being able to get out of a bad loan and into a good one. The amazing thing was that all these mortgage features, other than the outright fraud that the system promoted and ignored, were legal at the time. It is kind of amazing to contemplate. And finally, a fifth problem was that there was no federal entity to supervise non-bank lenders, as well as entities like the credit bureaus, which have a huge impact on who gets loans and at what cost. That's quite a list of consumer protection failures that helped lead to the financial crisis. And of course, mortgages weren't the only type of product where these kind of problems existed. It was just the largest one. A few additional examples, Michael mentioned many of them, payday loans, student loans, overdraft charges by banks, tricks and traps with credit cards and prepaid cards. The Dodd-Frank solution, I think, still was a wise one. Create one federal agency with the mandate to protect consumers of financial products and arm it with a toolkit sufficient to the task capable of addressing the failures I just discussed. First, establish one agency with independence from political pressures by Congress or the administration. This independence is the case with all other federal uh, safety and soundness regulators and is probably even more important for an agency to protect consumers. Second, the agency would serve a market monitoring function and be informed by a complaint database where consumers across the country could obtain redress so problems in mortgage lending wouldn't have come as such a surprise. Third, recognizing that CFPB may not have all the answers or that there may be times when CFPB is not sufficiently rigorous in protecting consumers, the agency's rules would serve as a floor and not a ceiling. As a result, states could enforce their own laws that are more protective of consumers than CFPB's rules. Also, state attorneys general could enforce CFPB's rules in case CF CFPB decided at a particular time not to. Fourth, provide the agency with the rule writing authority that was shared among different federal agencies. These rules would establish a level playing field for banks and non-banks. 
They'd also prevent responsible lenders and providers from having to relax their standards to compete with others who don't have those views. Fifth, the agency would supervise large banks and large non-banks and all mortgage lenders. Sixth, it would also have enforcement authority in case supervision is not enough and its regulated entities don't follow its rules. That was the vision that the Dodd-Frank architects had to address the problems that led to the crisis. I think what, I think what our panel is going to do is talk about those different tools and how they've been applied, how they might be applied in the future. So if, after that uh, lead in, I think I'll introduce the, um, each panelist once they're about to talk. I think Peggy Tui is going to come first. She's the Assistant Director for Supervision Policy at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me here. And thank you for asking me to come to Treasury uh, back in 2009. It's been, uh, ever since then, it's been interesting, challenging uh, to be involved as the CFPB story continues to unfold. Um, as Eric said, um, uh, I'm head of supervision policy which at, at CFPB, which has the responsibility of setting strategy for both the bank and non-bank supervision program, as well as ensuring that as we supervise our, um, the, the calls we make on legal violations and how we apply uh, our expectations are consistent across the bank and non-bank markets. Um, I want to say a little bit about my background before Michael asked me to come over to Treasury and before I got started with CFPB because that informs my remarks and my perspective that you'll hear today. Um, and before that, I was at the Federal Trade Commission, so I spent most of my career in, um, in the public sector, and I was in, at the Federal Trade Commission in the Division of Financial Practices, which, as Eric mentioned, um, only has jurisdiction over non-banks and primarily uh, enforcement authority as a tool. So um, with that background in mind, I want to talk about three different things. One is, um, from my viewpoint, given that background, how I think the oversight of compliance with federal consumer financial law has um, uh, improved with the creation of the Bureau and what difference the supervision program of the Bureau has made. And in particular, I want to mention the supervision of the credit bureaus, of the largest consumer reporting agencies, as well as the furnishers to those systems, and talk about why I think that was a significant addition to the federal oversight landscape for consumers. Um, and then third, I was going to talk about also, um, I saw something in the materials about technology. We're supposed to be talking about technology. Um, so I want to talk about some of the benefits and pitfalls that the Bureau has found um, as institutions rely and perhaps increasingly, increasingly rely on technology to facilitate compliance. So that's part and parcel of just the way things are done these days, as you all know. So as was mentioned by Michael and Eric, um, before the crisis, there was no agency with supervisory and enforcement authority over, over both the banks and non-banks. Um, to oversee compliance with federal consumer law. The FTC had enforcement authority only, um, and therefore that meant there was limited ability to really prevent violations from occurring. The primary tool was after the fact law enforcement. So when there was smoke coming out, hopefully not of the hotel we're, we're, we're staying in, um, but smoke coming out, um, you know, the law enforcers see that smoke goes in, tries to stop the fire and get, you know, any... Uh, any remedies back to consumers that were injured, as opposed to going in and making sure that those alarms are working. Um, they are we working. heard this morning. <laughs> They're working. <laughs> and uh, so that uh, the fire can be stopped at the earliest point or prevented, uh, better yet, prevented uh, in the first place. Um, so now, um, eight years later, um, it's a completely different consumer protection regulatory landscape. The Bureau not only has enforcement authority, but supervisory authority as well. And that extends across the largest banks and uh, many of the non-banks that are basically, some of them, in the exact same markets doing very similar things. And so we can see across that landscape as we do our supervisory work. Um, so we've built our supervisory program, and I guess I should mention, I'm using that word as if everyone knows what that means. That's where um, basically examiners can go in to the institution. It can be on-site or off-site, but we have the authority to ask for information 
from the bank or the non-bank about how they're complying with the law. We have the ability to ask for information to help the examiners assess compliance with the law. And we can look for risk to consumers. So it's all very um, ongoing, real-time information gathering and assessment as opposed to a longer, stretched out um, investigatory process. Um, so it's, it's basically the primary tool is sending an exam teams to be on site to engage with the company officials, ask them about what they're doing, what their compliance systems are, and to evaluate, do transaction testing, and to evaluate whether they're complying with the law. So we've built this um, program, and the foundation is to ensure that entities have compliance management systems in place and that they are engaging in ongoing self-monitoring and correction, um, and including where they evaluate the root cause of any problems, and they put into place um, anything that's needed to try to address those root causes. So that's the basic goal, to, um, to aim at prevention of law violations in the first place. It's more comprehensive um, than solely looking after the fact whether they violated the law. It's trying to make sure they have systems in place to ensure that doesn't happen in the first place. That's the primary goal. And because we prioritize our supervisory work based on risk, it also provides an incentive to meet those expectations in that if we go in and we see a bank or a non-bank with a very robust compliance management system, then we are assured that they are doing this self-monitoring, self-correction, and we, the CFPB, don't have to spend as many of our resources going back as early and often to look at what they're doing. Conversely, if we're troubled by what we see, then they're higher on our risk uh, metrics, and then they're scheduled for examination reviews more frequently. And what we found is that many non-banks, and banks, by the way, um, have indeed improved with this kind of oversight because our oversight, as, as compared to the past, first and foremost, is solely focused on consumer compliance. That's our only focus, not as the other regulators had a combined focus that was prior preeminently concerned with safety and soundness and other compliance issues. Um, so we, we have seen improvement, especially but not only in the non-bank marketplace, where they now have compliance managed systems in place that they never had before. Um, one example of that is um, the biggest consumer reporting uh, agencies. Um, the consumer reporting market, as many of you know, plays a critical role um, in our economy, in consumers' lives. It has such an enormous reach and impact. Um, over 200 million Americans have credit files with the biggest credit bureaus, um, and trade lines are furnished um, voluntarily by over 10,000 providers. Um, and it's probably a given how important these credit reports can be in so many aspects of consumers' lives. And also to those that use the credit reports, it's important um, to the businesses that use it that, that it be accurate. But it, um, it's interesting to me, um, kind of surprising, that um, despite this critical importance of this infrastructure, until the CFPB, there was no federal or state agency that had oversight authority to go in and monitor compliance had supervisory authority, not the states, not the federal government. It was only, again, the FTC with kind of, and, and the states with kind of this after-the-fact law enforcement authority. And so the CFPB, one of the first things we did when we needed to establish a rule to be able to supervise some of the non-banks, uh, our first priority was uh, establishing a rule that would let the CFPB oversee the credit bureaus. And so we did that. And so now we have had a regular ongoing supervision program um, with respect to um, the largest consumer reporting agencies. And indeed, we have found, and we did um, a special report on this, a supervisory highlights report in March 2017, um, and I don't, I, probably won't go into the details here, but indeed we have found that that kind of oversight and that kind of um, ongoing look by a regulator to see what they were doing to proactively try to comply with the law 
has resulted in them increasing their quality management uh, in various respects. And so that kind of oversight, that kind of asking the questions, that kind of expectation and evaluation of compliance management, um, we think uh, has made a difference. It's not the complete or total answer, but we think that has made a difference and has been um, a good start. But in addition, it's not just the consumer reporting agencies. The Bureau has been able to look holistically at the whole system. So. Um, many of the inputs are at issue for the credit reporting system, the banks and the non-banks that furnish the data to the credit bureaus. And we can look at that, too. We can look at the largest banks um, and their furnishing practices and whether they were complying with the Fair Credit Reporting Act responsibilities they had, as well as the key non-banks. Um, that would be mortgage companies, credit card issuers, debt collectors. Um, and so we were able to look at different aspects of it to make sure we're covering it all. And indeed, we found um, with many of the depository institutions, um, they had not really prioritized um, looking at compliance with their furnishing activities. They hadn't really been overseen for that. So guess what? That was a little bit of a compliance backwater, and, and we put a spotlight on that. We've looked at that. We found some violations, have cited those violations, and um, have, have directed them to improve their compliance. Um, so that's just one example of the kinds of um, observations we've had and the difference this ongoing oversight um, makes in, in my view and in my experience. So just a little bit about the technology picture, um, turning to that. So um, as I mentioned, uh, many financial institutions, many uh, entities of all types, um, increasingly uh, use technology to facilit facilitate their processes and procedures, and in this case, compliance. Um, and so we found that um, um, some of that is, is um, really facilitated by service providers that set up compliance systems for all kinds of different entities. And one key provision um, that's, I think, little known and little understood in Dodd-Frank that was in there is that the Bureau has the ability to go look and directly at the service riders. And that has been, I think, very important in this technology area where we can go kind of to the heart of who's providing the te technology to maybe a number of entities. And if there's a root cause issue, we can uh, detect it and assess it and, again, um, direct them to fix it. Um, we can also just have the same expectations over them that I talked about with the other entities to try to ensure that they proactively pay attention to all the technological details that might come into play when, say, a regulation changes and there needs to be change management uh, properly executed and tested. Um, and so that's been, um, that's been an important part about what we, of what we've done in looking at those technology issues. So I think I'll stop there. Eric? Thank you, Pete. Next, we'll hear from Nick Smith. Uh, he's the Senior Deputy Attorney General and Assistant Director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection of the Pennsylvania Office of the Attorney General. Thanks, Eric. It's a mouthful, and Nick. <laughs> <laughs> it's too long. Um, <clears throat> and thank you, Michael, for having us here today. Uh, thank you for letting me come work for you at Treasury <laughs> in 2009. And Peggy and Eric, thank you for uh, giving me my first job. Um, <laughs> So I, I started at Treasury and worked there with, with these good folks, um, and then I went to the CFPB, and I was an enforcement attorney there for four and a half years. Um, and then I went into private practice because I wanted to move back to Pittsburgh, where I'm from. Um, did that for a little while, and for the past year and a half, I've been with Attorney General Josh Shapiro running his Consumer Financial Protection Unit. Um, some people refer to us as a mini CFPB. That would be less of a mouthful, I think, than my <laughs> official title. Um, but I, I really enjoy the work at the state level. And today I'm going to talk about two things. One is sort of what state AGs are doing to fill the gap with the federal agencies perhaps doing less uh, in terms of consumer protection. And then second, um, I want to talk about what we did when I was at the Bureau that involved uh, technology and, and changing technology. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll start with the, the first thing, which is the U.S. bank case at the CFPB. And <clears throat> this ties in nicely with what Peggy just told you about exams, because um, back in the early days of the CFPB, uh, in, in Rich, Rich's tenure, um, we actually assigned enforcement attorneys to go out on exams and provide exam support. Um, and the official purpose of that was to give 
enforcement attorney's experience learning about the exam process, and I think it was a really, really great thing. Um, the, in, the entities hated it, and the industry rebelled, and, and Rich probably d didn't hear about anything more than that for about six months. And so finally, um, the Bureau decided not to send enforcement attorneys out on exams anymore. But I had the good fortune of being assigned to an exam of U.S. Bank, um, which was a special review to look at this program called the U.S. Miles Program. And it ended up becoming an enforcement action, which is why I can talk about it with you today. Otherwise, exams are totally confidential. Um, but it was, uh, it was a program that was designed for enlisted service members. It was called MILES. And to the bank's credit, I, I don't want to give them a too bad of a name. Um, it was actually a program set up by another bank, which they had acquired. And it was one of those examples of a situation where these big banks were gobbling up lots of smaller banks and non-banks and not necessarily paying much attention to what was going on. So this program um, was a subprime auto loan, very high interest rates, like 17 18% APR. Um, and they had, I think, about 50,000 customers uh, over the course of about a decade. Um, and we looked at it because we got a complaint, and there's a video probably still on the CFPB's website from a, a father of a, a soldier um, and his father wrote into the CFPB and said, you know, my son is spending basically all of his after-tax income on this car loan. Uh, he had, I think, a $500 payment monthly, and it was, like, you know, a brand-new pickup truck, of course. Um, and then he was spending two or $300 on insurance, the rest on gas, and his whole take-home pay was like $1,100. So he really didn't have much money to spend other than the truck. Um, so we, we looked at into the, the program, and the issue that we found um, actually had to do with a lot, a, an allotment program. And allotments are a means of payment that the military set up 100 years ago, maybe longer. Um, basically, before the time of online banking, consumers needed to be able to, when they were deployed at war, they needed to be able to make sure their bills still got paid. And so service members could direct the DOD pay office to pay their mortgage, uh, you know, their, their financing for their horse and buggy, um, you know, their, their mother, like whoever they wanted to send payments to. And this system existed for a long time and worked fine. But flash forward to the 2000s where now everybody in the military is required to have a bank account and almost every bank offers free online bill pay and free ACH transfers. Um, this, uh, this allotment system was obsolete and not, really not necessary anymore. Um, but there was a whole industry around military bases that had cropped up that figured out that if they required service members to pay via allotment, um, they would basically eliminate any risk that they would not get paid because they would get paid straight out of the paycheck. And even though a service member could turn off the allotment, there's a real um, emphasis for junior enlisteds on paying your bills and not falling behind, and you can lose your security clearance if you get a bad uh, thing on your credit report. So there are still today a lot of shady lenders and creditors outside military bases, but before our case, they all required payment by allotment, and it made it much easier for them to prey on service members. Um, U.S. Bank's Miles Program did the same thing. You were expected and required to pay with an allotment. and um, the problem that we found that U.S. Bank was doing was they had uh, a third-party service provider that was processing and setting up the allotments and charging service members a $3.50 monthly fee for that, that service. Um, they were not disclosing that fee as part of the Truth in Lending Act disclosure. And without getting into too much technical detail, basically this was an extra $200 over the course of the auto loan that, that service members were not being told about up front as part of the cost of the loan. And that was a violation of TILA. Um, so that was one of the findings. We also had some deceptive marketing of add-on products. Uh, they had a, a vehicle service contract, an extended warranty, basically, that they were selling, and also gap insurance. And their call center in Kentucky was was calling people and telling them it's it's just pennies a day to have this extra product, and you might as well buy it. And in fact, the cost wasn't pennies a day. It was like 40 cents a day or something, which is significantly more than pennies. Um, so we found that was a, a deceptive uh, practice. And we ended up taking two uh, consent orders, one with U.S. Bank, 
I think they paid about three and a half million dollars back to service members. And then another one with uh, Dealers Financial Services, which was the non-bank marketing partner that had the call center in Kentucky. Um, and uh, we required them to, to give, you know, $7 million in total back to service members, including the one whose father had complained to us in, in the early days. Um, is that on the complaint database? Or com it, it is, yeah. It's probably <laughs> in the complaint database. Um, Served a purpose. And like I said, there's a great video. I think his name is Ari. Um, there's a video of the, of the father and the son uh, that, that the CFPB made. And I think Elizabeth Warren made a video, too. Um, but anyway, the, the reason I mention this case is because we didn't just stop there with the, the settlement and, and requiring them to give the money back. I, was, um, I worked with Holly Petraeus in the early days at the Bureau, and she led the Office of Service Member Affairs. And, of course, she was very interested in this case, and we kept her team apprised as it was moving along. And afterwards, um, when we announced the, the settlements, um, she used that to go to the Pentagon and say, hey, look at this allotment program. This, this service member was, had to pay an extra $200 because of this, this allotment program, and you've got all these shady lenders around bases that are taking advantage of the allotment program. You should really take a hard look at allotments and think about if it's still worth having. And so um, the Pentagon set up a working group. I was the policy lead for the CFPB, and we had Holly and, and Seth Propman on her team. Um, and a long, make a long story short, it took many meetings, but we convinced the Pentagon to ban the use of allotments for consumer credit. Um, it, they still exist for, I think, like paying rent and a couple other small things. I think you can still pay your mortgage through an allotment, but um, you can't make a, pay a car loan or purchase any uh, jewelry or other product outside a military base and repay it through allotments. So that was, um, I think, a good example of the CFPB embracing innovation um, back under under Cordray. I know now the CFPB is making a new push with, with a sandbox and, and other things that they claim will, will help consumer-friendly innovation, and maybe we'll talk about them later. But um, I think it's important to point out that the CFPB has always been in favor of innovation that's actually good for consumers. And in that case, we actively said, here's this old system that's not good for consumers. Let's do away with it and encourage people to use the free bill pay and online banking that is, is much better for them um, that, than the old system. Uh, so I want to shift to state AGs filling the gap. A lot of people are writing articles about how state AGs are beefing up consumer financial protection efforts, and, it, and it's true. We are. Um, I think the CFPB is irreplaceable, and... It is still doing incredibly important work, and, and I was happy to hear from Peggy this morning that much of the exam work is still going on and, and, and strong. And um, I mean, the, the AGs cannot replace the CFPB, but what we can do is we can be on the, on the cutting edge, I think, take on the cases that may be ones that the new director are, is not willing to take on and not willing to bring. And, and we have seen that the number of enforcement actions has dropped dramatically since uh, Acting Director Mulvaney and Director Craninger uh, took over. Um, so a couple of things we're working on. One is the Navient lawsuit. Um, that's one where we, the CFPB has it, an ex outstanding case against Navient. They filed in January of 2017. Um, there are also five state AG lawsuits against Navient. Um, and I think that's a good example of somewhere that the CFPB is still doing really good work. I mean, their case is still moving. They're litigating it really hard against the lawyers on the other side. Um, they're, they're doing great work on discovery. They're, and they're a good partner to the states, and I want to I recognize that. Um, at the same time, the states are working very hard as well on our own lawsuits because we recognize um, that the CFPB lawsuit, something could happen to it. I mean, there has been public speculation in the media about meetings with the CEO of Navient. Um, so we are hopeful that the CFPB will keep up its, its good work on that case, but we're not counting our chickens, and we're, um, we're pursuing our lawsuits as though they're the only ones out there, and, and we need to do that. Um, so that's an exciting case. Um, I'm happy to talk more about the substantive allegations there. Um, there's also Equifax. Uh, everyone knows the, there's a multi-state investigation of the Equifax data breach that the AGs are, are working on. 
Um, that's an exciting one. And I, I think I'll just explain what a multi-state is because some people may not know. Um, back in the 90s, state AGs started working together in a very formal way um, to investigate the tobacco companies. And they institutionalized this process of actually um, banding together and sharing resources and, and signing common interest agreements. And it's become a really powerful way for AGs to do work against these big national uh, entities. And it's particularly helpful for smaller AG offices where they may only have five people in consumer protection for the whole state. Um, so Equifax is an example of that where, of course, every state is, is interested in that case. Another good example of that was Wells Fargo. Um, we announced the settlement in December of 2018. Uh, $550 million was, uh, was paid to the states. And this stemmed from the cases of the, the accounts, the uh, unnecessary accounts that people created, and also the forced placed auto insurance. Um, that was a case where the CFPB had done its own actions. They settled one uh, in April of 2018, and uh, we, we took a look at that, and we thought we need to do our own. Uh, there's, there's, there's more to be done there. Um, and the public settlement um, includes some findings that went beyond what the CFPB found, uh, and it was, a, it was a good example, I think, of Wells Fargo realizing like, okay, the AGs, they're going to they're gonna hold our feet to the fire. And I, there's a lot I can't talk about that's confidential there, um, but suffice it to say that I think the AG's involvement was, was very helpful in that, in that matter. Um, another, another case that I want to mention that's just a, a smaller one, but which is, is a fun one, is the, the Dominion Cash Point case. Um, so this is an example of where state AGs try to stop some of the, the cross-border stuff that goes on. Um, in Pennsylvania, we have a usury limit, like many states. So payday lending is effectively illegal in Pennsylvania. And there's a company called Dominion Cash Point that was based in Delaware and was making usurious title loans to consumers from Pennsylvania. They were advertising in Pennsylvania. They had uh, a website directed toward Pennsylvania borrowers with, with PA in the URL. Um, <laughs> and they encouraged Pennsylvanians to just drive across the border to Delaware and take out a title loan. Um, the company has gone out of business, but we sued them because uh, they took $5 million from Pennsylvania borrowers, and we want them to pay back the legal interest portion of that, which is about $3 million. So um, this was my first state court case. I only got to work on federal cases at the Bureau, and Navient is also filed in federal court. So. I got to learn about the procedures of the Philadelphia court system, um, and fortunately, I have good lawyers in our Philly office to, to tutor me along the way, and I'm constantly bugging them about how that works. But um, you know, th this is a case where the owners took all this money from consumers. Um, they've now squirreled it away in trusts, and uh, they're trying to keep it in, away from our, our hands. Um, and we realized that they just weren't going to going to give us the money unless we sued them. And so now we're in discovery in that case. It's a very fast timeline, I think scheduled for trial like later this year. Um, so that's an example of the kind of thing the AGs can do and have to do where you might not see the CFPB suing such a small company, although some of the RESPA actions were against pretty small companies. Um, but the AGs, we have to take on people at all different levels, from the biggest Wells Fargo to to the really smaller ones. Um, and Dominion's not even the smallest. We do home improvement contractor cases where there's like 10 people who got bad plumbing lines put in their basement. Um, I don't work on those cases. I only do consumer finance, but that's what the AG consumer protection offices have to do. So um, I guess I just, wanna, I just wanna close by emphasizing what I said before, which is we can't replace the CFPB, but we're doing our best. We're, we're shifting resources away from the plumbers and towards the Wells Fargo's. Um, and we're going to continue to do that. Uh, I know other states are doing the same thing. Um, I'm going out to, to New Jersey to help talk to them about what they can do. What th they, they've got some new folks there, and they're really excited to do more in consumer finance. Um, I'm going to visit with the Michigan AG's office in the coming months, uh, the new AG here. So, um, you know, I think there's interest all over the country in terms of doing more in consumer financial protection. And 
as long as we keep working hard, uh, I think we can survive the next two to four years until we have a new director of the CFPB. Thanks, Nick. Lisa Donner is next and with us. She's the executive director of the Americans for Financial Reform. And thanks, Michael, uh, for inviting me. Um, maybe uh, I should I should start by saying it's, it's uh, there are a lot of people in this room who played a huge role from the inside in uh, building the Consumer Bureau at different stages of its of its life. And I feel like we and our partners played a played a role from the outside. But maybe that makes it easier for me to say uh, as a as a framing uh, device that though we clearly are facing a bunch of challenges right now with the change in leadership of the bureau, I do think it's really important to. Um, take a moment and celebrate actually what a huge success um, the Bureau has been and what a difference it has made in consumer protection, what a difference it has made in changing the rules and changing the extent to which institutions feel like they have to follow the rules, and what a difference is made in actually leaving us, despite the challenges of this moment, in a stronger position, I think, to keep doing better than that, um, both on consumer regulation and, frankly, on financial regulation beyond that. Uh, so I do, I do think that's worth celebrating and important to celebrate. And I don't say that at all to say, you know, our work is done, I think, even apart from the challenges of the moment. First, I think one of the really important lessons of uh, the history of the Bureau and of the fights around it has been that we need to set the bar higher um, in terms of what we expect and demand on consumer financial regulation and on outcomes for people and on financial regulation generally. Um, and so we should be satisfied for that reason. And then also maybe two people have talked about a little about Wells here, but thinking about an institution like that where on the one hand there's been some good regulatory work and some good kind of speaking up from below on the part of the workers. And uh, some changes have been forced, and yet uh, we have this giant institution that where you know every time you look, there is another round of really troubling abuses in a different part of the business. And so clearly we haven't solved the problem of, of making fundamental change at, a, at an institution like that that touches so many lives. All right, so first, um, a couple comments on, on what worked uh, I, uh, and then or some contributions to the discussion of what worked, then on some of the, the, the frightening things happening at the moment uh, and then a little on, on what next. Um, you know, uh, stating the, the obvious to an audience that knows this well, but uh, the, the Bureau in, it, in this first phase of it, in the first phase of its life, did what it was supposed to do, right? It used the set of tools that it was given uh, and the um, sort of structural features that were baked into it uh, to uh, uh, pursue its mission, and that added up to a significant impact, including the $12 billion in consumer relief that we talk about all the time, but it's more than that, right, because of practices that got changed by those enforcement actions, so it wasn't just the $12 million to, to those people. Um, and include and significant rulemakings that both stopped major harms, uh, like the kind of lending that was at the root of the crisis, and, and set guardrails for sort of more emerging products and markets, like in the prepaid uh, space. Uh, incredibly important. Um, and I think, you know, Eric talked a little bit about the sort of structural features and the design of the Bureau, and I think Mike's going to talk a little bit more about some uh, particular rules and market changes as examples of this. So I wanted to talk a second about more of sort of the choices, uh, process and structural choices that the Bureau made that helped uh, enable the some of those successes and I think are useful lessons for effective regulation. And I think we should spend the time uh, to talk more to the people who know this stuff much better than me, the people on the inside, to think through uh, some of these lessons as well. I think the focus on being consumer facing and treating consumers as the agency's constituency and building structures and processes to maintain that mission focus uh, are incredibly important. Uh, you know, so the failures, and Eric talked about this in the, in the bank regulatory world to do this, were partially about mission, uh, not having a consumer protection mission uniquely, uh, but not only, I mean, the SEC has a very substantial consumer protection mission that it has often failed to pay much attention to that element of its mission. And minding safety and, and soundness um, ought to be uh, 
uh, not just about uh, uh, minding it from the perspective of each individual institution, but from the perspective of the system and the public, uh, which is different, a different perspective on safety and soundness. And, and there are a bunch of structural forces that move uh, financial regulators away from a public interest focus, including just the power and money of the banks, and then all the little ways that that's manifest, even when we are being, we sort of the consumer advocacy community are being really active and engaged, there are not as many of us. We're never going to have even a fraction of the meetings, for example, with a friendly regulator uh, that industry does. There's all kinds of data that they have that we don't have. Uh, and so we, we won't, there's no way to understand those things unless a regulator uh, is taking that responsibility and serving the public and doing it. So I think. Uh, for example, the choice to um, not just, I mean, the, the complaint database was a statutory requirement, but making it public uh, was a choice. And then move, taking the next step to make the narratives public uh, was a choice. And all those things, I think, kind of lock in a virtuous cycle of the database is more attractive to people if they can learn something from it as well as use it. And it's certainly more effective in shaping bank uh, actions if they know people are going to see what they did or didn't do. And I think that... You know, I, you hear from all kinds of people, including uh, you know people who talk to industry about what their response to it has been, or attorneys who it's sort of funny for a lawyer who has all those tools to, you know, say, yeah, but actually we get better results sometimes. But you know, when my client files a complaint because they know it's going to be seen, then you know, through months of, of litigation, uh, doing things like holding public hearings around the country to talk about substantive issues and hear from people, doing things like publishing supervisory highlights. So because each individual supervisory process is private, but telling the public what is happening in those uh, exams, I think, is incredibly important and gives you a sense of what the agency is, is doing and how you might affect change. And, you know, certainly we said to lots of other agencies, like, you could do something like that. On the Volcker rule, for example, you could tell us what you're seeing and it would make a difference. I think using uh, enforcement actions to both, you know, make sure you're getting money back for, for people in meaningful ways and to change con conduct and to educate both the public um, and institutions about what the law is and the expectation that it will be followed. Willingness to go after big and sometimes small actors when they're doing exotic things, but just because the practice was widespread, not to make, have that mean that you had to let it go. Um, and using research and reports uh, really effectively, both to inform rule writing and to shape the conversation. Um, um, and expose problems, uh, as for example, as it was done so successfully in student lending. So that's, uh, that's sort of a piece of the, of the good news. Um, in terms of where we are uh, now, uh, first, um, I think it's true at the same time that uh, though the folks in charge, I think, you know, essentially don't believe the Bureau should exist and don't agree with its mission, uh, they can't just wish it away, right? Um, there's, there's an institution there and they can't make it go away. Uh, and that's a good thing. That doesn't mean they, they can't do a, a bunch of, of harm. So I want to talk about a couple of the, the pieces of what we are most worried about uh, that is happening right now. Um, one piece is a real change uh, in the approach to enforcement. And obviously we, don't, we can't see a bunch of that because you don't, can't see what doesn't happen, but you, or you can't see the details of what doesn't happen, but you can see some numbers about what doesn't happen. And, and our colleague at CFA, Chris Peterson actually just looked, did, a, did an exhaustive counting uh, in the last couple weeks of um, enforcement actions before, before and after the change in leadership. Um, and uh, the, uh, in, in the uh, peak enforcement year, which was 2015, uh, there were 55 uh, enforcement actions brought. Uh, last year, there were 11. Uh, the average uh, recovery or, or money back for consumers in those cases uh, when Director Cordray was in charge was, clo was close to $57 million per case. Uh, Cranage has only been there a moment, so this is not a, quite a fair number, uh, but $2.4 million uh, for those cases. So about $43 million in, restitu in restitution for each week of Cordray's tenure. $6.4 million under Mulvaney. There were a bunch of legacy cases still to, again, it's not been very long yet, but 925000 a week. Uh, under the present director. Uh, 15 student lending cases versus none, 11 cases of lending discrimination of one kind or another versus none. So that's a big change. 
the undermining of the Office of Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity by stripping it of law enforcement authority and kind of repurposing it to advocacy, coordination, and education uh, rather than demanding compliance with the law, closing the office for students and young consumers, uh, and sort of reassigning that staff to serve within the Office of Financial Education, and then turning around the rulemaking agenda um, so that instead of a focus on consumer protection rules, a lot of the rulemaking energy has been focused on sort of uh, reversing consumer protection, um, including uh, notably, obviously, in the things not done, uh, taking the over, an overdraft rule off the agenda of things to do, taking the small business data collection rule off the agenda of things to do, uh, rolling back, proposing to roll back the payday rule, uh, and putting out for proposal this uh, sandbox proposal that, uh, that Nick referred to, which uh, we think is, is an incredibly dangerous uh, uh, proposal um, that would, if, if it goes forward as it, as it was written, it essentially would allow individual employees uh, without, in, in 60 days, the agency is giving itself 60 days to respond to requests for sweeping exemptions and exceptions um, with no public input <laughs> um, and very little visibility. Uh, no requirement that the company not currently be facing litigation or enforcement actions. They're willing to accept applications from trade associations or to service providers who serve whole markets, not just individual providers. So it's sort of a, gi it's a giant loophole to almost anything or everything uh, with no process. Uh, which seems like you know, astoundingly dangerous as, as well as uh, you know, extreme case of overreach uh, uh, proposal. And then um, earlier, I guess, the, you know, the last sort of, it not, not, wasn't a rulemaking, but a, uh, a lot of time and energy, uh, it felt like got spent when, when Mulvaney first came to the Bureau on this, R, this request for information process, um, requesting comment on a whole bunch of very process, uh, but very important process issues about the Bureau uh, that felt like an exercise in um, inviting <coughs> industry to, you know, Write its, write its complaints down, and you know we, we had the opportunity to comment as well, but they were, the questions were often very vague or very broad. There was very little time. Their questions was very difficult to respond to if you didn't have the perspective of somebody who had been inside the process, and it's not clear what's happening uh, with regard to those RFIs. So just sort of an ex another example of a, a great deal of energy being expended on deregulation, really, not regulation, and a series of like you know warning flags on uh, things to watch out for in terms of change. I mean, some of the, cha the ch changes suggested included, like, stopping sharing information, for example, um, making it, putting up barriers to make it more difficult to effectively use what you learn with one piece of information gathering to take action to, to change those practices. So how do we think about our job um, in the I guess maybe one last thing to say here um, <coughs> on the, to do my one sentence on the, on the FinTech front. Um, I would say one of the things that uh, I think is particularly worrisome mm -hmm. um, in this moment is the is things under the banner of, of fintech. That's partially what the sandbox is being characterized as, and it's not that financial technology is necessarily bad by any by any means, or that there can't be good new products, um, or that there it can't there can't be good reasons to be interested in innovation. Uh, but uh, it does feel like the word fintech or innovation is being used as kind of a generic fairy dust that you sprinkle on anything, and that's an excuse to not have to look too closely and a reason to not be regulated. Um, and it also seems like um, it is true that there's, there can be a particular lack of visibility for some products that um, happen substantially online, and so it's a context in which we're the public is even more dependent on an effective regulator uh, to make sure that we have fair outcomes. And so it's particularly worrisome to not have that confidence at a time when new products are being developed and decisions are being made. All that, I'm going to return to my cheerful perspective um, <laughs> for a second. All, all that said, um, uh, it does feel like uh, we are in a good, because of the work of the Bureau and because of the organizing work outside of it, we actually are in a fair position to resist uh, all of these changes. I don't expect that the sandbox proposal will be finalized uh, as written and prevail. Um, and I think uh, 
you know, we have been in an incredibly defensive position and posture on the Hill for a long time, and we've had two years of, of hostility from both houses of Congress and the administration, and yet managed to not see any fundamental structural changes in the Bureau. And that's because I think the sort of initial theory that the way to, the way to protect it for the long term was to not to be timid and careful, but to be careful to do the right thing. Um, and to have an impact was right. And because having an agency where the facts matter um, and where the voices of consumers matter uh, is useful for making policy change, but it's also useful for our organizing because it gives us a reason to keep making those arguments and keep uh, organizing those voices. And that has helped us not only with regard to the Bureau, but with regard to Congress and to the broader public. So I think we're in a, we just are in a stronger position because of having had those, uh, those public conversations uh, than we would be had we not, had we not done so. Um, as evidence, for example, by not having had the payday rule overturned by a, by a CRA, right? That was a real, a real risk and a real, uh, a real win. So I think we clearly have plenty of defensive work to do, but I think we also have an opportunity uh, to be ambitious, um, both about solutions and about how we describe the problems and make sure that we don't get stuck in kind of a narrow view of what consumer protection is, but that we frame what is at stake as what it is, which is that these are really fundamental matters of people's economic security, their health, their happiness, their homes, um, and also are fundamental to their fundamentals of justice and, and, and decency. Is our financial system punishing people for being poor or for being in some other way vulnerable? Is it increasing inequality or is it adding to the corrosive wealth, racial wealth gap or are we demanding that it do something different than that? And that's a conversation that we can, we can prevail around um, if, we, if we continue to have it loudly. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Lisa. Mike Calhoun, president of the Center of Responsible Lending, will be our last panelist. So thank you again to Michael and the organizers of this conference. And, and I think just to put a, a, you really are fortunate here to have the architects and the builders of the CFPB and of Dodd-Frank here today. Uh, Michael was the point person for the administration uh, and at the very front line as well as uh, the, the general, if you will, of this whole campaign. So I wanted to start by giving a little background on the Center for Responsible Lending uh, because it ties into my comments, which will be in three areas. First, a little more detail about how out of whack the system was. Uh, before the crisis and before CFPB. Some more on some of the changes and some examples, as Lisa mentioned, uh, about very successful transformations, really, of how areas and products work. And then finally, some of the future issues, uh, including some future cautions. So the Center for Responsible Lending is the policy arm of self-help credit unions, which was started in 1980. There are uh, CFDI Community Financial Development Institution, and we were founded to address the racial wealth gap, which in 1980 was uh, 10 times as much wealth on average for white households as for black households, and today it stands there and, and is headed in the wrong direction still. Uh, our initial focus was on small business lending and in mortgage lending. So. Uh, we did uh, a lot of mortgage lending. Today we operate about 60 branches, uh, have about 150,000 retail customers around the country where we provide the full range of consumer finances, everything from bank accounts, credit cards, home mortgages, and then as well as consumer mortgages. And how we got into the policy branch was, our, it was in the late 1990s. And we had the experience of borrowers that we had put into home loans come back to us on the brink of foreclosure. And we looked at these loans they had and they were truly unbelievable. Um, they would have double digit interest rates, 10 points or more of upfront fees, uh, 
credit insurance thrown in at outrageous terms. And as Eric mentioned, they were totally uh, uh, legal at the time. And so we tend to be a walkie group. Uh, some people have said, you know, a well-designed spreadsheet is our uh, vision of beauty and self-help. <laughs> so we set out, as we tend to do, and uh, sent out interns and lawyers and researched uh, the registered deeds offices around the state to see how widespread. Is this just a handful of folks? And did some other research. And the results were pretty astounding. So uh, at the macro level, we found that in North Carolina, uh, the leading subprime lender at the time, the Associates, had 88 offices in North Carolina alone. Now we're a decent sized state, but that is a bunch of offices. The other thing we learned was this company was an affiliate, a division at the time, uh, and a tie to where we are today, a Ford Motor Company. And it was so wildly profitable, this division was making more money than the entire rest of the company, including all the car building and selling at the time. So this is, you know, they wrap this up and, oh, this is about access. This was all about the money and the extraordinary stump, uh, uh, sums of it. And then finally, and I'll tie this in to another point, uh, we found, looking at the registered deeds, that in the course of about three years, these folks had refinanced one in five of the Habitat for Humanity homeowners out of their zero interest mortgages into these unbelievably abusive mortgages. And you would ask, why would anybody ever give up their zero interest mortgage? It turned out these were their perfect target because these were overwhelmingly refinanced loans to people who were struggling to make it month to month and the Habitat for Humanity owners were house poor. They had home equity, very small income. They had other credit, credit cards, installment loans. At that time, payday loans were legal in North Carolina, thankfully no more. And the sales pitch was refinance your home with us. We'll catch you up on all your debts. We're going to refinance all of that into your home. Sign the papers. You don't have to bring any cash to closing. But buried in all that fine print is you just lost all your home equity. And so Habitat, when they learned of this, quickly took steps to block that. But the point about the crisis, and two things, just the depth of the crisis, as Michael and the others in the administration knew, we were within like a week or two of people not getting their paychecks. That they did not publicize that because of the panic it would have created. But the extraordinary steps that were taken were not just because we're going to have some banks fail, but it was going to be an, a deep economic winter where people couldn't buy food next week. I mean, we were that close to the precipice. And the crazy thing was this was not just an avoidable crisis. It was an enabled crisis by the people who were supposed to stop it. So, so let me give you an example. So just uh, first, how out of whack this system is so you understand how we ended up there. In, in the lingo of, of, of agencies, these financial regulators were, were what you would call captured agencies, meaning the industries they were supposed to regulate uh, really controlled them. And in this sense, it was literally true to an extraordinary extent. So uh, as Eric explained, uh, you were, you could sometimes, you could pick which agency would be your regulator. So in particular, in the world of banks, you got to pick whether the uh, national, general national bank regulator, the OCC, Office of Control of Currency, or the Office of Thrift Supervision was your regulator. And this took on big importance for the agencies because the agencies, and this was designed to give them independence, but it had this perverse effect, their budgets were paid 100% by the fees of the banks that they regulate. 
And so there was this uh, uh, famous moment uh, where Countrywide, uh, which became a very substantial bank, uh, thought that the OCC was deigning to perhaps constrain some of their reckless mortgage lending. And so they said basically, so long, we're moving to the OTS. And by the way, that's one-fourth of your overall agency budget that's going with us. And that sent shockwaves, shockwaves through the agencies. It was, we want to remind you who's boss here and don't forget it. And, and it did. And literally, and although this still happens today, in public speaking and in written documents, the bank agencies referred to the banks as their customers. And they competed by who could best serve and defend their customers. And so you saw this happen in a couple ways. So, for example, um, <clears throat> the uh, OCC and other agencies did this too. Uh, rather than, as you've heard Nick describe, working with states, they served as defenders of their banks against state enforcement actions. The most well known of these were, was with Providian a subprime uh, credit card company and the California AG did an extensive uh, investigation found uh, uh, widespread abuses and the OCC came in and said we'll take over the investigation and then entered into a sweetheart settlement with them that they saw themselves that was a service that they provided uh, to their customers um, the OCC, by statute, has a good bit of discretion about uh, preempting state laws and saying banks, national banks, don't have to comply with state laws. Um, in the case of the mortgages and abusive mortgages, the states were starting to notice this problem. And so we worked in 1999, North Carolina passed the first state predatory lending law and it had some tough provisions. We passed other ones, worked with groups. Lisa was involved in passing a number of these. And ultimately, close to two dozen of these laws were passed. So the response of the OCC in, in, uh, in response to their request from their customers uh, was to issue a uh, rule saying that national banks did not have to comply with any of these state law protections against abusive mortgages. And that not only protected them, it created an uneven playing field. And so the state chartered banks started going to state legislatures and saying, we want parity. If the national banks get exemption, you can't treat us local banks worse than the national banks can do. And then the non-banks. And so you got this race to the bottom uh, on the scope of regulation there. And then uh, going back to... Uh, our habitat example. Uh, the Federal Reserve was, uh, in a 1992 law, was given the responsibility and the authority to protect against abusive mortgage refinancing by any entity, bank or non-bank. And they dipped their toe in this water once, and this was in early 2000. They were kind of ashamed about, we were beating them and others pretty hard about this time. They were kind of ashamed about the habitat refinancings because, you know, that people work for habitat volunteer, people were pretty outraged. So they proposed a rule uh, that would put restrictions on refinancing of zero interest mortgages from nonprofits or, uh, or from governmental entities, which were widespread. Pretty modest step. They decided it was a leap too far, though, and withdrew the proposed rule. It took no action whatsoever to protect those borrowers. Uh, after having a record showing the abuses there, the other thing that was done was there was a, basically a, an unwritten but widely recognized rule uh, within the within these. Um, regulators would be the only standards that they would issue were vague aspirational statements because their fear was that um, 
you know, first of all, the, bank, the banks wanted to have a loose standard that they would be judged by by the supervisor, but also under uh, the legal standards, you could use national bank rules as an example, and states did this in private litigants as too, could be evidence that something was an unfair trade practice. And so the banks didn't want any standards there by the regulators that could be used by state AGs or private litigants. And so, for example, the OCC response on uh, these predatory loans was to say uh, banks should not charge unreasonable fees. That was, that was as far as they went. Uh, and, and the banks were adamant that they should not have anything close to a bright line standard, which is, as we'll talk about a little later, when they had a real enforcer like Director Cordray, they suddenly wanted very specific <laughs> standards <laughs> that limited how far. And, and uh, yeah, so it's amazing how, how much <laughs> it changed. Um, so the, uh, with all this going on, the other thing I'll say real quickly, uh, is CRL, that this was, there was a lot of evidence, a lot of people knew that this was the house of cards that was going to collapse. CRL, using industry data, published a report in 2006 where we said there would be uh, two, well over two million foreclosures of subprime loans, and that we thought that was a, a, a very low estimate. Uh, the response of industry was to request a, C, a, a GAO study uh, against us for so disrupting uh, this well-functioning mortgage market. For those of you who saw the big short, it really is accurate. Lisa has a close friend who was the prime uh, uh, character in the big short. And that it really was that crazy at ground level. So you would think after the economy goes to the edge of the abyss and all this, that industry would be a little chastened, that there would be this consensus that we needed to change things. Welcome to Washington, D.C. <laughs> so not said is the, the, the Dodd-Frank Act passed, but industry vilified not all of them, let me be clear, but to a very large extent, vilified the effort and Michael Barr. I remember industry members coming and saying, that Michael Barr, the gall of him, we asked for changes in the bill, and he says, well, will you support the bill if I give you the changes? And then he won't give them to us unless we're going to support the bill. And they're like, the gall of him. <laughs> And I had that happen on multiple occasions. So, um, and the bill ultimately passes by a razor thin margin. I mean, it was down to the very last votes. Um, so that is, that is the state of where we were when the CFPB was passed. And for us and within our shop, we talk about creation of CFPB is similar to the creation of the EPA and how it really was a milestone in how this country looked at the environmental problems, a recognition of the impact of it and the need of coordinated scope. And it really, uh, even in unfriendly administrations, it really has changed how the country looks at environmental regulation. And so going quickly, because I want to leave time uh, for questions from this uh, quite knowledgeable and expert audience. The changes uh, really were sea changes, particularly when you look back at just how amazingly dysfunctional uh, uh, the system was. And then the other part of it, which about the welcome to, to Washington, you also had what, what were considered captured uh, committees. So the, the way you do things in Washington, if, if you're a uh, bank, you give all your political contributions to the banking committee members and leadership. And so uh, the banking committee members are expected to primarily raise their campaign contributions from the industry that they regulate. In fact, there are even some committees where you only can get on one because they're so lucrative for fundraising. Uh, and so it's very hard to get anything through 
uh, uh, those committees. So, for example, the Military Lending Act did not go through the normal committee structure because it wouldn't have made it through. We couldn't get a hearing through the major committee structures. It went through as an amendment to the Defense Appropriations Act. And so it went through Armed Services, and I'll give a shout out, which not always, to Senator Shelby, who signed off on it and did not require it to go through his committee because uh, he, he, he knew it wouldn't get through his committee and he wanted it to pass. So the, the big change is the non-bank supervision is a huge sea change because so much of the bad activity was there and that is still continuing. The public uh, complaint database, uh, likewise, uh, we talk with lenders and most of the major banks have official programs designed to prevent uh, complaints from customers from escalating to a complaint being filed with the Bureau. And so that's part of what Lisa was describing and, and Nick, that people find that filing these complaints uh, with the Bureau is, is remarkably effective and simply raising the threat of filing a complaint with the Bureau is very effective uh, within the institutions uh, themselves. Um, the uh, enforcement, as I said, the industry now wants to cabin enforcement by having the rules as specific as possible. And then the AG enforcement. I mean, one of the uh, uh, not widely recognized provisions of Dodd-Frank at the time, the CFPB, was it specifically authorized AGs to enforce the rules and the UDAP authority of the CFPB that was put in there precisely for these times. When we knew, when we w were passing, uh, working on Dodd-Frank and CFPB, we always said there will be a James Watt uh, head of the CFPB, and, and that's just life in Washington, D.C. For those of you all remember him as uh, head of the interior, um, where he was pretty much wanted to nullify the agency at the time. And so it, it, there were safeguards to be built in there to the extent they could. And I want to, you know, the one reform, I think the idea of, of, of blowing up the CFPB uh, is, is unlikely, as Lisa said. But I do want to remind people that you know, two years ago, there were open plans of using uh, special procedures, budget reconciliation, to, in fact, abolish the CFPB and distribute its staffs back to the previous agencies that had been ineffective. Um, it was the great work CFPB had done that made that politically unpopular, uh, as well as a lot of work by groups. I think the only, you know, the two threats that are out there now, I think uh, one that gets less popularity is going to a, a commission rather than a single director. Uh, many of us are very strongly against the commission because we have seen that the commissions are sort of the worst of both worlds, that if you, you the commissions did not do so well under the Obama administration and they would do just as poorly today, uh, loaded up with uh, appointments from the current administration. Uh, and one of the ironies is the model for the CFPB structure was taken from the regulator of the federal housing finance system, including Fannie and Freddie Mac, uh, uh, Mac. And that bill was drafted in large part by Republicans who specifically sought a single director because they knew that's what they needed to have effective accountability and oversight of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who they wanted reined in and and so that was closely copied for the CFPB and I think the same reasoning applies that if you want the effectiveness and accountability. The other is some threat uh, that they would try and put it under appropriations which would hugely weaken it because then you get budget riders so if, for example in this whole housing crisis Lisa talked about it and Nick talked about the, you know, the mortgage brokers were selling these loans and got incentives. They got paid twice as much to sell you one of these risky loans as they got if they sold you a standard 30-year fixed-rate prime loan. Well, HUD started to regulate that practice 
And so the brokers went and got a budget writer put on HUD's budget saying they couldn't regulate the brokers. And so that's another reason why we're so uh, concerned about ever getting to um, appropriated funding. So let me quickly go through a couple places where, I mean, you've seen real sea changes. One is uh, in mortgage, uh, both origination and servicing. Uh, it is just a totally different world. Mortgages are fundamentally safer. Borrowers are treated fundamentally better. Uh, and most in industry agree that it is a better system. There are places where they want tweaks around the edges, uh, but in general, they think the CFPB was certainly uh, uh, very close to the mark in the regulations there. Another w would be with credit cards, uh, where, as I think you all remember, it was a pretty dysfunctional wild, wild west market, and uh, a couple of the practices were things like the escalating late fees. They were making a third of their total revenues off of fees rather than the interest they charge. They would give you a teaser rate um, and then raise the rate on your balances, and most particularly for borrowers who are less wealthy, it was hard for them to move those balances at the time, so they were just stuck with the higher payment. And then the one that sort of brought it to a head were, were these offers of free financing, zero interest financing for six months or a year. And this is where there's some uh, alignment with industry that the industry worries about the race to the bottom that they saw in the mortgage where if you did not have teaser rates, uh, you could not compete because they look cheaper to borrowers. We actually had credit card companies come to us before Dodd-Frank and ask us to work on credit card legislation because they could not compete fairly with each other and just were cannibalizing each other's business. To, to meet the market employees, they had to make these wild offers. But to make the numbers work, they had to load in fine print so that nobody would actually qualify uh, to achieve all those benefits. And they, they didn't like that for the problem. So to wind up here uh, with some uh, the, the issues going forward, I think overdraft, student lending, Wade Henderson's going to talk about student lending is a threat on the magnitude of the subprime mortgage crisis for communities of color. Arbitration, the, the CFPB did its part and put out a rule we need to continue to fight against mandatory arbitration. And then two areas, Lisa uh, uh, has talked about these proposals to change, if you will, how the Bureau operates and what some of the foundational rules are, like what is the scope. The payday rule is in large, uh, the efforts by CFPB to rewind and, and repeal the payday rule is in large part an attempt to rewrite the standard and greatly weaken the standard of what's an unfair, deceptive, abusive trade practice and how do you prove it in, we think, a totally unjustified, illegal way. Um, Another area that cuts across, and maybe one of our speakers, Lisa Rice, will be here uh, tomorrow, is disparate impact. <coughs> that HUD is coming out with a rule that tries to not uh, repeal it, but to make it totally ineffective, which would be a huge setback across the whole board for civil rights enforcement. So sometimes, con in conclusion, sometimes consumer protection is compared, and, and Nick can relate to this is hacking back the jungle, that there is a whole cottage industry coming up with new twists and turns of how do you uh, uh, take advantage of consumers. Uh, these administrative changes, I agree totally with Lisa about how fundamental they have and, and I think how sticky they are. I'm going to end with one cautionary tale about not letting our guard down. In the 19 uh, 70s, for those of us who were doing consumer protection work back then, uh, there were two, two events. One was Ralph Nader proposed a consumer protection agency. Uh, it passed uh, one house uh, uh, in 75. The decision was to not compromise because they were going to pass it after Carter got elected. After Carter got elected, industry raised a huge campaign and killed the bill, and it died. At the same time, the FTC 
uh, wasn't as limited in rulemaking authority uh, when it was originally set up as it is today. In fact, it had vast rulemaking authority in the 70s and undertook a range of rulemaking across uh, funeral services, uh, illegally uh, uh, bundled uh, and deceptively presented, uh, used car sales. They were addressing all of those and the, led by the Chamber of Commerce, they took, essentially took away the rulemaking. Uh, authority. They limited technically to, quote, judicial rulemaking, which is not the ordinary rulemaking, and it's not been used since. And so uh, these authorities can be taken away. We need to be vigilant because uh, the benefit for, of the CFPB for consumers and the overall economy has been extraordinary, and we need to make sure it continues. Thanks, Mike. Should we open it up to questions to the audience? Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Lisa Servon. I wanted to ask a question um, that probably doesn't have a really easy answer. Uh, I'm just at the end of a comparative study of financial inclusion policy in the U.S. and the U.K. And one of the things, there's a lot of similarities in the environment and in terms of even the kinds of agencies and policies that, that have been created to deal with uh, these issues. One of the things that really surprised me the most, though, was the extent to which the firms that are regulated by the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority there, approve of the mission and have really bought into it. So I opened my laptop because, so 68% um, of those firms rate the overall effectiveness of the FCA as at between a seven and a 10, 10 being the highest. <laughs> and for those claiming a low effectiveness rating, one to three, 24% said that the FCA should be doing more to prevent wrongdoing. That's why they rated it low. And so it's clearly a really different environment than it is here, even though there's so much similarity in the context. And again, I don't think there's an easy answer, but I wonder if you could just speculate on that and why there isn't more buy-in. Um, I mean, there's, there are obvious answers, but there are obvious answers there too that have not turned out to be the truth in terms of why there's that support. Anybody know anything about the <laughs> FCA? So I will jump in some because payday lending, there, yes. we have a lot of uh, international, you know, payday lending is not so much mom and pa as it is big international financial companies and a number of those and installment lenders operate in both the UK and the US markets. I mean, I think some of it is you look at the UK and Europe uh, more broadly, is there's an expectation of, uh, of greater government oversight and regulation. And it, I mean, you look across the board, they don't tolerate the interchange fee monopoly that we have here. Uh, their privacy standards are much greater. And so I think a, a lot of it is just a baseline. Yes. There's an expectation among both consumers and industry that there will be rules of the road and you're not out there to defend on your own or do whatever you want. Um, I could add, I'd, I, it's not directly in response to your question, but I think there is support from the banking industry um, for the CFPB looking across bank and non-bank markets that are doing similar things with the same level of oversight through supervision. So previous to the CFPB, there was often this term used that they're not regulated, the non-banks are not regulated, and that always bothered me because, of course, they're subject to the same laws and regulations. I think what, what people meant by that is they're not overseen in the same way, in the way I described, where there's someone really kind of overseeing their compliance and trying to ensure that they have compliance management systems uh, in place to try to proactively comply, not just waiting to get caught. And so um, I, I think there is support for that uh, uh, consistent look, and it's particularly important in the mortgage markets with the growth of the non-bank uh, sector in mortgage origination, and that has been the case for a while in mortgage servicing, but that's getting even stronger, I think. Uh, 
Uh, that was great. Um, it's really uh, sort of worrisome to go down history road like you all have just taken us. Um, the question I have is a couple of them. One, Lisa, you suggested that the CFPB and the efforts behind consumer protection should have actually gone further than they did in the Obama administration under the director. It would be great to hear you talk about that. Mike, um, the other night I sat down for entertainment to watch on HBO the untold story of the 2008 financial crises. <laughs> I didn't see you in it, Michael. <laughs> I can, and, and I was watching with somebody who's not in our field, and he's like, didn't the government know what was happening? Like, what, you know, what, how was this not known? And I remember a conference that Ben Bernanke was pointedly asked about in 2007, look what's happening in these low-income communities, and the answer wasn't quite fulfilling at that point. Now that we're 10 years post, what would you say about, like, what was known what was ignored, notwithstanding all the points you just made about captive, um, but like, what what happened? All of you, but. right? Can I, I actually would want, want to start with that with that second question uh, <laughs> too? Um, sure be, your mic's on. Whoops. Yes. Can you? Is it on now? Yeah. Um, uh, because I think I think lots of us have have, th have things to say about what was known, and I do think it's a it's a it's a very important uh, story. And there's a couple pieces of it that feel even more vivid to me in retrospect uh, than they than they do at the time. I think you know, as, as Mike was saying, we we it, there was plain as day evidence of the for of the. Um, foreclosures that were expanding in those communities, primarily communities of color and low-income communities that had been targeted with predatory loans. Even before those foreclosures started, there was plain as day evidence of the structurally abusive features of the mortgages that were being sold, both on the ability to pay side and on the um, uh, equity extracting high fees uh, and prepayment penalties side and on the um, the kind of structural incentives to um, screwed up costs created by the way that by the yield spread premium uh, system and the way that people were paid. So uh, people knew it from their lived experience. They knew it because or they should have known it because the evidence was not that hard to find. They knew it because they should have known it because people were bringing it to the regulators. And the response from the regulators, in, in my experience, was very often. Uh, to sort of refuse to look at the evidence that they had and to say, um, that's just what you're bringing us is just anecdote. Bring us data, uh, which was a particularly terrible answer when they, in fact, could have gotten the data had they chosen to. Um, and HUD did do uh, one, we, were we talked about this last night a second, uh, you know, through much, 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 much advocacy, HUD, di HUD did a report, a uh, pretty modest, careful report, but it, they were never able to make it into anything. Um, and uh, so, there was a, it was a, an extraordinarily willful failure to know because there was so much money being made um, on the other side. It was, it was enormously profitable and people did not want it to stop. And so they didn't, and, that, and, and, and none of the people. That it was going to get, I mean, because everybody thought prices are going to keep, valuations are going to keep going. Yeah, it's hard, I mean, it's hard not to go back to the, like, you know, it's hard for people to believe things that they are paid not to not to believe, uh, and that people with fancy degrees and fancy suits um, told them not to believe. And when the, the, pers the people who were hurt first were not their neighbors. Um, it really was financial alchemy, though. I mean, you cannot believe the amount of money, again. So, uh, I mean, a quote we often use in our testimony, we had from a lender in the business, and he said, I get paid twice as much for doing a no-doc loan as I do for doing a documented loan. I always say it's less work, but, and the reason is, because Sparrows didn't realize this, the no-doc loans, the option arm loans, uh, the, these 228 loans, all carry higher interest rates than a regular 30-year uh, fixed rate mortgage. Borrowers often didn't understand that, but we often found 
borrowers would give full documentation for their loans and didn't even know they got a no-doc loan. And the lenders had rules, do not include any of the documentation papers in the file, because they also didn't want to show the mismatch. And then even at the regulator level, the, the reports in 2007, the regulators bragged that they had set a record for the lowest number of bank failures, the longest string of low bank failures, because all this money was pouring in, and the, you know, the losses hadn't hit, hit yet. But the extraordinary amounts of money, so that the broker gets paid more, the lender gets paid more, the securitizer gets paid more, and the investor is getting a yield that is greater than what the credit rating that you says they should. Um, and you, they all want volume. They just want more and more and more of it. And so we had, I remember, the, the problem, this is where they did not have enough loans. There was so much demand. So big established firms, Bear Stearns came to us and talked to them. We told them, stay away from this. Well, they set up their own <laughs> subprime mortgage uh, company because that they needed the raw material for these loans. Even that wasn't enough, so they set up what we they set up what's the financial equivalent of fantasy football for subprime mortgages, where you could bet and buy securities, uh, synthetic securities, based on how these mortgages performed, even though they weren't directly tied to the mortgages because there weren't enough mortgages to go around because everybody wanted in on this bonanza and feeding frenzy. And uh, on your, the other thing is, every when you talk to when you talk to different institutions about it, when when we confronted, you know, everybody pretended that they weren't responsible and they were just they were just one part of a system that somebody else controlled. So the you know the lenders who were using uh, the Wall Street money would say, this is how the money comes to us. We have no choice. This is how we do it. And the Wa the Wall Street money would say, we're not making the loans. We can't tell them what to do. Which comes back to but there is some truth in that. I mean, so we were a mortgage lender, and we saw 80% of our volume go away because we were telling people, here is a good, fully documented, safe 30-year fixed rate mortgage. And the broker was saying, don't give me your documentation. I'm going to give you this teaser rate mortgage that doesn't escrow for your taxes, uh, et cetera. It looks cheaper. And if in the, it is very hard in the industry when there's a race to the bottom to say, no, nah, I'm just going to give up all that market share and stay with my standards. And so there has been some conversion within the industry that they recognize it's actually a better business model for them to have reasonable basic rules of the road. I do think there has been a change. And as I say, the big banks are not asking to roll back the credit card rules, the basics of the uh, mortgage origination and servicing rules. And on your your more question, uh, it wasn't so much meant. I mean, you know, there there was a there were more rules yet to be written <laughs> at the, at the bureau, um, and a bunch of important stuff that didn't get gotten to. And there are a bunch of places where we thought rules should have been, you know, particular rules should have been stronger than they were. I I was talking less about that though, and more about sort of being ambitious about uh, about the big picture. And I think of student lending, as Mike said, as one place where we are facing a, a huge crisis. Um, that's certainly not just about matters within the CFPB's jurisdiction, but is a huge crisis that needs to be treated as that. Or, you know, I think of like the credit reporting system, for example, where there's a set of problems that, um, that Peggy talked about and that's about accuracy and actually um, making sure that errors are corrected um, and that the information isn't, and, and then about, you know, being thoughtful about what additions or subtractions to what information is, is used, has what kind of impact on whom, all of which are really important questions and affect lots of people. But then I think also there's a set of questions about the, the way the credit report, a deeper set of questions about the way the credit uh, scoring system functions. Like, what are the problems with the system that, even if the technical details are right, if you have less wealth, you're more likely to be late on your bills. And if you have less familial wealth, you have few other places to turn. And what are the consequences of kind of turning an existing difference of wealth into a system that keeps charging you more um, or keeps denying you access to better products? So that feels like the kind of next order question that we should be asking about. I, 
I just have. Uh, yeah, sorry. Thoughts. For the people that are watching on the video oh, stream, they've complained about um, all of us not speaking into the mic. <laughs> One thing that didn't get mentioned was subprime auto loans. And two, two really quick points. One is, after bankruptcy, the first thing that General Motors bought was a subprime lender. And the second thing is, if anybody heard what uh, Rashida had to say yeah. at the uh, hearings on uh, facts, yeah. subprime loans in her district, uh, I was wondering if anybody has any comments. Absolutely. And, and one of the challenges with this is um, it's hard to, to get people to do apples to apples comparison of the default rates with cars and mortgages. People sort of use the mortgage default rate. Well, that's a, a benchmark. People know what that is. Autos, they flip through. You go from a late payment to losing your car in 60 days or less in most states. And so they'll advertise, oh, we're only 4% delinquent at any point in time. But you play, the, it's sort of like the payday loans. You play that out through six times through the year. Uh, the, that's how many people will cycle through that for those default rates. And the subprime auto is, uh, is a disaster. And, I mean, Santander, a bunch of companies have had problems there. The CFPB that was going after a lot of them. Um, as well as the other regulators. And that's one thing I do think is a point that the CFPB has changed the whole environment. And if you look at the other regulators, I think the other regulators are doing a better job uh, because of what the CFPB has done. You know, for, it, it, the Federal Reserve has gone after Wells pretty hard. I mean, an asset cap for a year and a half, all these other things. That, that was not how it was done pre-Dodd-Frank. Uh, so I do think it's changed the expectations for regulators. And maybe one, one specific point, tie, tying the auto and the expectations uh, for, for other regulators. You know, it, it, auto, uh, the CFPB specifically did not get authority uh, to regulate auto dealers uh, in Dodd-Frank because the auto dealers fought so hard and got themselves exempted. But as the sort of consolation prize, uh, they, uh, the FTC has uh, regular, not it's, it's terrible, impossible process, but regular rulemaking authority in that area. They haven't done anything uh, with it. And, uh, you know, the, the kind of like bonus-y yield spread pre premium payments that were such a problem in the mortgage market still exist in the auto finance market and drive racial discrimination. Um, and, uh, you know, we should all be demanding uh, that the FTC act on its authority uh, to deal with uh, abusive auto loans. Thank you. Can we acknowledge our panel? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the panel on investor protection. Uh, my name is Andrew Wu. I'm an assistant professor of technology and operations and an assistant professor of finance at the Ross School of Business. Um, at Ross, and also in collaboration with uh, multiple schools across campus, we have launched multiple fintech initiatives aimed at putting us at the forefront of the innovation. So these range from um, undergraduate to graduate courses and programs on different areas of fintech, um, action-based learning programs that place students directly in fintech startups and incumbents, as well as collaborative research uh, on new technologies and business applications um, with leading industry practitioners. Okay. So, you know, on the consumer side, uh, technology has really brought a dazzling and complex array of new products and technologies on all fronts of a consumer's financial lives, from you know, payment to credit and lending to investment and to financial planning and advisory. And for instance, robo-advisors, you know, the practice of algorithmically generating portfolio allocation advice and that based on the client's uh, financial situation, and risk tolerance, and then automatically executing these advice for a fraction of the fees charged by human advisors, that has become a hundred billion dollar industry last year, and is poised to become a trillion dollar industry in the next five years. Um, you know, after the crypto bubble has burst, now there has been a new generation of financial products, uh, such as stable cryptocurrencies and tokenized equity offerings that are poised to fully digitize a consumer's financial life. But with all that excitement uh, in the last couple of years, people seem to have uh, started to forget the basic core principles of consumer and investor protection. And um, because all these products come with a slew of unforeseen risks that potentially has huge implications for both the investor themselves and also the market. So uh, today, uh, we have a distinguished panel of experts on uh, consumer and investor protection, and we're going to explore the current regulatory landscape, as well as recent developments in uh, consumer protection, uh, and how new technological innovations affects the complex relationship between the consumers, the investors, the regulators, and also the markets. Um, so for this panel, instead of individual presentations, we're going to go right into a uh, free flow discussion. Uh, I'm going to start by raising some questions uh, to the panel. Uh, we'll go from there, and then uh, we're going to open up to the audience for uh, Q and A. So, um, I guess you know my first uh, question is that for many of you uh, on the panel, we have been saying you know for years that the standard of conduct for finance professionals, for investment professionals, is the most important step. In, uh, for policymakers could take to improve protections for the average retail uh, consumers and investors. Uh, why, why is this so important? So I'll jump in. I'm Barbara Roper. I'm Director of Investor Protection for the Consumer Federation of America. And I have been working on this issue in one form or another since I joined CFA in 1986. I wrote my first letter on this topic to the SEC in 1999, and I'm sure we're going to get it solved any day now. <laughs> um, if you think about the investment marketplace that's out there, uh, there is, as you say, a, an, an enormous, I mean, one of the things we do really well is innovate. There's a product for every need you might have, right? Sometimes hundreds or thousands of products for you to choose from to to provide capital uh, growth or um, income or whatever it is your investment goal is. And what we know about most investors is they do not have the financial sophistication to look at those, those available investments and determine which one are the best for them. And during that period, since I, when I started at CFA, there was actually quite a small percentage of the population that invests. It's now the way we fund our retirement. It's the way we fund our children's college education. The investors who are, are, are out in this marketplace are financially unsophisticated, need to make every dollar work, and extremely vulnerable if things go wrong. So what they do is they turn to financial professionals to help them make these choices. And here again, there's good news. 
if you have $100 to invest or a few million, if you want one-time advice about what to do on a rollover, or you want comprehensive financial planning and portfolio management, if you want to pay commissions or hourly fees or asset fees or a retainer fee, there is a business model out there with you in mind. But most of the people out there who are competing for your business call themselves financial advisors, market their services as long-term trusted advice dedicated to acting in your best interest. They are either brokers or insurance agents regulated exclusively as uh, salespeople with no obligation to recommend to you the investments that would actually be the best option for you. And even in the area where technically we have a fiduciary duty for investment advisors who are out there, who are supposed to apparently act in your best interest at all times, cannot, uh, cannot disclose or negotiate that, that obligation away. As enforced by the SEC, all they have to do is to disclose to you the ways in which they are not going to act in your best interest, and they have satisfied their fiduciary obligations. So we have a population that is vulnerable, that is using the markets for vitally important purposes, relying on financial professionals who aren't being held to a standard of conduct that is even remotely adequate to provide adequate protection. Can I jump in? <laughs> uh, I'm Steve Hall. I'm uh, the legal director and security specialist for Better Markets. Uh, we're an advocacy group that's been in existence since 2010. and. Really, for much of our early years of advocacy, we were focused on making sure the financial system was stable and could, uh, could avoid another devastating financial crisis like the 2008 nightmare. Uh, but in fact, this issue, to echo a lot of what Barb was saying, uh, really, in our minds, took on such an immense importance, a kind of gravitational pull, that we got heavily engaged in the DOL's fiduciary duty rule and we're heavily engaged now on the SEC's Reg BI. And uh, I think uh, to, to re recapitulate, it's, it's really about protecting investors in the most fundamental sense uh, across a broad range of product, services, and financial professionals. Uh, but we also see importance in this endeavor because there's a, there's a connection to financial stability. In other words, when large numbers of investors are exploited, that tends to really generate the raw material that can be part and parcel of a financial crisis. In 2008, what was it? It was exploitive, predatory behavior uh, among mortgage brokers and mortgage lenders. And, <coughs> and it, it's important to see that, that the value of investor protection uh, is, is critical in and of itself, but it also has a kind of nexus to the rest of the financial world and the financial marketplace. And the other footnote I wanted to add, and, and, and in a way it's, it's sort of discouraging because we have enough of a challenge facing us uh, in terms of, of trying to get the SEC to do a much better job with what is currently a, really a terrible rule. Uh, we think it's also important still not to lose sight of the fact that in the end even a very strong standard has got to be enforceable in a meaningful way. So, so we mustn't lose sight of the fact that the challenges associated with things like mandatory arbitration, uh, loss of access to the court system, we have to keep those in mind and fight on that front as well. So let me jump in with just a uh a, a little bit of data to try to to bolster what um, you two were just saying. So, you know, consumers, I think, do rightfully think when someone says they're giving them advice that it's advice, not a sales pitch, right? So sometimes people would say to me, like, well, why do we need to regulate advisors? Like, we don't, you know, you know what you're getting when you go to a used car dealer. And I'm like, well, imagine if used car dealers – uh, marketed themselves as transportation advisors, come to me to figure out the best bus routes or if you can only manage by buying a car. <laughs> um, right? So we sort of, that's a laughable idea, but essentially there are financial advisors that that is the, what, they are, what they're basically doing. And so what does that mean? Well, 
Uh, so I didn't introduce myself. I'm Betsy Stevenson, and I was a member of the Council of Economic Advisors and Chief Economist at the Department of Labor um, in both capacities um, getting involved in this rule. Um, and when I was at CEA, Jane Doko and I put together a report to try to quantify what was going on in the industry. And I think the thing that really struck me is that really a lower bound of it uh, estimate is that retirees end up with 5 to 10 percent less savings because of conflicted advice. And I say this is a lower bound estimate because, you know, empirical scholars, we want to show causal effects. So we're not trying to figure out exact, the exact magnitude of the effect. We're trying to show all the places in which we can say for sure conflicted advice causes this loss. And so we get these estimates of 5 to 10 percent. What does that mean for a typical person who's, say, investing over a 30-year uh, period and then going to draw down their retirement assets? They're going to run out of assets about five years earlier. So you mentioned, what does this mean for the overall financial stability? What does this mean for the overall uh, financial stability of the federal government? Who's going to pick up the slack when people run out of retirement assets? Where's the pressure going to be when the baby boomers run out of money? So they're not just taking money from the baby boomers. They're taking money from all of us because I think there's going to be enormous pressure for the federal government to step in and help these folks out when they run out of money. So we all have a vested interest in solving this problem. Hi, uh, my name is Jane Dorgan. I just wanted to, uh, I guess, uh, uh, introduce myself and then also, also um, offer, uh, you know, a, 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 a somewhat different perspective. Um, I'm an assistant vice president at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and so before I even like go any further, I just need to say that my participation in this panel is just <laughs> on behalf of myself as a concerned citizen um, and not on behalf of anyone else. <clears throat> Um, I, I'm, I'm glad, Betsy, that you remember those estimates because they've kind of been buried sort of <laughs> deep in my mind. I've kind of just, um, you know, kind of just have forgotten or uh, have sort of um, buried a lot of um, the work that we did because where we are now with, um, you know, the regulation and sort of thinking about um, investor protections is very different from where we were, um, you know, five years ago and sort of what's happened to, you um, you know, sort of the fate of uh, protecting consumers um, and savers from these conflicts has um, just taken a very sort of depressing toll. So I'm really glad you remember that. I guess, um, you know, the other perspective that I bring is, you know, as somebody who's um, worked on household financial decision making and sort of studied how people um, make decisions on behalf of themselves. Um, and, and it's not just vulnerable populations that get swindled into, you know, bad investments or, um, you know, complex annuities, you know, where they sneeze and then they lose all their money. Um, I mean, these problems extend to a broad, you know, swath of savers. And, you know, research shows that, you know, there's a lot of complexity in financial markets. Andrew alluded to this earlier when he was sort of describing, you know, that the technological innovations that have changed the landscape for financial advice. And, you know, part of the reason why, um, you know, these estimates of these impacts on savers are so large is that these mistakes that people can make and, um, and, and sort of the, the set of vulnerable people is, is really large. So uh, for those in the audience who hasn't uh, kept up with regulatory updates, uh, there has been a significant change in the regulatory landscape uh, in the investment uh, advisory market. Uh, so basically in 2015, right, so the Department of Labor proposed a really sweeping rule on uh, fiduciary duty, which basically said that as long as you, uh, as a financial advisor, as, as long as you have anything to do with um, financial advisory or retirement planning, uh, these type of activities, you are automatically considered a fiduciary and therefore held uh, for, with, with fiduciary duty. So you're held with a standard that you need to put your client's interests strictly above yours. And it doesn't matter if you are a broker paid on a commission or an insurance agent or a fee-based uh, financial advisor. And uh, so this would obviously have a tremendous impact on the commission-based uh, brokers and advisors who are mostly have been regulated by FINRA and held at a lower standard of uh, suitability. Right. But this would also impact the compliance structure of the entire financial advisory industry as a whole. 
you know, as you can expect, the financial industry really fought tooth and nail uh, and against this and after a really protracted uh, series of legal battles. And the rule was essentially vacated by the Fifth Circuit Court um, uh, last year and uh, was expected to be replaced by the SEC's uh, regulation, was called the Regulation Best Interest, which is essentially a weaker version of this uh, and that is expected to be released by the fall. And uh, several of our panelists are actually instrumental in creating this fiduciary rule. So I'd like to hear some of your insights you know, on the creation of this rule and you know, its, its rationale and its relation for the, um, r with, with consumer protection, and in the age, especially in the current age. So yeah. uh, let me start, and then I'll yeah. turn it to, to you guys. But um, first of all, I'm just going to disagree with you that it was a sweeping rule. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I watched what was happening in a bunch of other countries, in the UK and Australia and the Netherlands. Um, their sweeping would be banning commissions. <laughs> That, and uh, what this was trying to do was uh, say, look, you, you can take your commissions, but you're still supposed to have your client's interests first. So you need to meet a best interest standard. I, you know, to, to really understand where this was coming from, you have to understand how the retirement landscape started changing. So it used to be most people got a defined benefit plan, which meant that their employer offered them some kind of retirement plan, and that retirement plan was essentially a pension that was going to pay them some fixed amount in retirement. They didn't have to worry about the returns. That was their employer's job to worry about the returns because what they were told was the benefit they were getting. In the Starting in the 1970s, we started having these defined contribution plans, 401ks. Um, and then they're still tied to people's employers. And so the, that has been the big shift is to 401ks that get rolled over into IRAs. So when you ask, you know, where is this, you know, conflicted advice coming from, my favorite study was a guy who had his money, a secret shopper, who had his money in the federal government's thrift savings plan, which is about the lowest fee plan you could possibly have. The guy calls uh, nine advisors and says, should I roll it into an IRA or just leave it where it is? Eight of the nine said, you definitely need to roll it. <laughs> um, so that, that's the sort of, that is the, the changing landscape. I think DOL, and if you want to know why it's opposed so much by industry, it comes back to that 5 to 10% they're taking out of retirement savers. We estimated that's $17 billion a year. People are going to fight like hell over $17 billion a year. Financial industry doesn't want to give that back to retirees. So it's going to be a tough regulatory nut to crack. But it, DOL didn't go sweeping. What they did was, I thought, very surgically went in and said, Here's what we need to do to give people a minimum set of protections that when they are seeking advice, they know at least their best interests are going to be the front of people's mind. Sorry, just to jump in really quickly before, um, Barb, I know you have a lot of interesting things to say on this topic. Um, I, mean, I just also want to push back on the idea that it was sweeping. It, it, it's not sweeping because it's, it, it was just you know, targeted at retirement products. Um, you know, lots of people get financial advice for, you know, lots of things that are not related to, 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 to retirement, and um, the, the rule didn't touch that. So I'd just like to say, um, I think what the industry found so threatening about the DOL rule was not the words best interest, but the DOL meant the words best interest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when they, I mean, seriously, I, it's, it sounds like a joke, but it's actually true. FINRA describes their suitability standard as requiring brokers to make recommendations that are consistent with the best interests of their customers as, and preventing them from placing their own interests ahead of the customers. That's how the SEC describes the Investment Advisor Act fiduciary duty. That's how DOL described its fiduciary standard. And so the words are virtually indistinguishable, but when DOL said best interest, they meant you have to look at what's you have available there and you have to decide which one or ones you think are the best match for the investor. And I remember when I read, it was I think a comment from FINRA, which is not the worst player in this process, but you know, saying they seem to think best interest means best interest, <laughs> best <laughs> means best, and it's like, yeah, <laughs> that's a concept of the investor. And then the second piece of what DOL did that was so important was they said, yes, you can have your, you can get your commissions. You know, you can get transaction-based payments, 
But this business of sales quotas and sales contests and getting paid 10 times as much to sell this product as that product, you've got to put some serious policies and procedures in place to rein in those conflicts. And you started to see before the rules demise real changes. I mean, we were at the brink of a revolution in the way services were going to be offered to the investing public. Um, we had something called clean shares, which allowed for a transaction-based purchase of mutual funds that where the, the fee was set between the broker and the advisor, you know, and the customer instead of by the mutual fund deciding how much the broker was going to get paid to sell me a mutual fund. So you really started to see some innovative changes taking place to, to wring out some of these excess side conflicts in the broker-dealer business model disappeared in a flash when the, when the rule was overturned. And the same groups that went into court to sue to stop the DOL rule are now champing at the bit to push the SEC rule through, which uses, as I say, virtually identical words, best interest, can't place the broker's interest ahead of the investor's interest, but doesn't mean them. So best interest certainly doesn't mean you have to recommend the best of the available products. The prohibition on placing the broker's interests ahead of the customers doesn't even make it into the safe harbor. You know, it's the chief thing the SEC used to sell their rule, and it doesn't even make it into the safe harbor. And everything else is so vague and undefined that we, it has no concrete meaning, and we've seen how they enforce similar concepts, this is concepts in the Advisors Act, context and there's no there there. So that's the concern. That's why the, the roles have flipped on the SEC rule. Yeah, and, and there's an interesting legal pers perspective that, that um, comes to bear here, uh, both as to the DOL's uh, rule and as to the SEC's rule. And with respect to the DOL, you know, they were dealing against the backdrop of ERISA, of course, which is famously a strong uh, statute which recognizes the fundamental importance of conferring special protections on retirement assets um, and makes it very clear that there's abundant authority to, to establish a broad fiduciary standard. The, the thing that I think DOL was facing, and one reason why it perhaps wasn't as sweeping as it could have been, as good as it was, is number one, a year after ERISA was passed in 74, 75 comes along, there's already industry influence that comes to bear, and they put in place a rule which is, which is terrible. It has a complicated array of preconditions before the fiduciary status actually kicks in. It says, in effect, the advice has to be rendered on a regular basis. It has to be the primary basis. Uh, so, so really, for 40 years, what happened was industry's practices and expectations became entrenched. The DOL had to fight against that. The second thing that they were up against, and I, and I think they really deserve credit in particular in the way they handled this, they wanted to confer greater protections for IRA owners. And because of the way uh, ERISA was structured in Title II, which dealt with, with IRA accounts, they didn't have the same plenary authority to act. They, did, they took some very creative steps I think by all accounts, uh, too creative according to industry and, and, and a three-judge panel in the Fifth Circuit, uh, to, to, to really try to, to fix that gap. Uh, and, and it was an admirable effort. Uh, I, I think we, we can talk later about the lawsuits because there's a lot of interesting observations there. On the SEC front, quickly, uh, it, it's, it's disappointing because in Dodd-Frank, Congress gave the SEC very clear authority to, to establish a broad, strong, and uniform fiduciary standard for investment advisors and broker-dealer reps. And one of the reasons why I think, uh, from our, our perspective, it's so disappointing is that they latched on to the weakest statutory authority on which to predicate their rule. Okay, so following up uh, on that about the SEC rule, right? So, you know, just from both a legal perspective and also from an economic pers perspective, do you think the SEC rule should be, uh, you know, could be improved, you know, uh, from, you know, on these perspectives? And also, you know, say, if you were like the, you know, chief economist at the SEC, uh, what would you do, you know, to make this rule a little bit better, right, in terms of, uh, in terms of investor protection in general? So, 
So, yeah, I mean, so to Steve's point, I mean, we fundamentally disagree with the approach the SEC took, the legal authority that they used. But what we've, instead of fighting that fight, although I think that makes them vulnerable in court, instead of fighting that fight at this stage of the process, we've tried to engage constructively to say, you say you want to raise the standard of conduct over the existing suitability standard. You say you want to prevent brokers from placing their interests ahead of their customers' interests. Here are the changes you would need to be, make in your rule and, importantly, your interpretation of the rule to achieve that. And so the first one is to, you don't even necessarily have to change the language around the best interest standard, but the interpretation of that standard needs to make clear that it, it, when they say you have to act in the best interest of customers, it means you have to recommend the investments you reasonably believe after a prudent process represent the best of the reasonably available investments, the best match for your investor. It, it should be, you know, if a thousand mutual funds satisfy suitability, best interest should be satisfied by, I don't know, 10 or 20? I mean, there it's never going to be just one perfect investment, but it ought to be a narrowing down of the, the investments. The second is, if you want to prevent brokers from placing their interests ahead of the customers, let's get that into the operational provisions of the role that fully satisfy compliance. And the way to do that is to take what's already the best provision in the rule. One of the things it does is it says brokers would have to have policies and procedures in place that are reasonably designed to mitigate financial conflicts of interest. Reasonably designed to do what? It doesn't say. Um, reasonably designed to prevent the broker from placing its interests in the interests of the associated person ahead of the customers would be a really nice way to incorporate that concept into the operational provisions of the rule and to put some real meat into that mitigation requirement. And then you might see some of these things like the <coughs> sales quotas for the sale of proprietary products or the contests to encourage the sale of a certain category of products or revenue sharing <coughs> payments, you know, getting paid more to push the products that pay the firm more, you know, whatever. You might see some of those conflicts actually reined in as it is industry clearly thinks they're just going to be able to paper over those kind of conflicts without having to make any meaningful change. And then the third one, which is necessary actually to ensure that this rule doesn't weaken existing protections for investors, is that brokers who are in an ongoing duty of trust and confidence with their customers, ongoing relationship of trust and confidence, need to have an ongoing duty to those customers, just as courts have found that they have under the you know, state common law fiduciary standards. So by saying that brokers automatically, absolutely, in every circumstance have no ongoing duty at the end of a transaction, this rule actually weakens one of the fundamental protections that investors now get. Yeah. It, it, you know, I, I agree completely with Barb's analysis. Though that's really kind of the, the, the trifecta of what needs to be fixed here. I think hand in hand with that is that this this proposed rule relies much too much on disclosure. This is this audience is very sophisticated. I think everybody here understands the shortcomings of a disclosure regime when it comes to protecting investors in short and across the board. Uh, it's especially true, and this goes back to the theme we talked about at the beginning. It, it, you know, financial advice is technical. It's complicated. It, it, it's, it's almost to expect disclosure to serve the best interests of an investor who needs in advice is like asking a patient, right, to, to, to uh, basically to educate themselves and then make the, the decisions about what it is that they should do to look after their health. I mean, the, the, the asymmetry there is just as astonishing. People don't necessarily think of it that way in finance, but it's true. Uh, and, and then on a, on a you know, it, it, there's a whole cluster of issues around disclosure, but again, it's, it's mainly excessive reliance on disclosure and it so happens disclosure that hasn't been adequately tested. Uh, the testing that has been done by independent organizations clearly indicates that the disclosure regime that goes along with Reg BI is woefully inadequate. The SEC didn't do its homework before it actually put out the proposal and it, it, it needs an enormous amount of work there. 
If I could just um, pick up on the point about disclosure. I mean, I, I completely agree with your characterization of sort of the problems with disclosure. And I mean, as an economist, the idea that um, you would try to address these foundational problems with incentives by using fine print mm -hmm. is so bizarre <laughs> to me. Um, and, 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 and in part it's because, um, you know, there's all this research that shows that, you know, disclosures often have unintended consequences. If, you know, brokers disclose that they're conflicted, um, you know, that, you know, sometimes leads uh, the people receiving the advice to, to trust them more, not less. Um, I mean, the, um, there have been sort of these independent studies of disclosures on sort of how, you know, on, on sort of like a psychological level, people, um, you know, read, how much time do they spend reading these documents, what information do, the, you know, do they, um, do they uh, retain versus not retain, and, and none of that is like terribly optimistic that it's going to, you know, change, um, you know, uh, investors' behavior, and and that's really just what's so problematic about the disclosure regime is that they're aiming to solve the problem by changing, you know, the information that investors get and changing investors' behavior. When we have a lot of evidence, um, you know, and Betsy cited it earlier, saying that the problems are not, you know, you know, among people who are trying to save and you know work toward a secure retirement. It's it's, it's on the other side. So, uh, let me just. Uh, add a little bit to what Jane was saying about disclosure because we're although we're all in like vehement agreement here um, <laughs> but I think I, I think that my natural inclination as an economist had always been to think like well disclosure at least it can't hurt uh, it turns out that's wrong <laughs> um, and and the, when we were looking at the DOL rule I mean yeah, we spent a lot of time thinking about disclosure. What would be a disclosure regime that would work? And I became convinced that disclosure is just never going to work here. And bad disclosure could really, really hurt. So how does bad disclosure hurt? Well, it turns out it, studies show that people have a little bit of a moral compass. And that moral compass prevents them from cheating people completely. That's a good thing. But... When we give them disclosure, their moral compass gets worse because they think, I disclosed. So now their moral compass that's shouting, don't cheat the old guy, isn't shouting as loud anymore because, hey, you told the old guy what to expect. So the problem is the, the broker dealers themselves are less, uh, less constrained by their own moral compass once we have disclosure. And then on the flip side, the consumers who are getting it are thinking, as Jane mentioned, oh, well, at least he told me, so maybe I can trust him more. And I, I just wanted to circle back to that, that retirement for a lot of people is really stressful. Right? I'm pretty sophisticated, and I still don't like to sit down and think about my retirement planning. And what people want is someone that they can trust, that will give them advice, that will just tell them what to do so they can stop thinking about this hard problem. And that trust is a really important part of the relationship. And you can't have it if the person doesn't have your best interests at heart. You should not trust. And I think the only disclosure that I could get behind would be at the very beginning, the person looking you in the eye and saying, do not trust me. Nothing I say is true. <laughs> Just to follow up on the point of thinking like an economist, you know, you know, both Betsy and Jane, you spend a lot of time and also energy, right? So economically studying, the understand the uh, nature and also the extent of just the advisory conflict of interest. Uh, and that culminated in a, uh, you know, the White House's uh, Council of Economic Advisors report that basically says that, well, the matter is really big. It costs the investors up to $17 billion a year or 1 percentage points per year. Uh, so, uh, you know, just SEC also recently put out a series of analysis, economic analysis uh, in support of the Reg BI. So uh, I'm wondering if I get a chance to review that and, you know, what are your thoughts on this? In particular, you know, given that recently there's uh, 11 economists uh, on a bipartisan basis coming out and wrote a letter that says that pointed out a series of flaws with that uh, econo economic analysis. So I'm wondering what your thoughts uh, are on that. And could it be improved? <laughs> yeah. I mean 
all economics, economic analysis can be improved, and so that's just always a given. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I've spent some time, you know, reading through their analysis, and I would, I would sort of hesitate to call it an analysis, um, and, 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 and because, because the basic structure of it was, let's deny the problem exists, and then conclude that the rule has minimal impacts because there is no problem. <laughs> and, and, and I'm sorry, like, if this is too reductionist and I'm, like, you know, glossing over some important nuances and complexities, and so you should hold me accountable to it. But that was sort of, like, my takeaway from it. And, and then, you know, I started to think, well, why would a, you know, a federal agency that is, you know, sort of bound by, you know, guidelines and regulations to put forth cost-benefit analysis when it's promulgating, you know, new regulations, um, you know, that considers, you know, the societal, you know, benefits and harms of regulations, like, why would they do something like this? And, 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 the, and the only sort of explanation that I could sort of think of are sort of these, like, you know, political economy challenges, um, you know, within the SEC, um, whereby factual analysis couldn't, you know, inform their policy deliberations. And, and then I just got really depressed. And so, <laughs> um, but, but that, was, that, that was my takeaway of their economic analysis. Did you want to? So I think it took like 50 pages of CFA's comment letter to explain all of the things that were wrong with the economic analysis, so I'll spare you that. <laughs> but this letter that Andrew referred to is really extraordinary. The senior economists from the SEC dating back to 1982 submitted a letter to the agency saying, you haven't defined the regulatory problem that you're trying to solve. And here are some issues you haven't considered, like the impact of conflicts of interest on advice. For example, you haven't considered the available economic evidence. I mean, Jane's right. I mean, it, to, to call this an economic analysis applies that there is analysis, and there's not. Um, so, I think when I look for the explanation of why it's so lacking, I think it's because the SEC is very afraid of being sued by SIFMA and not the trade association for broker dealer firms and not at all afraid of being sued by CFA. And so if they were writing a rule that they thought the industry would challenge, they would have had to be far more rigorous. But I think they are complacent in thinking that as long as the brokers are happy with the rule, and believe me, they're happy, <laughs> they don't have any legal risk. Um, I don't think they've adequately weighed the degree to which the advisors are unhappy with the rule, so I think there's still some exposure there. But it is sort of a, a reality of the system is that a, for a group like ours to try to get standing, to sue, to challenge a rule is extraordinarily difficult for the industry to <coughs> challenge a rule they don't like is costly but much easier, and that's what went into that calculation. Yeah, and, and to, like, once again, to, to bring a, a little bit of the more legal perspective, even to the issue of economic analysis, I, I love the way uh, Jane put it. <laughs> it. It really is spot on. Uh, and, if you, and if you look at her points and, and the other uh, points about the shortcomings, they, uh, they don't pass muster under any of the legal tests that govern what an agency has to do to justify its rules on economic grounds. And in the SEC's case, I mean, the, one of the bedrock principles of administrative law, the State Farm case, is an agency has to consider all of the relevant factors. I mean, we're stepping even beyond economic analysis. What's the relevant factor? There's a problem here, and it's huge. And they just, you know, glossed over that. Uh, so right there, you've got a legal issue that's it's sort of connected to the so-called economic analysis. Even if you drill down in a more technical level, the securities laws are very specific. They don't require the SEC to conduct a detailed cost-benefit analysis to quantify things, to match them up and balance them. The statutes do require the SEC to do what we call the ECCF analysis, to consider the impact of a rule on uh, efficiency, competition, 
capital formation. And even under that clear-cut standard, the, the agency did a dismal job, and, and the one that stands out, I think we've all talked about this at some point or another, is their competition analysis. What, what's going on with this rule? They're desperately protecting and preserving two different standards for two groups of the advisory industry, the broker dealers and the investment advisors. It's not a, a, a coherent competitive or level playing field. It, it just flies in the face uh, of what makes competitive sense. Finally, uh, you know, a little known fact is that in the very section that details the SEC's obligation to do this kind of consideration of economic factors, it says crystal clear First and above all else, in essence, you have to consider the public interest. And so no matter what the SEC might try to do, even if it were to sort of dot more I's and try to make this thing uh, pass muster under an economic test, what they continue to gloss over is the mountain of evidence that there's immense harm being done. And until they get to that point, they're never going to be able to have the foundation for an adequate rule. So I think the only thing I want to add is just take it back to what did, you know, what what did we do at CEA? And that was a report that wasn't designed to be a cost-benefit analysis of a rule at all. It was designed to really lay out the problem as the research as the research community, independent researchers had started to identify. There's just a number of papers out there that have found problems with conflicts. And what we were doing was pulling them all together to be able to say, look, there is a coherent problem here. Where does it come from? And we've, we've talked about conflicts, but we haven't really put, you know, nailed down what do we mean. We see excessive churning. Research documents that because uh, these broker dealers get paid for churning, that people are excessively churned. What does excessive churning mean? It means excessive fees for them, and that's one of the things that eats down, uh, <clears throat> eats down people's retirement savings. The other thing is we see people steered into overly complex products because it's harder for them to see the costs that the uh, ad advisor is getting when it's a complex product. Right? You can look easily at you know a passive mutual. Uh, indexed mutual fund and see what the fees are, it's much more, it's much harder to tease out what you're paying when it's a complex product. So you see people steered into inappropriate products for them because of the fact that it's going to generate fees uh, for the advisor. And so the, the cost to the person is not just the fees, but the fact that the product's inappropriate. So it's going through systematically and, try, and saying, look, the research shows this is what happens when people get access to conflicted advice. And there was you know, one study that said, what happens when we take conflicted advice away? And we saw people's retirement accounts going up. So we, we brought a lot of evidence to the table. That's not the evidence the SEC is interested in right now. <laughs> and, and they were called out on this by the um, 11. They I think they were, it was the, the chief economist. Was, they weren't yeah. just chief senior economists at, at, at the as former senior economist. Yeah. They, were, they were the chief economists, and they, were, and they were called out on the fact that they didn't bring any of this evidence to bear. Right. And just to be clear, the, the DOL took the excellent analysis that you all did at CEA and further developed it. You know, it's... I said recently that comparing the SEC's economic analysis to the DOL's economic analysis is like comparing a Dick and Jane reader to a PhD <laughs> dissertation. I mean, they're just they're just night and day. You know, speaking about the CEA report, uh, so even you know after you re you release the report, there's almost like immediate industry pushback on, on that on that uh, on that analysis, right? You know, what was your reaction? Did you um, expect it? You know, what what is your um, is there anything that you learned from this experience? Uh, with the in, all the industry kind of um, uh, follow up with that, uh. Jane, you want to go first? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I guess I think you know, just you know, from the advice that you know, you know, I got from you know Betsy, who had served in government before and sort of had worked on this you know rule over over the years and others I think I think we expected some pushback I think I didn't really um, appreciate the scale of it and I, I learned I don't know after I left government that um, the financial industry spent 
a healthy seven-figure sum funding research that would undermine the report. And that made me feel that I had done something right. <laughs> you forgot the finger quotes around research. Right, right. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to poke anyone in the eye. <laughs> I yeah that that's a great way to to put it. I mean they I think it's simple. They're making a lot of money off of people. They want to keep making a lot of money off of people. And I you know they are of course when you know you reveal that the emperor has new, you know no clothes <laughs> there's going to be some pushback. That's exactly what we saw in the you know, all I, I thought the scale of the pushback meant that we were not wrong but when, uh, in assessing the scale of the problem. And as I said, I think we are at a lower bound on the scale of the problem. And they know that. And that is why when we had very good evidence to come up with a $17 billion number, they needed to fight back and they mm -hmm. needed to try to discredit us. And I don't think that they were successful in that in any way. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So one thing I think that was interesting about that is the reason we had such a focus on the economic analysis and that process at all was because one of the industry's initial tactics to defeat the original DOL proposal is to say you hadn't, they hadn't adequately assessed the economic impact. They needed to do a more detailed economic analysis. And that was one of their um, initial arguments that got the initial proposal withdrawn. I think there's an interesting implication in that for industry and while it, which is that by definition, if that's the way they want to play this game, every issue will be fought based on how harmful their conduct is for their customers. That will be the public debate. It will be painful for them and ugly. And the the DOL's analysis held up in court, in, and Steve can talk about that, in court after court after court until an extreme panel in one court overturned it. But it, it, you know, one of the reasons I think we see such a shoddy analysis out of the SEC is because if they did a decent analysis, they would have to propose a decent rule. Yeah, um, all good points. I the, uh, my own view is that, that, that the industry was never successful in really laying a glove on, on even that modest $17 billion, right? I mean, that, and, and as a result of that, what they had to do was, was um, resort to uh, a couple of other just deeply misleading mythologies uh, in order to, to really fight back against the DOL's rule. And, and, and variants of those same arguments are being deployed against uh, the SEC, but they they they're, they're much more comfortable. So uh, there's, there's, the context is different. But in the case of the DOL, uh, I think one of the arguments they deployed to some effect, at least in some audiences, <coughs> was this crazy notion that if this rule is strong, if it's a broad fiduciary standard, you're going to restrict the uh, ability of everyday investors to get affordable investment advice, the, the sort of limiting access. And it's this just extraordinarily kind of perverse way of looking at regulation. You see it in the payday lending context where payday lenders are, uh, the agency itself now is saying, look, if, if we have strong underwriting standards in place, then payday lenders will go out of business and people will lose access to credit. I mean, it's a little bit like saying to a, a malnourished starving person, uh, don't you want some of this rotten, poisonous food? It, it doesn't make sense when you really take a close look at it. The other thing that they did in the DOL context was, was law, and, and this again, still you still hear echoes of it, is that the SEC was the agency that had the expertise, the jurisdictional power to, to deal with this issue. And there's, you know, there's half a dozen reasons why that is completely wrong. Congress in ERISA made it crystal clear that the DOL had responsibility for retirement accounts, far more than just securities. Nothing that uh, the Dodd-Frank had in it negated that. In fact, it, it reinforced the notion uh, by saying to the SEC, we want to give you greater authority to protect investors with a fiduciary duty. And at the same time, they said nothing about scaling back the authority of the DOL under ERISA. So neither of those arguments are, ever made sense, but in this crazy world, they got traction. Yeah, I just 
wanted to add that you know the the small saver argument just always drove me crazy because it was this, it's essentially the argument that if people knew how much they were actually paying us for this advice, they would stop paying us for this advice, right? And so, okay, maybe <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds like they should stop paying if you think they don't want to. And when and it, once we had done our analysis, I think it made it easier for us to talk about that, that it was that the problem with, for small savers is that they were charging them too much and people were only willing to pay it because the fees were just so hidden. Right. And I'd just like to throw in one side note. The industry groups that went into court to challenge the rule, the basis for their argument was we are not advisors. We are mere salespeople engaged in arm's length commercial sales transactions no different than a car dealer. And the court bought it. When they're not in court trying to defeat effective regulation, they're back to being trusted advisors. And so, I mean, their argument sounds a little less compelling if you say, well, you know, if you, if you pass this rule, you're going to lose access to biased sales recommendations from a salesperson who has incentives to recommend the products that are most profitable for the firm <laughs> instead of the ones that are best for you. Oh, no. Yeah, of course. But <laughs> and to get into an issue I think Andrew would like us to talk about, technology has fundamentally changed this equation, not just through the advent of robo-advisors, but by allowing for the automation of a lot of aspects of advice that were once very labor intensive. And so we have a variety of options available in the marketplace now where advice is available under a fiduciary standard at a very low cost to even very low accounts. And so in the unlikely event that the broker dealers, they always, you know, if you, you know, I'll take my ball and go home. You know, in the unlikely event that they would actually abandon this market entirely if you made them act in their customer's best interest, there is a viable alternative out there available to fill that space that would leave investors much better off than they are today. So yes, just to follow up on that point, when the fiduciary rule was first introduced, was first proposed, it, it turns out that, not very surprisingly, the robo-advisors were actually the biggest proponents within the financial service industry, right? So their argument is that, well, if we raise the standards, the costs will, you know, will go up. Hey, you know, we're cheap. So um, I'm just wondering, you know, what, do you, what does the panel think? Is, is robo-advisors the response to the cost argument, you know, raised by the broker-dealers? And, you know, what general role does technology have in, in playing this, to solve this problem? So I, I think that the challenge is that people like to think that they're unique and they want to have that trusted personal relationship with someone when it comes to retirement. Um, but the... The truth is the typical person has typical retirement needs and therefore is actually well served by low cost um, uh, robo advising. One of the, my favorite commercials I saw for, uh, you know, an advisor shows like a family on TV uh, and, you know, they're at their kid's soccer game, they're eating dinner, they're getting ready for work and it's like, you you know, aren't, uh, you, you know, you're unique. You need unique advice. And I'm like, no, that wasn't unique. Like, that's what we all do. We all have dinner and we all go to work and we all so, like, do some things with our kids. It's like, I think you're making the case for robo advice there. <laughs> um, and so they're trying to create this idea that, no, no, you don't, you know, you need something special when in reality, like, people have actually very similar needs and what they need is to have as much money as possible in retirement and low cost advising can do that. Right. So I would like to say just from a slightly different perspective, one point out that it was actually the fiduciary advisory community as a whole. I mean, the, the financial planning com community has for years been allies in the fight to raise the standard of conduct and groups like the CFP board and whatnot were strong allies in addition to the robos. And I think we made a tactical error by pointing to the robo-advisors. I think they're an important part of the solution, but it made it very easy. I just sat in a hearing in the House Financial Services Committee last week where one of the Republicans, well, I don't know about you, but my mom doesn't want a robot to give them advice, and neither do I. You know, And, and the issue here is not... You know, robo-advisors, as I said, technology has been harnessed by all sorts of advisors to automate portions of what they do so that, you know, maybe the future is not just so much robo-advisors as 
you know, cyborg advisors or whatever, you know, because what you see is in technology being incorporated into practices that are, that include that human contact that people want. The other thing I think where technology really offered a solution on this is people say, well, how am I supposed to, you know, comply with this best interest standard you want? In the wake of the DOL rule, we saw dozens, maybe hundreds of services roll out, jobs created that were then destroyed when the rule was destroyed, but I digress, um, that were designed to aid on this compliance side. You know, not just the advising itself, but how do you compare a 401k plan menu to the available IRA investments and determine which would be the best option for the investor? How do you analyze that and document the basis for your decision? So I think there's a lot of roles for technology to play in this area. Yeah, and I, I think there's... Um in my mind, there's an even larger point. I think this, this is absolutely right. It's, it's an important component of a solution. It's not you know, the end-all and be-all. What it says to me, it exemplifies the adaptability of the financial services industry. What that really means is that, and, and you can trace this history back to the Great Depression, almost 100 years, uh, a pattern and a practice of resisting regulatory reform by saying the sky will fall, uh, our industry will collapse and the public will suffer if these regulatory reforms go into place. And what we saw with the advent of the DOL rule, unfortunately for such a short period of time, but still, even in that short span of time, we saw the lie being put to these horrific claims that the industry could never adapt, that advice would be too expensive, et cetera, et cetera. Robo advisors, technology solutions of, 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 of several different varieties uh, were, were part and parcel of that, but it really is the larger point that, that all the fear-mongering is just that. And, and, and it's important to be keenly aware that this undergirds a lot of industry's resistance, and it's phony at, at heart. All right, so we have uh, 30 minutes, so we can uh, open up uh, to the audience for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. I have been a financial advisor for 20 years, so I've seen a lot of the, I've seen 20 years worth of regulations change, and I was so excited with the fiduciary rule because I'm in an industry that is dominated. Average age of a financial advisor is about 55, 56. It varies and predominantly um, white males. And when I'm in trainings or just out and about doing my financial advisor uh, checkups, <laughs> the, the language, oh my God, I'll have to meet with my clients every year. <laughs> um, oh my goodness, you know, how am I supposed to live without a 7% commission? Um, those of us who use this fiduciary standard were so excited, and we're also let down um, as financial advisors that the rule was killed or you know shifting over to the uh, less by the SEC language. But I just want to say thank you. Keep up the good work. I was hoping that a lot of those guys would just give up and retire. Um, <laughs> yeah, we were many, too. Many did. Many did. Many did. Um, and the ones that stuck in there have, uh, they're right back to the same, you know, battle days. So please, thank you. Keep up the. Keep well, I mean, that's an Im important point that, as I said, it wasn't just the robos who were supportive of this rule. There is a community of advisors out there who embrace their fiduciary obligations who argue for a stronger interpretation of the Advisors Act fiduciary standard than the SEC adopts, you know, who take seriously their obligation to avoid conflicts of interest, to manage the remaining conflicts of interest to the best interest of, in the best interest of their customers. So we greatly appreciate those of you in the, in the profession who, who live up to that standard every day. I, I know. You know, I, I feel for you having to compete in an industry against a bunch of cheaters. 
And that's why it's not fair. And I think that is, um, you know, why uh, it makes a lot of sense that people who are trying to do the right thing, who are doing the right thing, want to have a set of rules so that everybody's doing the right thing. Because it does make it really hard for financial advisors who are giving good advice in their client's best interest and charging a fair price to compete against somebody who's lying about what they're charging, lying about what the person's going to pay, um, and giving bad advice. That When you are making stuff up, you can make it sound a whole heck of a lot sexier than when you're actually telling the truth. <laughs> Is this on? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, I'm one of those people she was talking about. I've been in the business for 38 years. Of course, I started when I was two years old. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I'd like to mention that uh, when I started out with Equitable 11 years, with Patricia, with MetLife, and decided to go as an independent broker, you're right on that the broker dealers had the contests, had the quotas. In fact, they even went to proprietary products so that we would have a choice of going outside of MetLife, outside of Equitable. But they still had your best commissions on the products that they pushed, even if it was for lunch and learn. Now. I'd like to mention also that prospectuses is very difficult for people to understand, and that's something that needs to be rewritten. <laughs> and also, uh, my question, uh, when you had mentioned that, that uh, people stay with the companies they've retired, that's an advantage and a disadvantage, and especially with the city of Detroit that went into bankruptcy and all of their 403B plans went down the tubes. But my concern is, and maybe you can help me with this, the, I understand that it would have been much more arbitration with the DOL as far as advisors were concerned that we would have to up our E&O coverage. So I'm wondering exactly how that arbitration thing would work. Thank you. So I can jump in on that one. So the DOL rule simply affirmed the, the standard on arbitration that exists under the securities laws, which was that um, they permitted, as the SEC and FINRA permit, brokers to include pre-dispute binding arbitration clauses in their contracts. Um, the, there's, I mean, I think the argument that that, arbitra that that arbitration would go up is, you know, that the number of claims would go up was unfounded, like many of the claims. So first of all, the primary claim brought in FINRA arbitration today against broker-dealers is violation of fiduciary duty, even though theoretically brokers don't have fiduciary duty. They're being held to that standard under common law fiduciary standards already. To the degree that the DOL rule was successful in causing firms to rein in all of these toxic incentives that encourage and reward advice that is not in customers' best interests, there would be a lot fewer incentives for bad advice. There would be fewer um, of the kind of problem practices that land people in arbitration. So I actually think the there is a reasonable argument. We won't know because we don't have the the case histories to study, but there is a reasonable argument that it would, had it been embraced by industry, it would have decreased their liability exposure rather than increased it. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, the argument about, uh, the fear mongering, I guess, really, about increased liability, uh, uh, arbitrations, and so forth, stem partly from what the DOL did in trying to create a remedy, a meaningful remedy, for the IRA owners. And the idea was, look, if you're an advisor to an IRA owner under this rule and you want to charge commissions, you may. But then you have to enter into a contract which says, I'm a fiduciary. I will look after your best interest. And if you breach that contract, then the IRA account owner has a right, uh, as, he, as he or she absolutely should, to hold that advisor accountable. That's what spawned this notion that there's going to be an explosion 
uh, of, uh, of claims, if you will. But for reasons that, that Barb said, it, that underlying premise w was bogus. And to the extent that there really was going to be uh, you know, more claims and liability, it was going to actually uh, reform practices, and it was going to make injured investors whole. So it was, it was a win-win from our standpoint. So I just wanted to address the issue about rolling over a 401k or 403b, and of course you brought up the city of Detroit. Um, you know, I gave the example of the federal TSP because I don't think the federal government's going bankrupt anytime soon, and if it does, we got some big problems that go beyond retirement savings. Um, but, uh, and so I thought that that was a really excellent example of a secret shopper. But if you want a broader study, in 2011, uh, the GAO uh, did an investigation where they called around and asked for advice. And the, uh, most of the call centers recommended a rollover without getting any specific information about the fees they were paying, where the money was at, what their circumstances were. Um, uh, another, about uh, <coughs> roughly half of them said that, oh, yes, you could roll over because we have free IRAs, no fee, free, um, and talked about, uh, had no, you know, without clearly explaining any kind of investment transaction or other fees would still apply. They simply emphasized that their IRAs were free. Uh, or had no fees with a minimum balance. So it's that kind of misleading advice that I was referring to. Um, it is, you know, not everybody should leave their 401k where it is, but I think people are encouraged to roll over uh, much more than is in anyone's best interest. And those weren't fly-by-night operations. Those were the big providers who were engaged in that conduct. Yeah. Sure. Dana Muir from the Ross School. It seems that some states are with you in believing the SEC is not doing enough. Do you think states will make some progress here, or will the SEC rule preempt all of the states' efforts? Excellent question. Um, there are there are two things that happened recently at the on the state in the state arena. One is that the Association of State Regulators <laughs> sent a letter to the SEC. This is a bipartisan, reflects the bipartisan makeup of the you know, state governments, to the SEC arguing that unless it strengthened and clarified its, exist, its proposal, it was simply going to perpetuate the problems that they see every day at the state level. They're, you know, they're very concerned about the inadequacies of the SEC proposal. There are a few states that have decided to step in and see if they can adopt laws at the state level that would um, provide protections for their citizens that, that are not provided under, they don't believe would be provided under the SEC standard. Nevada is sort of out ahead. There was a legislative solution there. New Jersey um, is going through a regulatory process. They've had some hearings. We don't know what they're going to propose. New York did something targeted at insurance, you know, at annuities and, and insurance type investments that's currently in court. I think there are two things that will determine whether we see more. Oh, and, and Maryland has a legislative proposal but hasn't been acted on. There are two things that I will think will determine whether we see more of that. The first is will the SEC improve its rule. Because if the SEC were to step in and fix some of these key shortcomings, I think the, step, the states would be happy to step back and defer to a strong uniform federal standard. The other thing is whoever goes first is going to get sued. You know, they're going to face exactly the same kind of legal challenge that, that uh, DOL did. The, the law in question uh, in the securities arena is NISMIA, the National Securities Markets Improvement Act, which includes some preemption of state authority, but it's actually quite narrowly drawn. It's mostly to deal with those kinds of things like capital standards and whatnot that are logically set, best set at a uniform federal level, and specifically in preserve state authority to regulate broker-dealer conduct. One area that is preempted by NISMIA is uh, states are preempted from, from creating books and records requirements 
that are not required under federal law. So the, the industry would argue, will argue, that they can't, even if the state doesn't explicitly impose books and records requirements as a part of their rule, and they won't, you know, they're smart enough to avoid falling into that trap, the industry will argue that it is implied that in order to comply with the, the law, they have to create these books and records. I think there are flaws in that argument. One, there's actually already fairly extensive documentation requirement under Know Your Customer and Suitability Rules that you could use for this purpose. The other is that there's no end to that argument. Like, if you can argue that anything that you might do to comply is, is by definition reason to preempt the law, it, I think it sort of overwhelms the argument. So I think the states would have a strong defense, but this hasn't previously been litigated. And I think the DOL had a really strong defense. And we, you know, so we, we've seen <laughs> what can happen in the court system. But I think those, you know, will, if, if, one, if a state Per perseveres, gets challenged, and wins a good decision in court, then I think you'll see more states um, step in if the SEC doesn't adopt a stronger standard. Spot on. Good morning. My name is Terry Friedline. I'm from the School of Social Work here. And uh, my question is about the regulatory floor. Um, so you've mentioned technology a bit. And I think um, technology increasingly um, creates you know, more complex tools for wealth accumulation. And you know, pensions, 401ks, retirement planning um, you know, are some opportunities for wealth accumulation that are um, too often available. Uh, to you know, most people that, that live in the country, uh, you know, that's a it's a financial product and a, and a service that uh, you know really isn't widely accessible. And uh, with added technology, um, it relies on institutions to generate that wealth um, that's mostly ensconced uh, into the accounts of white wealthy investors. And I think can contribute to the racial wealth divide uh, that we see is expanding. And I think uh, this panel and the, and the panel earlier, um, you know, have been talking about, uh, you know, the regulatory floor. Uh, and I'm interested from your perspectives um, how that floor can really be cemented. So, you know, hopefully not just thinking about the bare minimum, but, uh, you know, really like a, a step above a floor that is really solid and stable and is expanded so that more people are standing on it. So I'll jump in first. So before I came to CFA Low these many years ago, I was on the board of the Denver Food Bank Coalition. So I worked on helping people get through emergencies with a basic amount of food in the middle of the Reagan recession. And then I went to CFA to work on how to make rich people richer by protecting them from abusive practices. Because when I started in 86, this was not a middle income issue. You know, I think that, you know, working on investor protection issues at most, you're dealing with about half the population. You know, like something like, isn't the median amount that people have saved for retirement zero? Um, I can't protect someone with no retirement savings from abusive practices in the retirement market. I think there is a whole set of things we need to be doing to rethink the way we fund people's retirements, to rethink the way we provide people with adequate income to live on in their retirement years that shouldn't expose them to these abusive practices. And it's not, it's not my area of expertise, but I think it's a, it, it, and I have, like, you probably know, so I speak with this just with a fair amount of passion. I have devoted 30 years to it. It is a far more pro impressing problem to figure out how we are going to help people live a basically decent standard of living in retirement than making sure that, you know, rich people don't get ripped off. But this is increasingly a middle class problem. We haven't, it's not a low income problem, but it is increasingly a middle class problem because this is now how we, we fund retirement accounts. So we're increasingly seeing people with, um, you know, 
with much more modest means being brought into the system. So I don't, I don't feel like I've answered your question, but that's the perspective that I bring to those issues. Yeah, I think, uh, Barbara, I share a, a lot of, of that perspective. So the, the reason I think that uh, this conflicted advice issue has become so salient is because the middle class increasingly rely on their retirement savings to fund their retirement. So, uh, you know, a, a much smaller portion of middle class baby boomers will be relying on some kind of pension and instead will be relying on what they saved. Um, so we're no longer talking about transfers among the rich <laughs> when it comes to, uh, to conflicted advice, but we're talking about transfers from the middle class to the rich, and this becomes a bigger, I think, more pressing social problem. But there's another social problem, which is that we do not, we have an, a retirement savings program that is tr designed to bolster the retirement savings of the most well-off. And that doesn't have to do with conflicted advice. That has to do with the tax preferences that we have set up for retirement savings. So, you know, we fund retirement savings through giving, you know, essentially a matching grant to people who save for retirement. And that matching grant is a function of your highest marginal tax rate. So you're, if you're rich, you get the biggest grant. And if you're poor, you get zero. That's our retirement savings plan. And that's terrible. And so I think if we... We even know not only is it terrible because it's putting mo as you know more federal dollars towards uh, rich people's retirement savings, but it also actually doesn't really work. So if what we're trying to do is spend tax dollars in order to increase retirement savings, we know that tax preferred accounts is like the least effective way we could do. We need to be incentivizing people on the margin. We need to be incentivizing people who don't have any retirement savings. We do not need to be doing dollar for dollar matching of the very richest people. So that's a, a different issue than conflicted advice, but very much a real one. Well, one just other a, a quick point is we have a system in a country where a majority of people can't come up with $400 to get through an emergency, relies on them to take money out of their paycheck to fund their retirement. How effective do you think that works for that portion of the population? Yeah, I mean, you know, Barb and Betsy are absolutely right that um, our retirement savings problem sort of extends, you know, beyond conflicted advice. And, um, you know, we sort of have an institutionally terrible system. Um, sort of one kind of moderating fact, and it's not fully moderating, but it's, it's just the fact that, you know, for a lot of middle class households, um, you know, their homes um, provide, you know, some element of retirement security. And so even if they may not have assets, you know, they, they still have their house. But of course, that's, you know, fraught with a lot of challenges and risks and, um, you know, different uh, populations build equity in their homes at different rates, sort of depending on how they're able to time the cycle. And we know that, you know, the availability of credit is pro-cyclical. And so, you know, who gets access during boom times when returns are low? Um, you know, it's, it's low-income people um, who are sort of like swapped in. And so, um, you know, there, there are a lot of challenges and problems with that. But, you know, for a lot of people who don't have access to pensions and, you know, um, DC plans and, you um, <clears throat> other employer-based uh, savings, um, you know, they have their homes, and, and that's also part of the, the challenge in sort of, you know, helping households build a secure retirement is that it had, the, the solutions have to be really, really multi-pronged. I, I will, it just, that reminds me about what I think is the most ironic thing about the regulatory environment around retirement right now, which is that at the time that, you know, the DOL rule is being vacated, the current administration also decided to vacate the DOL um, guidance, which said states could start to set up retirement plans for people who didn't have them through their employer, and they didn't need to worry about the ERISA fiduciary standards. So all of a sudden, like, the current administration super concerned about fiduciary standards if we're talking about a state trying to give access to retirement savings to poor people, just not so concerned about people getting it through uh, through financial advisors. Why the apparent difference of opinion? Well, because a lot of uh, you know, the financial services industry thought that they would lose out to these state plans and it would be the state plans would divert profit from them to the states. So the, the view on where the fiduciary duty seems to be 
always sides with is the financial services industry going to make more money or less money off this and they go in the you know whatever direction means more money for financial services turns out financial incentives matter who knew <laughs> Okay. I'm going to now raise a very sad, really sad uh, topic, which was uh, the MyRA product, which some of us worked on, <laughs> which is now defunct. Um, and in fact, I'm reading about it. It looks like those who had MyRA accounts have been rolled over into a Roth IRA with uh, the private firm Retirement Clearinghouse LLC. What did we do wrong? What could we have done differently? And is the government potentially this new anchor by which we are trying to enable those half of Americans who have no savings as a starter retirement product? Starter savings product. This was actually one of my biggest criticisms. We're talking about retirement to people who have no concept that they were of a reach retirement. It's highly aspirational for a lot of people. Should we have even thought about renaming it and calling it something different? But generally the idea of using the federal government, not to mention your point about the auto enrollment programs at the state levels, but using government as not only thinking about the tax changes that would be warranted to make this more equitable, but government as a way to anchor, facilitate savings for at least the sort of mid to longer term. So, so, so I mean, what we did wrong is we lost an election, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but beyond that, I do think there's a fundamental flaw in all of these approaches, to go back with, with what we were talking about before, that rely so heavily on people coming up with the money to save, coming up with the money to save now for retirement that they can't, imagine getting to. And there may well be some different messaging that you can do around that that um, helps with that. I, uh, CFA has a program that we um, sponsor. It's called America Saves. It's designed to get low and moderate income people to save and build wealth, uh, identify a goal, set a plan, save for that plan. And a tremendous amount of thought has gone into the development of messaging in that. How do you, how do you encourage people to, to do that? Um, so I recommend it as if you're interested in seeing a sort of program out there that can be effective. But I do think there's a fundamental problem it, as long as we restrict ourselves to thinking about this in terms of how are we going to have, have people who don't have enough money to fix a flat tire if they get one start saving toward retirement. It's not going to work. Yeah, and if I could just sort of pick up on that a little bit, I think um, we've learned just, you know, based on sort of better data and better measurement over the last, you know, few years that, um, you know, people, households have um, face a lot of month-to-month -month volatility in their income. And their forced order challenge sort of beyond, you know, like planning for retirement and how great life is going to be and like the golden years is just like managing through that like sort of volatility. And, and to me, that's sort of like the, the basic, you know, sort of first order problems. Like how do you, you know, help households budget so that they don't have these like financial emergencies and sort of have this, you know, um, you know, liquid savings or some buffer stock savings that they can top tap into for emergencies. And, you know, and, and, and that's some combination of, you know, policies and budgeting tools. And, you know, certainly there's a role for technology um, and stuff like that. Um, but I, I don't see us really cracking like the retirement nut until we sort of solve that basic budgeting issue. I, I applauded, you know, the ambitions associated with that program. But I had a lot, you know, the concern is that low-income people that actually need the money right now and if they don't need it right yeah 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 right um, really yes um but low-income people um you know there is this whole issue of trying to get people to save not for retirement but for the rainy day which we know is coming and so i do think thinking about products that um that help you know, as Jane just said, learn to budget and learn to save is the first place to go. And I think we really do need to to rethink, like, what do we need? 
who needs what to top up Social Security? Because some people don't need a lot of additional savings in addition to Social Security if we have a robust enough Social Security system. So some of these reforms have to be thought about in terms of that broader picture of how are we how are we managing retirement savings? How much are we spending on it? How much of it is going through tax preferences? And how much of it is going through uh, Social Security spending? Yes, hi. I uh, was wondering, what role do you uh, feel the educational community should play going forward in facilitating financial literacy in general? So this is actually sort of if I, when I retire, my new pet project. <laughs> Um, the leading cause of dropouts in Colorado, where I live, and I live in a town with a 35% high school dropout rate, is that students can't get even a non-college prep diploma without passing algebra, and we can't apparently teach algebra so they can pass. So for a non-college prep high school graduate, couldn't we have a basic consumer finance math class teaching you know, math concepts around percentages on loans. And I, I mean, so, which isn't an, so much an investment concept, but it's some of this basic uh, consumer literacy issues. And I think at least in, I'm, at least in our school system in Colorado, and I'm sure there are others that do it better elsewhere, but <laughs> there's very little thought given to that. And by the way, it might have some added benefits because some of the worst victims in our current retirement system are teachers in 403B plans that are larded up with high cost annuities that are taking expenses that are so high they're eating up all of the potential returns. So we're taking people who are underpaid who are going into their own private savings to buy school supplies for their classes and then putting them in the pretty much the worst retirement system we have out there. So if we did engage the education community, maybe we get some side benefit there as well. Can I add one thing before we end? And, and th I think that the, the final sort of segment of this panel has been very interesting on some policy questions that go beyond just the fiduciary duty and so forth. And, and in consistent with Better Markets Core mission, one thing that we, that we should always bear in mind is nothing is going to harm uh, investors, Americans at, at every level, especially at the low end, as much as uh, the kind of economic upheaval that came about in 2008. And it's a sober reminder that all of these problems, you know, require different policy solutions, but you can't really make any headway unless you ensure the stability, the fundamental stability of the financial system. And that's why we mustn't forget that lesson. And, and while we protect investors, we also have to fight against deregulation on the Dodd-Frank reforms. That's why it's so key. That's great. Can we acknowledge our panelists? Thank you for your time. So from here, we uh, before we welcome Rich Cordray to give our keynote lunch talk, I'm asking you to please very quickly go out to the Great Hall where we have Mediterranean food set up from Palm Palace. Grab lunches, come back here. If you want to sit toward the front.
I'm not yet rich, but I will be rich. I would love to be rich. Um, rich Cordray, that is. Uh, I'm uh, just absolutely thrilled to welcome you back to, um, to the Ford School and to the Consumer Financial um, Protection Conference that we're having here today. It's um, my um, distinct honor um, to be able to introduce our next speaker, Rich Cordray, um, in this uh, particular uh, venue and, and many others. Rich does not really need an introduction, but I'm going to do so anyway. Um, Rich has many um, skills and talents. We'll, we'll start with the obvious one. He's a um, five-time Jeopardy winner, um, which is uh, really hard to pull off. He knows a lot of trivia. We were having dinner last night, and uh, the um, restaurant owner came up and was chatting with us for a bit. And I can't even remember the question, but Rich knew not only the answer to the question, but the statistics behind the answer to the question involving some baseball player. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> it was a good category. Um, Rich is uh, a former um, treasurer, um, a county and state treasurer in Ohio. Uh, he is the former attorney general of Ohio. Uh, Rich was one of the um, uh, first people really in the country um, to call out uh, the abuses that were happening uh, on the ground um, in subprime mortgage lending. Um, uh, Mike was talking in the earlier panel about uh, the voices from the field that were um, calling out what was going wrong. Mike was out uh, talking about the subprime mortgage crisis uh, at, with evidence from North Carolina. Um, Rich was calling out the problems from Ohio. Um, really around the country there are a lot of voices um, uh, calling out these problems, but Rich uh, not only called them out but was working to try and correct those abuses on the ground. Um, in the lead up to the financial crisis and after. And um, Rich then uh, uh, came into um, the federal government, uh, became the CFPB's uh, first enforcement director. Uh, and then um, after a, uh, a long uh, involved process um, in the Senate, uh, became the first uh, director, the inaugural director of the CFPB. I should say um, the process was long and involved. It was uh, very partisan uh, at first in Rich's confirmation. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, overwhelmingly um, approved um, Rich on a bipartisan basis, having seen the work he did um, at the CFPB. And I think it's a real testament um, to Rich's uh, even-keeled manner um, and ability to get stuff done to deliver um, results uh, for American households. Uh, Rich did a phenomenal job um, uh, with the handoff from Elizabeth Warren building an uh, incredibly strong and vibrant um, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It is not easy to build anything from scratch, um, not easy at all. It is really hard to build a new federal agency. Um, and uh, I think it's a real testament um, to, uh, to Rich and to many people in this room who worked with Rich um, that that agency was not only built, but um, thrived. And I think you can see that in the way in which the CFPB acted under his uh, leadership uh, in enforcement and supervision and rule writing. Uh, it really is quite a, a testament um, to, his, um, to his skills. Uh, most of you know Rich left the CFPB and, um, and ran for governor in Ohio. Um, I can say, I guess, um, that um, uh, it's unfortunate that he didn't uh, win. Um, I think he would have been a, an outstanding governor. Um, Rich is um, uh, now uh, able to reflect on his experiences um, at the CFPB and, and before, and I'm really deeply um, looking forward to his comments today and to the discussion that um, follows. Uh, I... Um, I've used this phrase before, so my apologies, Rich, but I, I will um, say again, um, with pun intended, um, we are very much in your debt um, for all your work. Uh, with that, please join me in welcoming Rich Cordray.
Thank you, Michael, to, and to everyone uh, involved in organizing this conference. Uh, it has been peculiarly well done, uh, and we all thank you. And I also uh, appreciate very much the theme of the conference, uh, which is uh, consumer protection in an age of uncertainty, uh, which I think is exactly right. And I'm honored to be here, too, with what seems to be a distinguished group of consumer law mavens uh, and uh, have some trepidation about the question and answer session, but we'll do the best uh, we can. The notion of consumer protection in an age of uncertainty seems right to me most of all because right now we're in the middle of an administration whose commitment to consumer protection seems questionable at best. The primary subject of my talk will be how consumer financial protection is peculiarly affected by our dual state federal system of federalism. But as the conference materials note, this is also an uncertain age because the rate of change in the financial marketplace is so swift right now that it's difficult for anyone to keep pace with it, let alone those notoriously plotting regulators. So with your indulgence, let me nod for a moment to recent technological developments before returning then to the shifting policy environment, which is the real focus of my remarks today. And then, of course, I'm happy to spend uh, whatever time we have answering your questions about anything I have said or not said as you please. First, as to technology, there is no doubt that what has been quaintly regarded as a market for thousands of years a physical place where buyers and sellers come together in person to transact their business in physical commodities, has been transformed in the past generation to something human beings would once have found unrecognizable. There are a lot of aspects of our lives today that human beings for thousands of years would have found unrecognizable. People have always craved speed, ease, and convenience. But for most of humanity not flush with great wealth, the physical limitations of our world simply did not allow it. We thought we were reaching unprecedented new levels of human commerce in the past century or two with mass production, the automobile, and instantaneous communication by telegraph and telephone. But nothing before it can compare to life in the computer age where our physical limitations are literally melting away and online commerce, built on the mysterious power of big data, is solving the logistics and reducing the costs of speed, ease, and convenience. And the result is to make them increasingly available to the broad consumer public. It also presents a Schumpeterian moment when many moats and walls that previously protected stodgy rent seekers in the marketplace are starting to be torn down. So hip, hip, hooray, right? In many respects, yes, but not entirely. Along with its benefits, 21st century consumerism also presents new dangers. One danger is posed by the financialization of our economy, the mass availability of consumer credit, which creates both opportunities but also risks for people who make it in over their heads and ruin their financial lives. Of course, even in the old days, people could do things that landed them in debtor's prison, but more types of credit and more complex credit products are now available to more consumers than ever before. And once again, I will stress that though this can be a very good thing, and in many ways is a very good thing, it also raises new and substantial concerns about people's ability to manage their credit and the effects on their financial health. Another danger comes from the very nature of speed, ease, and convenience. Many consumer choices are small and simple enough, but some are more complicated and can be quite consequential. For those consumers who don't understand all the ramifications, hasty decisions can lead to lasting regrets. Yet another danger stems from the nature of the online medium, where greater anonymity or sheer unfamiliarity with the other party can facilitate fraud and other forms of exploitation further encouraged by the evidently greater difficulties in effectively enforcing the law in a world of borderless commerce where the enforcers are very much border constrained. And one last source of danger, though I hardly claim to have made a comprehensive effort to exhaust the subject, is the threat to our data security and our privacy in all the information that's being amassed about us, often without our full awareness of what may happen to us as a result. 
It's become fashionable for regulators to think and talk about all these technological developments in the financial marketplace, the so-called <laughs> fintech companies, as something that might be best addressed by the concept of a regulatory sandbox. One thing that I recall about a sandbox from when our twins were little is that nobody quite knows what exactly is going on in there. <laughs> The same seems to me true of the regulators who bounce that term around rather casually in their conversations. But one thing it certainly should not be is a mindless regulation-free zone. There are many dangers in the postmodern abstract marketplace, and people can get hurt in a sandbox just as much as they can anywhere else. So that's as much as I'm planning to say in these brief remarks about technology, although if you want to return to that in the questions, I'm happy to talk some more. My main topic is what the conference organizers have euphemistically referred to as the shifting policy environment, namely the transition from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. I'm not going to try to speak to consumer protection across the board. I do not know for certain whether the new administration is trying to dismantle longstanding legal protections for consumers of food, drugs, household products, motor vehicles, aviation, and other tangible products. Many of those provisions go to protecting the public safety, and I cannot say whether it's currently being compromised. Though some of these areas, such as aviation, are under extreme stress right now, and the actions taken in response will help us understand more about the administration's posture on these issues. My focus here instead is on the area of consumer financial protection, based on my experience as the first director of the new CFPB for its first six years. In the area of consumer finance, there has been a definite turn of direction. That was especially the case during the transitional leadership of Mr. Mulvaney, an adamant opponent who made no secret of his personal hostility to the Consumer Bureau. But the full extent of that turn is not yet entirely clear under the newly confirmed director. I have criticized some of her decisions thus far, such as the move to roll back the payday lending rule, and the claim that the Bureau lacks authority to supervise companies for compliance with the Military Lending Act. But so far, the jury is still out on many other issues, and people need to be given a chance to settle in to a job. At a minimum, however, it seems clear that the Consumer Bureau has adopted a different stance in two key areas, enforcement and regulation. The number of enforcement actions, as was noted by the panel uh, the first panel today, has declined sharply in the past 16 months, and the pace of pro-consumer regulations appears to have slackened as well. There has been an avowed rebalancing away from the interests of the consumer public to a greater solicitude for the interests of the financial industry. To be clear, I think it's no mystery, I disagree with the main thrust of this shift toward federal inaction on consumer protection, which is very much out of step with the approach we took during the early days of the Bureau and throughout my tenure. I think that aggressive policies for protecting consumers in the financial marketplace are needed and justified in the economy of the 21st century. The financial crisis of 2008, which did so much damage to this country and was prompted by the massive meltdown in the mortgage market is Exhibit A on that point given that the mortgage market is the largest of the consumer finance markets. But a very interesting question now is, where does the shifting policy environment at the federal level leave the issue of consumer financial protection in the United States of America? In some Western countries, there would be no further basis for uncertainty about where we now stand. In countries like Great Britain, with a unitary system of government, which means they lack a system of federalism, a shift in policy at the center settles the issue for the entire nation. But that is not necessarily true here in the United States. As Justice Brandeis famously noted, and this is a quote, it is one of the happy incidents of the federal system that a single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. As with many famous judicial aphorisms, the mere statement of the principle is far from the whole story. It is not so clear that a single courageous state may act in the manner he suggests. 
If its citizens choose that it should serve as a laboratory to try novel social and economic experiments, there may be significant legal, political, and even practical obstacles in its path. Consider, for example, the current struggles over marijuana laws between our federal and state governments and the uncertainty that currently reigns in their wake. Moreover, it's also far from clear that if one state chooses to try a novel experiment, that it can readily do so without risk to the rest of the country. Think, for example, about the way in which vaccinations currently are being handled in various states, whether it can be truly be said that those legislative experiments are being carried out without risk to the rest of the country. And we have the Supremacy Clause, which plainly states, this is a quote with uh, omissions to improve comprehension, the Constitution and the laws of the United States, which will be made in pursuance thereof, shall be the supreme law of the land, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. Thus, as I said a moment ago, Justice Brandeis's statement is not necessarily true. In fact, it was far from true at the time he said it. He wrote those words, after all, in a dissenting opinion, in a case where the Supreme Court held to the contrary. His dissent was joined by only one other member of the court. At the time he wrote, the court still held strongly to the Lochter Doctrine that freedom of contract as enshrined in the accepted understanding of due, the Due Process Clause, trumped and thus invalidated any state law to the contrary. And for almost a century, the court had held that the law governing commercial relations for businesses and consumers at the state level could be controlled by federal common law in cases filed in the federal courts. Both approaches were ultimately overruled and abandoned in later decisions, but at the time Justice Brandeis wrote, the happy incidents of federalism were deeply clouded by prevailing interpretations of American law. Ironically, in fact, the court in that very case in which Justice Brandeis wrote, New State Ice Company versus Liebman, regarded itself as invoking the U.S. Constitution to knock down a state law as a means of serving the interests of consumers. The Oklahoma legislature had passed a law regulating the companies that could make or sell ice. Under the law, any company had to seek a license to engage in this business. The law had been passed at the behest of the large ice companies that exerted effective control over the legislature. Its practical tendency, as the district court had held, was to shut out new enterprises and protect the monopoly power of the existing businesses. As the court held, the law was not passed to protect the consumer public, but rather for the opposite purpose. Yet Justice Brandeis's position would have blessed the law and allowed it to disserve consumers all in the name of state experimentation. Therefore, we need to recognize that the federal-state relationship presents essentially a neutral spectrum in which either side at any time might be pursuing policies that either do or do not favor the interests of consumers. But let's get back now to 2019. Positing for the moment that there is a retreat in pursuing consumer financial protection at the federal level, what are the prospects for maintaining the same kind of protections for consumers at the state level? We have 50 additional sources of law to contemplate, and we have 50 distinct sets of public officials that we can encourage to enforce those laws vigorously. Certainly at least some of these laws and some of these officials are inclined to carry forward the banner of consumer financial protection, even in conflict with contrary views embodied in federal law or adhered to by their federal counterparts. So what then? Can the states decide to exercise the happy incidents of our federalism to step into the breach and make up the difference? If they do, would their actions constitute a complete response, a partial response, or an ineffective response to the shifting policy environment? The answer depends on the particulars of the legal framework that controls a specific area of public policy, including economic policy. As noted earlier, the Supremacy Clause stipulates that any proper federal law is supreme and controlling, regardless of anything to the contrary embodied in state law. Does that mean any state law purporting to protect consumers in a way that's different from federal law would be rendered invalid as contrary to the federal law? Does federal preemption thus negate state efforts to provide broader financial protections for consumers? 
Prior to the Dodd-Frank Act, it seems that the answer to that question might well have been yes, that even anemic federal laws would preempt stronger state laws to the contrary because of the inconsistent rules of conduct they would pose for individuals and corporations. That is the doctrine of conflict preemption, which the Supreme Court has laid down to control any instance of a state law that would interfere with the intended objectives of federal law. As has been determined with such diverse commercial areas as medical devices or cigarette labels or airbags and motor vehicles, even so with consumer financial protection, if the federal law conflicts with state laws, even more protective state laws, then a court might well hold that federal preemption negates those conflicting state laws. That would be true, for instance, if the federal policy were that consumer protection should extend only so far and no farther as part of a uniform national policy on how to balance the interests of the consumer public against those of financial providers. And in the current administration, there's no doubt that some number of federal legislators and some other federal financial officials prefer this view. Another potential problem is that federal officials in a shifting policy environment might decide that they no longer have the same zeal to enforce the law as was shown previously. In the field of consumer financial protection, a shorthand phrasing of this view might be whether federal officials should push the envelope, that's a quote, in advancing consumer protections in the financial marketplace. Mr. Mulvaney stated explicitly that he believed I had done so, that such an approach was undesirable or even improper, and he made clear that he would not do so during his interim tenure. On traditional theories of dual federalism, it was up to federal officials to enforce federal law, State officials were authorized to enforce state law, and never the twain shall meet. Hence, a voluntary pullback in enforcement at the federal level was dispositive of the continued efficacy of federal law, at least while those federal officials remained in position to impose their views. And if federal officials could thus effectively undermine the force of the federal laws, while also claiming to preempt state laws protecting consumers, then the depressing result would appear to be checkmate. But interestingly, the Dodd-Frank Act imposed important changes in the federal state landscape that governs consumer financial protection in particular. And let me here take a moment and as, a, as a point of a personal privilege and say a number of the people who were involved in drafting the Dodd-Frank Act are in this room today. And I need to state publicly how much I am thankful to them for the excellent job they did in drafting that statute. People give us credit for having set up the CFPB and started a federal agency from scratch, and that was a big job, no question about it. But to conceive what the agency would be and to conceptualize that and implement it in legislation, to state and scope out the powers and authorities and how it would all fit together was a momentous task as well, and they did it very well. When people would ask me from time to time what other powers and authorities we were lacking that we needed at the Consumer Bureau, there was little or nothing that we could uh, say uh, that we were missing from that statute. The one complaint I do have is the auto dealer carve-out, but that was not the drafters of the legislation, but rather the legislators themselves uh, who imposed that uh, due to political compromise. Uh, but what I want to focus here on is not the drafting this, of the Dodd-Frank Act in terms of the CFPB's power and authorities, but its drafting as it affected the law in this broader context of uh, federalism. So again, what are the changes that it made in the federal state landscape that govern consumer financial protection? What a way to understand the point is to conceive of these measures as default rules. Ultimately, the controlling view on federal preemption always lies with the Congress, at least within its proper role of enacting legislation that does square with the U.S. Constitution. But the Constitution itself does not dictate whether a state law can or should run contrary to a federal law. That's a determination that Congress has the authority to, to make in the first place. Of course, the courts have a subordinate authority to determine preemption issues in any area where they must construe the congressional intent. But if the Congress speaks clearly, then that is the end of the matter. The Dodd-Frank Act changed the default rule on preemption in a crucial way. Section 1041A1 of Title 10, 
which addresses the legislative issue concerning sources of law, said as to the issue of federal preemption as follows. A little bit of bracketing here to make it readable. The Consumer Financial Protection Act may not be construed as annulling, altering, or affecting or exempting any person from complying with the statutes, regulations, orders, or interpretations in effect in any state, except to the extent that any such provisions of law is inconsistent with the provisions of this act. Thus far, this is just a restatement of federal preemption theory, uh, that if state laws are inconsistent with the federal law, uh, they, they cannot be uh, uh, pursued. But subsection A2 works a distinct change by saying, quote, for purposes of this subsection, a statute, regulation, order, interpretation, and effect in any state is not inconsistent with the provisions of this act if the protection that such statute, regulation, order, interpretation affords to consumers is greater than the protection provided under this act. This is a telltale provision, and it's notable because it effectively speaks in the language of rights. To explain this, let me make an analogy to doctrines of state constitutional law. That's a subject that I used to teach. It's been long established that the rights guaranteed under the U.S. Constitution are distinct from the rights guaranteed under state constitutions. For more than a century, prior to the incorporation of federal rights against the states under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, this conceptual point was basically irrelevant because there could be no conflict between a right guaranteed against the federal government and a right guaranteed against the state government. That was the holding in Barron versus Baltimore, City of Baltimore in the early 19th century. The U.S. Constitution created and constrained the federal government. State constitutions created and constrained the state governments. These sets of rights operated wholly independently, and their intersection was a null set. But after the incorporation doctrine was broadly adopted in the middle of the last century, you could have the same types of rights protected against state officials free speech rights, religious rights, search and seizure rights, and so on, under both the federal and state constitutions. Often the language of the two documents is precisely or essentially the same. Yet it has been settled for many decades that there could be independent construction of these same substantive constitutional rights, and where they clash, the resolution of that clash is governed by a one-way ratchet. Wherever federal rights are interpreted one way, and state rights are interpreted some other way, the state rights can protect individuals beyond the scope of the federal rights, but they cannot operate to undercut the scope of federal rights. Put differently, and more simply, as was stated on the panel this morning, the federal constitutional rights are a floor but not a ceiling of consumer protection, uh, constitutional protection against the actions of state officials in that uh, setting. And for example, that would be true even if uh, state law contains UDAP provisions, unfair deceptive practices, acts or practices, and federal law contains similar provisions or even almost identical provisions, unfair deceptive and abusive acts or practices. Those could be interpreted differently at the state level than at the federal level, and they could be more protective even though the underlying language was the same. That is exactly what this language in the Dodd-Frank Act provides as well, yet without the confusion of having two different sovereign governments. Consumer laws, of course, protect against private individuals and corporations, not governments. If states wish to confer broader consumer financial protections against private individuals and corporations, they can now do so because of Dodd-Frank, regardless of whether the U.S. Congress or federal officials have done so. That is the new baseline of fairness that Congress has created under federal law in this special realm of consumer finance. The decision by state officials to confer broader protections on consumers as a matter of state law is not inconsistent with and is not contrary to federal law, meaning that the default rule is there is no conflict preemption of such more generous state laws. So one might ask, and maybe I would ask some of the drafters who are here, why should this be the new baseline? Why should we have a one-way ratchet favoring consumer financial protections? To put it bluntly, this language reflects the notion that consumers deserve certain rights, and where state officials choose to recognize and protect those rights, they should have latitude to do so. In other words, the default rule now is that more consumer protection conferred by states is considered a good thing and thus is legally permissible despite the text of the Supremacy Clause. And since this language appears in statute 
in the Dodd-Frank Act itself, explicitly declared by the Congress itself. It would seem to control any efforts by regulators to act to the contrary by trying to preempt such state laws on their own authority unless they have countervailing statutory language they can cite in support. Now, the second major change embodied in the Dodd-Frank Act has to do with the issues of executive power concerning the enforcement of the federal consumer laws. Section 1042A essentially says, and I'm paraphrasing some complicated language here, that in any state, either the top legal official or the top financial regulator can take action in a federal or state venue to enforce the provisions of the Consumer Financial Protection Act and its implementing regulations against anyone who violates the act or such regulations and to secure remedies for any such violations as provided by law. The loan exception is for nationally chartered banks, but even they can be subject to an action by the state's top legal official for violating not the act itself, but its implementing regulations. This was the Congress's considered response, or maybe something of a political compromise, to the Supreme Court's surprisingly pro-state holding in the Cuomo versus Clearinghouse case. Now, that's a bit complicated, and it merits several observations. First, this seems like a fairly novel form of federalism. Apparently, it's not unprecedented. Uh, but novel, which authorizes state officials to take the initiative to enforce federal law directly. Why would Congress do that? I would submit it was a far-sighted response to precisely the shifting policy environment we now have, where the federal government itself may now be disinclined for one reason or another to engage in robust enforcement of federal consumer law. Those reasons might include an adherence to free market ideology or an anti-government bias, or a desire to support the financial industry, or agency capture, or resource limitations, or perhaps some other reason, or perhaps all of those reasons. Whatever the reasoning may be, the Congress that enacted the Dodd-Frank Act spoke clearly to say that it was not willing to put all of its enforcement eggs in the federal basket. It made the express determination to authorize 50 other sovereign entities to enforce federal law as well, at least for the most part. This is a departure from strict notions of dual federalism where federal officials enforce federal law and state officials enforce state law. Yet it seems natural enough to me that Congress would want to see more robust enforcement of the laws that it has enacted, not just in this area, but in any area. It disrespects Congress when the executive branch hollows out valid laws on the books through mere inaction, as though the federal officials had not taken a constitutional oath to faithfully execute those laws. Indeed, this provision suggests that Congress was concerned that the consumer financial laws would be systematically under-enforced, and so they sought to expect, expand and strengthen the team of officials engaged in giving them teeth. Perhaps all federal law is systematically under-enforced. Since crossing the line is subject to judicial correction and sanctions, which may prompt caution about treading into gray areas close to the line, anybody who's dealt with in-house government attorneys knows this mindset, or because limited resources and unlimited problems simply lead to an inevitably futile game of catch-up where regulators and law enforcement officers never quite feel that they're winning. However all of that may be, what we now have is an enhanced system of federalism applicable to consumer financial protection under the Dodd-Frank Act. State officials now have more tools and more resources than ever before. This reflects Congress's embrace of the importance of protecting consumer rights in the financial marketplace. Now, one or more of you consumer law experts might want to ask me, what about Section 1044 of the Dodd-Frank Act? I'm cutting you off. I'm not giving you the chance. <laughs> Which further governs preemption issues involving the OCC under the National Bank Act and which by itself contains no fewer than seven subsections and nine sub-subsections. This is the point at which I might throw up my hands and say that these are issues for the courts to decide. <laughs> Indeed, Congress may even have executed a classic punt here after what I recall was a fierce fight about whether to incorporate the murky preemption holding in the Barnett Bank case about when state laws substantially interfere with federal law, a debate in which we might say that perhaps not a single member of Congress would have clearly understood what the final resting point was and what the meaning of Section 1044 actually was for national bank preemption. 
But I will say a couple things here even about this obscure section. First, it does not apply to any of the non-bank financial companies, thousands and thousands of companies, who are treated under the pro-consumer default rules laid out earlier. Second, it only applies to nationally chartered banks themselves, defined very narrowly to exclude even their affiliates and subsidiaries, which is no doubt creating a bit of uh, reorganization uh, in some of those uh, entities. Third, putting the Barnett Bank case holding aside for the moment, the only other ground on which state consumer financial laws are preempted even against nationally chartered banks is where they would, quote, have a discriminatory effect on national banks in comparison with the effect of the law on a bank chartered by that state. This subsection again presents a relatively spare basis for federal preemption, which perhaps should inform judicial interpretation of the next subsection, which is the one incorporating the preemption test from Barnett Bank. Enough of all that. But stepping back from the weedy marshes of federal preemption and its intricacies, the bottom line is this. Even if the federal government is temporarily sounding some manner of retreat from the battlefield, we can salute the Congress and those who assisted the Congress for ensuring that even in this shifting policy environment, consumer financial protection remains alive and well in the United States. It has done so in the Dodd-Frank Act by creating what we might call a framework of competitive federalism. Competitive federalism empowers the states and their officials to expand and protect the rights of consumers in the financial marketplace by expanding state law and by enforcing federal law. I see faces in the crowd here today who are eagerly and proudly carrying that mantle. To them I say, press forward. Test the boundaries. Don't shy away from some of the uncertainties in the law. Do what you believe is right to protect consumers against fraud and abuses. And I urge the same to our federal colleagues to whatever extent you are permitted to do so. Remember the words of President Kennedy in his 1962 speech to Congress calling for a consumer bill of rights. He said then, consumers by definition include us all. They're the largest economic group in the economy, affecting and affected by almost every public and private economic decision. Two-thirds of all spending in the economy is by consumers. But they are the only important group in the economy who are not effectively organized, whose views are often not heard. The same is still true today. So you must listen for their voices, and you must act to protect them through sound laws that are vigorously enforced. Please know that every day, not only I, but millions of Americans are fervently rooting you on. Thank you. There's always one. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Terry Friedlein. I'm in a school of social work here. And my question has to do with federalism. And um, much of what I know from fe about federalism comes from a book by Jamila Melchner uh, on the fragmented democracy. And one of her points in the book is that um, federalism with regard to Medicaid um, undermines people's uh, economic lives and potentially suppresses their political voice. And so um, given that the CFPB, you know, particularly under your leadership, had been active in soliciting consumers' voice, um, how, uh, how do you see kind of the, the CFPB in the context of federalism uh, in related, you know, related to consumers' kind of economic lives and their, their voice on issues related to consumer protections? So this is the point I tried to make about uh, Justice Brandeis and his dissent in the New State Ice uh, case, uh, which is that federalism itself is, is a framework, and it is a structure, and it is therefore sort of neutral as to whether we're achieving good or bad ends. A lot of people would say that federalism in the United States for years was uh, detrimental in the sense that it was holding back the whole civil rights movement uh, in this country, and there's no question that that was true. 
Uh, and what it does is it, pre it presents and, and provides for competing sources of authority, competing sources of power, uh, and power can be used for good or for ill. And, and the same is true uh, in consumer protection, and the same is true in, in every other area of law. The other point that I would trying to make is federalism is itself a concept that has very complicated and diverse applications in different areas of law and different areas of practical experience uh, and can look very different from, from one place to another depending on, uh, again, situations on the ground, what the legal framework is. It can differ from one area to another. As I said, it's quite favorable to uh, protecting rights uh, in uh, state constitutional law. It's quite favorable to protecting rights now under the Dodd-Frank Act in consumer financial protection. Uh, may not be so true of consumer protection generally in the more tangible realms and certainly is not necessarily true in other areas of the law such as, as you mentioned. Uh, so um, uh, again, where Congress is willing to speak up and speak clearly and say that s states should be able to go beyond and be more protective, Congress has the ability to do so. It has rarely uh, done so. I'm going to make you talk about Section 1044. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as you noted in, in Dodd-Frank, we, we made a m number of moves to try and open up space for um, states to act when the federal government was um, misbehaving in some way or, or not acting. Um, uh, one of those ways was by changing the rules or what we thought was changing the rules for preemption with respect to national banks. For the reasons that others um, have said today that you can create, if the federal government steps in with strong preemption, you can create in a state a real race to the bottom in, um, in legal rules and then in practices. Uh, Mike uh, Calhoun was talking earlier about the race to the bottom in North Carolina. We certainly saw there and, and in other states that tried to act aggressively in this space. Um, the provision... Um, among other things, required the OCC to take a fresh look at all of its old preemption decisions and to figure out whether they were, in fact, justified under this new legal standard. Uh, the OCC stepped in uh, before your appointment um, and before, really, the creation of the CFPB uh, itself uh, to avoid a, um, a provision that required them to consult with the CFPB. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and blanketly reissued all their old preemption orders. Um, so I'm wondering if you could comment on that and on the effect that may or may not have had in your view of how um, uh, the states can act in this field. Yeah, the, the first thing I will say is when the CFPB was parachuted into the existing system of federal regulators, uh, there, you know, there was one, the OTS, mentioned infamously uh, by the panel earlier, that was extinguished, but otherwise you're still in a complicated world of multiple regulators. And for the most part, I think the other regulators' natural reaction wasn't a universal reaction, but a natural reaction was to be very resentful uh, and hostile to the CFPB, among other things because the mere creation of a CFPB was not so implicit, pretty explicit rebuke of those agencies for not having sufficiently attended to these uh, issues. And there was some, some rear guard action and some efforts made to resist us uh, under leadership at the time uh, at the OCC. Uh, that was one of them, but it was not the only one. Uh, and s soon thereafter, uh, happy occasion was change of leadership at the OCC uh, Tom Curry became the new comptroller, and Tom had a background of being a state banking regulator himself and different views on these issues. And over time, uh, the cooperation increased uh, uh, enormously between uh, the two agencies. Uh, and other situations were not as fraught and worked themselves out over time as well. Uh, in terms of where we stand right now, in terms of National Bank Act preemption of the states, uh, my guess is as good as yours, maybe not as good as yours. Uh, it seems very cloudy to me uh, what the OCC uh, has said 
uh, may or may not entirely square with the new provisions of the Dodd-Frank Act, and I, I don't, I'm not aware that they've been tested in court at this point, and whether they will be or won't be, uh, I, I couldn't say. Um, what, what I would uh, add is that I don't believe any of the National Bank Act preemption provisions in 1044 have yet been tested in court. And, you know, it's possible we'll have some preemption battles shaping up because, as I say, th there's a push and pull here with the federal government seeming to be retreating in this area and the state governments having the opportunity to move in and, and they are doing so. And, by the way, some of it is not moving in. They've always been there. Uh, but they're now uh, sort of reinvigorated, I would say. Uh, there will be potentially preemption battles that will be coming up, uh, and some of them are looming right now, and we will see what happens with those. But it matters enormously that Congress, at the juncture where it could actually legislate in this area, and right now we're seeing little or no legislation in this area, pretty much in the years since Dodd-Frank, uh, laid out these default rules, and they would have to be undone by statute, uh, and I don't anticipate that happening any time in the foreseeable future. So. so I don't know that I had much of an answer to your question, but it's the best I can do. Director Cordray, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. It reminded me of being back in law school, actually. Um, Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yes. Um, I, if I may shift you back to technology, which you mentioned at the beginning of your discussion. Uh, the exploitation of big data using artificial intelligence uh, by financial firms uh, potentially poses several risks to consumers and their participation in the financial markets. Uh, do you have some thoughts about that? And if you were still at the agency, what would you be telling staff to look into? Yeah, and this is this is not just in the computer age, although it's especially in the computer age. I mean, it's certainly the uh, the nature of information about consumers, about individual consumers, each one of us has been progressing. Uh, rapidly for many decades, even before the computer age. I mean, you went from local credit reporting bureaus to a nationalization of that market uh, w pretty much completely unsupervised, un unattended by anyone. It just kind of grew up on its own uh, in the, in the private, within the private sector, uh, and it gave rise to a number of problems. This was all before... Uh, big data and artificial intelligence. Uh, and when the CFPB first came into its authority to supervise the credit reporting companies who have the th three biggest ones have about 200 million files on Americans uh, of greater or lesser completeness and accuracy for that point, it was, it was quite a remarkable um, experience because they had virtually no systems in place to manage their own compliance with the law. And that became evident very quickly to them and to us. Uh, and it's been a big, big job to try to sort of um, push them into some sort of uh, sensible shape in terms of being able to uh, manage their own operations in a way that uh, can take account of uh, and account for themselves, for their interests, the interests of consumers. Uh, in terms of uh, big data and, and artificial intelligence and all of the information about us, you know, it's, it is, it is simpli simplistic to say, but it's a plus and a minus. Um, it's giving us access to credit that we would not have had if companies could not really understand much about us. Uh, it is also uh, potentially cutting off access to credit and in uh, situations where it would not seem to be justified. It is amassing information that can be used or misused for various other purposes that we may or may not uh, know or, or understand or intend. Uh, it, is a, um, it is a very prominent, conspicuous example of uh, the opportunity but also the dangers of this modern economy and maybe one of the most conspicuous examples. I don't, I don't have much more to say beyond that, I don't think, at, at this point. 
Um, <clears throat> hi, Mr. Cordray. First of all, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate your time. Um, my name is Avril Prakash. I'm a, a dual MBA MPP student, and I appreciate your focus um, on the federalism lens. But I was hoping to um, kind of expand and for you to talk maybe about some uh, best practices that we could learn from other settings, from other international um, firms and uh, situations uh, that could probably add to the process. I'm in Professor Adrian Harris's class on fintech, and today we're talking about how the U.S system, or at least our laws are quite um, negative, you know, they try to restrict and create like um, uh, boundaries versus in the Europe you see more uh, positive um, uh, legal framework. So I was hoping you could talk about some best practices in other uh, regions that maybe we could glean here that could um, enhance hopefully the situation. It's, it's a really good question and it's something that we puzzled over quite a lot at the Consumer Bureau and I'm sure they still do. Uh, the nature of compliance with the law is that it is a sort of negative enterprise. Uh, it is, there's a threshold below which you cannot sink. If you do sink below that threshold, you are in violation of the law. You're subject to sanctions, you're subject to penalties, you're subject to actions. Uh, and so everybody uh, should be, not everybody is conscientious and people think they can get away with things, but but people generally try to make an effort to raise themselves at least above the very low threshold of compliance with the law. Now, there's much that we'd like to see out of companies and much that consumers would like uh, that would go well above that standard. I mean, nothing in the law says you have to have excellent or even decent customer service, but consumers want that. This is the way in which the marketplace itself competes companies against one another to raise their game well above just the mandatory minimum uh, legal threshold. And one of the, one of the puzzles that we worked, worked on and uh, with, you know, incomplete results is what can an agency, a federal agency, do to try to encourage companies to get well above the bare minimum? I mean, w at, at, a, at, a, at a first step, uh, you know, you're trying to encourage them to get out of the gray area right around the threshold of, of bare legal compliance because they could could fall below the line. So, you, so any sensible company will try to push itself a ways above the very the very bottom baseline. Uh, but beyond that, uh, it is and and this is where we puzzled over the one of the objectives in the Dodd Frank Act for us. One of the purposes was that we were supposed to foster work to foster innovation in financial services. How do you do that as a government agency? Isn't that something that's done in the private sector? Companies compete against each other and if they have built a better mousetrap, they collect you know, many or most of the consumers in their market and gain market share. Uh, what on earth do we have to do with any of that other than trying to stay out of the way? Uh, and that was one of the things that we thought a lot about and we worked with a lot of the FinTech providers to one of the things we recognized over time was that there's an overhang of lack of clarity about the law that can discourage and, and cause people to be very cautious about trying new things, even things that might be very pro-consumer if they aren't sure that those things will be looked upon uh, uh, as potentially violating the law. And where we could try to provide that clarity, we did try to inevitably any issue like that is a very hard issue often a very complicated issue and you want to be cautious about working it through as a regulator because you don't want to suddenly bless something and then find that you missed uh, something significant about it and you're blessing something that's actually harming consumers. But it, then again, uh, there's a tendency to um, not want to give any guidance at all, which is not very helpful to people either. So this is something we struggled with. Uh, and. I'm, I'm, we were very interested and remain interested to see what's happening overseas on this. The UK uh, has the financial sandbox. We were actually ahead of them in doing some work on this, but uh, uh, they, they have uh, gone into this in a big way. There's no question in my mind that in London they see this as an effort toward economic development. They're trying to bring more fintech to England, so they're trying to lure them. This is one of the dangers of a competitive policy of this type is you can lure people by, um, by lowering your standards uh, or you can lure people by providing them with, with better service yourself. And there's some of both going on, I think, around the world. 
Uh, and I'm concerned about what the CFPB is proposing because it's not clear to me that uh, it will be sufficiently uh, appreciative of the risks to consumers uh, in, in this segment. But it's, it's, a, it's a difficult chicken egg problem of uh, how much emphasis do you put on either side of that equation? And w w again, as a factual matter, are you getting it right or getting it wrong? Um, And I don't have answers to the financial sandbox other than to say that I'm, I'm a little concerned about a blunderbuss approach that simply says companies can do whatever they want uh, because they have the label fintech. Uh, that's, that's very evidently, in my mind, not the right answer. Uh, and, and I think we don't know exactly what risks that will, that will create, but they'll be significant. And I also don't, I, I have my doubts as to whether that will be uh, a legally permissible result uh, if that's the result that people are seeking to reach. Um, I've noticed that uh, Bayer Corporation is having a big problem with their weed killer and the uh, lawsuits that are going to um, result from that. And you get these huge settlements of you know, $79 million in and more for just one incidence of cancer. How do you guys see yourselves as far as impact is concerned vis-a-vis -vis the, le the legal system that offers remedy for you know, being preyed upon or causing bad things to happen? Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a good question. It gets into a, a difficult area, which is uh, some statutes have private rights of action and, and private liability that can be imposed in lawsuits by citizens directly. Some do not. Uh, if, if you're an enforcer enforcing the law in an area, should you take account of private enforcement? Should that somehow affect what you do? I don't think it should. I, I saw ourselves as neither um, backing away from seeking a remedy or relief in light of uh, potential pending private actions, nor did I see us as necessarily facilitating private actions, although there's no question if the Bureau resolved an issue and found a violation of law, that could provide uh, a basis for follow-on uh, private lawsuits. And then so the question is what's the total enforcement in the system, not just the enforcement by the CFPB, not even just the enforcement by the federal regulators, not even just the enforcement by the federal regulators in the states together, uh, but, but including private liability, where do you all come out? You know, one of the interesting aspects of that has been the whole Wells Fargo mess. We started with an enforcement action in which uh, we, we faced a difficult problem because there was not a great deal of individual consumer financial harm to consumers, but there was outrageous conduct by the bank. So we ended up imposing a very high penalty relative to the compensatory damages in that case, uh, you know, one that arguably would be constitutionally suspect if you applied the punitive damage uh, constitutional law to, to this. But in the end, the follow-up liability for Wells Fargo out of that whole mess has been so enormous. Um, I, I don't even know what, what levels it's reached at this point. And, of course, there's been other conduct that violated the law that some of it was no doubt turfed. Some of it was turfed up by investigations we had ongoing at the time. Some of it likely has been turfed up by the remarkable amount of attention paid to Wells Fargo in the wake of that uh, enforcement action. Uh, and, and where it all uh, will end is, is hard to say. Um, but. It's, it's a good question, it's, it's a hard question, but I think that what we simply tried to do was take each matter before us on its merits and address it in light of the facts and the law that we had and didn't otherwise trouble ourselves too much with what else was going on in the universe. Now, we did try to work together with others so that we could try to um, create a coherent package of of uh, enforcement. For example, we work constantly with the states and, and with multi-states, and we would strategize together, even if we weren't acting together in the litigation, try to strategize together about uh, what we were doing and why. 
uh, and I think that that can be helpful. But there's no doubt a fair amount of uncoordination in our system if you look at total law enforcement as a whole, including private uh, actions, which the government, of course, can't control other than by Congress deciding whether to allow them or not allow them and, and the, the stipulations for how those lawsuits can proceed. Just thank you. Um, just to shift gears for a little bit, and this is really relevant more to consumer protection with regard to investments and retirement than uh, lending and other. Pro sure, um, <clears throat> a question that really focuses on the investment side of consumer protection and savings side rather than uh, lending and predatory practices. One of the potentially hopeful signs in the financial markets over the past few years has been, um, some would say, the Vanguard effect. That the message that um, the most important thing is to keep fees low and, and understand that very few people can beat the market and very few people can pick the people who can beat the market. Um, that message has gone out to an ever-increasing number of savers and hence a race to the bottom in terms of fees. What could be done from a regulatory point of view to um, strip the mystique from the swollen parts of the investment business, which may be much of it, so that, um, I mean, for example, if the fiduciary duty rule were revived, or as you envisioned it being originally implemented, would it be dangerous for a financial advisor to recommend any mutual fund other than an index fund? Might it be dangerous for a retirement plan to ever have a fund that had more than a 0.05% annual fee? How could this, um, what, what I think is this, this hopeful use of the market and of knowledge, um, be harnessed uh, through regulation or at least be, be encouraged so that that part of the financial market shrinks? Well, that was kind of the subject for the last panel, uh, not so much for me, but, um, but let me say uh, uh, a couple of um, uh, things. First of all, you used the, word, the phrase race to the bottom in a somewhat unusual way because you were talking about what you consider to be a good outcome, right, of lower fees. Usually we say race to the bottom is, is you know, toward uh, conduct that violates the law and, and exploits uh, consumers. Uh, it's almost a race to the top you're getting right now in terms of uh, low fees and, and reasonable service. In terms of um, uh, whether this could uh, disincentivize uh, uh, investment uh, advisors uh, to charge fees, it certainly could. Um, you know, I don't really have, have something insightful to say to you there. Uh, any kind of regulation can have intended and unintended consequences. We don't always know what the unintended consequences, uh, by definition, we don't know. Uh, and then we have to be ready to understand, comprehend, and make adjustments accordingly. That was something that we very much was part of our view of our mission at the Bureau as we were um, dealing with pretty complex mortgage regulations. We very much didn't want to upset the market in some unexpected way, uh, and those markets are complicated, so we monitored that very religiously, month in, month out, and we often, several times, we ended up adjusting those rules, even though it ate up bandwidth that we could have gone on and done other things and gotten some of the other rulemakings done uh, earlier, but we thought that was important to do. Um, uh, I guess I'm just going to leave it. I, I'm not an expert on the uh, investor uh, market, uh, but uh, I, I, was a, I was a fan of the uh, fiduciary rule, and it's uh, sorry to see it uh, set aside at this point. But you know, there'll be the, these things will come and go. There will be further legislation on these issues. It was mentioned earlier the arbitration rule that we adopted, uh, that was overturned by Congress. Uh, there will come a time when the Congress will legislate on that issue, and they'll legislate a lot more broadly than just consumer financial protection would be my uh, guess on that. Thank you. Thank you again for coming and for the whole presentation. Um, my question is, based on your experience as a regulator, with a regime that accorded lots of discretion, assuming the will, to enact a regulation for consumer protection, over the comparative efficacy of broader standards 
and content specific rules which works when you know do you want to say ability to repay or do you want to say 25% of your after income etc cetera, etc cetera? what's your experience with that yeah that's one of the uh, perpetual issues in regulation uh, I remember when I f uh, first met with the new comptroller Tom Curry uh, he gave me a certificate that I kept in my office which was the very first set of standards that the original first comptroller of the currency during the Civil War had laid down for uh, national banks. And it was, it was on one, rather large, but one sheet of paper, essentially, and it was very general rules. You should do this, you should consider that, uh, very much along the lines of, I think Mike Cahoon said earlier today, you should not charge unreasonable fees, that kind of generality. Uh, and then, of course, the downside of that kind of regulation is that it leaves it to someone else to fill in a lot of details. Uh, it could be an examiner. It could be a court, if there's a court case over it. Uh, it could be people at the bank making their own judgments, which might control the bank's behavior for an awful long time without any attention from the regulators. Uh, we found that uh, and maybe it was due to the fact that we were considered an aggressive regulator. People wanted very, very specific rules from us. They wanted specificity on lots of detailed issues because they wanted to be able to know exactly uh, what they were going to do. And for large financial companies that automate compliance, the more exactitude they can have, they can just automate all of that, and then they can feel sure that they don't have a problem. They don't really want a discretion being exercised. It was said earlier, I thought it was ironic, they might like to have discretion exercised by someone favorable to them, but if they aren't entirely sure that you're favorable to them, they don't really want the discretion. And in the end, you have these long, dense, prolix, uh, very specific consumer financial regulations. Uh, I remember uh, Senator Angus King at one point in one of my uh, interviews when I was trying to get confirmed, he had his aide come in and dump on the table several of the big consumer finance regulations. It was a pile so high you could hardly see over the top of it. He was making his point. On the other hand, industry often wants that and asks for that and is happy to have it. Now, big companies can automate their compliance. Small companies have a hard time wading through all this, so it creates something of a differential impact within the industry itself. Uh, but, but I would say that uh, where we were sure of ourselves, we were happy to provide specificity. Often you're not entirely sure of yourself, and so uh, you, you don't want to set that foot. Uh, as, as is said sometimes, if umpires often in error, never in doubt, uh, you don't want to be that type of regulator either. So, uh, it, but it is, it is a very fact-specific issue and, and, and something that you can't generalize about. Uh, but um, uh, I'll, I'll give one more analogy, which is in debt collection. Debt collection is a very unusual marketplace because at the federal level, there was a statute passed in 1977 that uh, provides the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, and it never provided any authority for anybody to write any regulations underneath it uh, until Dodd-Frank, which the Bureau now has that authority, and they're working on rules uh, on this subject. What that's meant is for 40 years, what was said in that statute, which is at some level of generality, has been interpreted by courts in private litigations again and again and again. And the only guidance companies have as to what they should do on a lot of these very tricky particular issues is whatever courts have told them. And the trouble is a lot of courts have said very different things on the same issues. And so they really have no good guidance at all other than making a judgment, uh, which is not made in uniform fashion uh, within the industry. So uh, they actually have been kind of begging the Bureau for several years now to formulate and adopt rules so they can have more of that certainty, let alone uh, have, a, have a clear rule on a subject rather than murky, conflicting uh, rules. So there is a place for regulation, uh, and industry knows that. Uh, and once they get used to it and, and the rules are sensible enough, uh, that tends to be a good marketplace. And I think the mortgage and credit card markets have become good marketplaces in the last 10 years, and they were not before, no, no question about it. Uh, reasonably good marketplaces till we find the next problem that leads to a meltdown, which 
I don't know what it is right now, but if we did, we'd be heading it off. Thank you. Okay. All right, everybody, thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, I'm Adrian Harris. I'm a Housley policymaker in residence here at the University of Michigan uh, and former special assistant to President Obama at the National Economic Council. I'll, I'm going to moderate our distinguished panel here today. Oh. Um, and I know each each presenter has um, a bit of a presentation and then we'll move into discussion. But why don't we go down the line quickly and do introductions and then move through uh, each of the presentations. Sure. Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Melissa Coity. I run FinReg Lab, which you'll hear about in just a moment. I'm Lisa Servan. I'm a professor and chair of the City and Regional Planning Department at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Willie Elliott, and I'm at the University of Michigan. I'm a professor here. Thank you. Okay. We're going to mix it up. I'm going to stand up. Wake everybody up. <laughs> Hold on, though. Let me get myself organized. So I'm sad Nick Smith is not here because I'm going to also claim Michael Barr gave me my first job too. <laughs> kind of, sort of. You don't count the yogurt shop and the hospital x-ray department in college. Anyway, now you get to guess how old is Michael in light of the fact that Nick Smith, you gave him his first job and you've given me my first job. Um, like you heard, I'm Melissa Coity. I'm probably the only startup in the room. Um, but we are a, somewhat of a different type of startup. We are a nonprofit research organization. And I mentioned Michael Barr because I worked for the US Treasury Department twice. 
Uh, I was a staffer in Michael's office in the Clinton administration, and more recently I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Consumer Policy in the Obama administration. And a lot of what you're going to hear me talk about really harkens back to what we wanted to understand, but we were insufficiently able to understand when it comes to, and I use this with intention, when it comes to the role of data and technology in the financial system, and in particular in the retail financial services sector. And I use the words data and technology as opposed to fintech, because fintech is a very nebulous term, and it also raises lots of other questions, bank versus non-bank. And I think really, in part, what we all desperately need is more fact-based insights about very foundational issues when it comes to data use in financial services and also new technologies being deployed in the financial system and in financial services. And so that is what has led me to stand up uh, FinReg Lab, which is this, as I said, nonprofit organization. So let me use my so slides to be my guide, and let me figure out how to use this and put glasses on. I feel like I'm putting on my helmet here. So our purpose at FinReg Lab, and we're about a year and a half old now, is really to think about and assess what are the potential ways that data and technology can be harnessed for good, and in particular, how data and technology can be utilized to expand financial access and inclusion. We've been very focused in the U.S., but we are thinking about these issues in a global context. How can we help to generate fact-based insights that will ultimately inform public policy? Because again, given the four and a half years I was most recently at Treasury, and even to some extent in the prior uh, period, without having a deep sort of empirical assessment and understanding about what the trade-offs are, both what the benefits may be, but also what the potential risks and major considerations are, it's really hard I'm just being very candid, it's really hard for regulators to have a level of confidence and frankly at some level even to take on a level of responsibility to then think about how do we evolve our guidances, our regulations, and even our laws. We really need to understand as policymakers implications better as we do think about the need to evolve public policy. And hopefully with the insights that we are generating directly at FinReg Lab, but also that we are trying to uh, foster and bring in from other researchers and academic institutions to policymakers, especially at the federal level. This will ultimately help to inform not only public policy, but also the broader financial marketplace. Because frankly, the marketplace too is looking for some sense of what may be the rules of the road, where are the risky areas, and how does it take advantage of the technology and data to extend products and services and advice and new channels to consumers and small businesses and communities? So what's the state that we are in right now? Um, you heard a little bit of this earlier, and it really is a really uh, set of critical anchor points that we have to think about. Uh, this is somewhat of an outdated method of assessing access to financial products and services won't go into it in too much detail, but it still gives us, it calibrates our understanding of who really is struggling and who is not connected to safe and secure financial products and services. Uh, we have 33.5 million households who are, by FDIC definition, defined as un- and underbanked. Uh, you heard some of these statistics earlier. We have a lot of people in this country who are living in poverty. It's, it's, it's just almost hard to believe. 40 million household uh, Americans are living in a state of poverty. 60% of Americans who struggle with an annual financial emergency covering those expenses. And 34% of Americans who experience annual income volatility, which frankly, all of us in the room get that and know that and have those experiences ourselves. So it's, that's actually a relatively low percentage. Um, and then we think about globally those who are disconnected from safe products and services. 1.7 billion people are underserved annually, or, or I'm sorry, are not connected to a formal financial system uh, across the globe. 
Now, a lot of this is, and, and frankly, four of the five of these statistics, or at least three of the five, are based on things that fall outside the financial system, right? These are matters of income. These are matters of wealth. These are matters of inequality of income and wealth. And those things have to be thought about in many different ways by societies and by policymakers. But a lot of these uh, data points are really important, and they do come back to how important being tied to good financial products and services are. And that's where I think many of us both realize this tidal wave of technology and the potential of data and what it may mean for helping to drive lower cost access, lower cost, lower costs associated with actually building, providing products to especially low and moderate income consumers uh, may offer a real potential benefit. It may help to improve and open up channels, mobile devices, online access, uh, lower cost, personalized, timely financial information that really is about what that individual or what that household really personally needs, both in their immediate financial needs, but also in their mid and longer term financial goals and aspirations for themselves and their families. And I think that's why a lot of us get quite excited about trying to understand what does tech and data mean in the financial system and how are we thinking about evolving policy so that it really is financial services that are supporting financial independence and dignity and not taking that away. But we also know the risk. The big risk that many of us are very afraid of are the realities that this technology and this data may actually exacerbate, especially in this country, the generations of racial and income and economic inequality that exist. And really pressing for all of us is to understand how does that technology work? What do those data do when they're used in the financial system? And how do we make sure that we don't exacerbate redlining instances that have happened for generations? So lots of pressing questions, and, and to be clear, we at Fenreg Lab are not going to answer all of these. <laughs> uh, but, but just to put them out there, because I don't think we've quite talked about them in a tangible way yet, but what are some of these issues and what are some of these opportunities? Clearly, anxiety and concern about redlining and discrimination being perpetuated with data and technology is top of all of our lists. Uh, not understanding how these new algorithms, these machine learning algorithms actually spit out outputs that, you know, some may want to then rely upon as factors for or actual ultimately what decides a credit decision is a for instance is another concern that a lot of us, ha a lot of us have. Um, but then there are also positives and potentials and I alluded to this a minute ago. Consumer financial data is there a way that we consumers could be accessing our financial information and taking advantage of a technology tool that is really helping us individualize what our goals are and what our needs are? And of course, this raises important questions around then, well, what are the business models underneath those personal financial management tools? And are, as we've talked about a lot today, are the incentives aligned or not aligned? with that individual's needs and aspirations. Uh, one of the questions, and this is the one that we have taken on at FinReg Lab right now, is this really important question of could we bring in data into credit underwriting methods, traditional credit underwriting methods, uh, and would new data actually help a lender better credit risk assess a consumer or a small business? Um, would the inclusion of new data potentially help a lender do this in a way that is accurate, more accurate than what they would see with a traditional FICO score or based on traditional credit history data? And would it enable both the lender to be doing something that is a more prudent decision? And frankly, importantly, is it also more prudent for the consumer then in terms of what the credit is that they might get? And so I'll talk about that in just a few more minutes and lots of other topics, right? Um, new techniques around privacy, sort of allowing conditioning about who you share your data with. Are there ways that that could be used to get after 
some of the needs that we have around knowing who is in our financial system, our know your customer types of requirements, uh, and the list goes on. I mean, we could all sit and come up with many, many more. So we step back and try to think about where does this potential for big change really sit? Um, these are the sort of master categories that we have identified and where we want to be spending more of our time. Right now we are digging deep into these issues around data and underwriting. But there are clearly other applications too. Um, and I just talked about a few of them, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this page. But really, lots of potential uses for data and technology uh, from solving, is somebody who they say they are under know your customer obligations? Are there more efficient ways of knowing who are the bad guys in our financial system and rooting them out? Uh, how is technology helping to lower the cost of products that have been delivered through a mobile device? And is the information that's generated through that mobile device potentially a way of helping that consumer better manage their finances? And the list goes on and on. But in order for those big opportunities to really be sorted and for guide rails to be written, we have to come back to the policies and the laws that we have in place right now. And I've just listed a few, but many of these are laws that we are quite focused on in this work that we're doing looking at underwriting. But I think what's important to realize here, all of these laws, many of them date back to the 1970s, in fact, 1970 when I was born. Um, <laughs> even more recently, Graham Leach Bliley, which Michael and I worked on, 1999 when that was passed, uh, none of these have been written in the past 10 years and none of them contemplated the world that we're living in right now with the ubiquitous amount of data used or not used for lots of decisions in our lives. Um, and so how then are these laws and regulations going to be updated? So that's where we like to think we can offer a little bit of help. What do we do? Um, first and foremost, we talk to policymakers and we talk to regulators and we really try to hone in on what are the top of mind issues where we as an independent organization can go out and build a timely research project or even ideally an experiment where we can assess some of these very topical and timely matters uh, that regulators are seeking information on. We then collaborate with others. We, um, we leverage external partners, academic institutions, also even financial modeling shops that do the analysis um, as vendors to FinReg Lab, and also leveraging other partnerships with even consultancies where we have deep breath of legal experts, lawyers and others who are coming on board and helping as we are probing both the experiment side of the research that we build, but also the policy and the legal analysis work that we're doing. And then we share the facts and the insights. And let me hop to the next one because um, this reflects it a little more. Uh, part of the ambition and part of what we've been doing alongside of actually building an experiment, uh, you've heard this and you've picked this up from the room, policy does not happen in a vacuum and there are a lot of different stakeholders who ultimately have to be engaged in the consideration and in the process. And in light of that, we run policy working groups based on the particular area of research that we are undertaking we then build 30 to 60 people working groups, actually those are three different working groups, but to deep dive assess what do the current laws say about that particular technology or data use. What would be potential ways that the laws or the policies or the regulations could be evolved, mindful of all the considerations, the trade-offs, the risk to consumers, the benefits to the industry. And in the end, we produce reports that reflect the input that came through those working group processes along with the experiment insights. And now I'll talk very concretely about our examination of cash flow data in underwriting. So here in the US, we know that there are about 45 million individuals who lack a sufficient credit history 
to score them under traditional underwriting means. This is credit histories that generate the FICO score. We also have 23 million sole proprietors in the U.S. who seek credit, who are oftentimes paying high costs for access to credit as a sole proprietor. And so one of the theories going, and one of the areas of strong interest among regulators is this question of, are there other types of data that feel frankly safe because they are financial in nature, but that actually could help lenders prudently credit risk assess these 45 million individuals and 23 million sole proprietors. And that, that interest has ultimately landed on this focus of looking at cash flow data. And that means looking at what is the information in an individual or in a small business's bank account. What are those transaction activities? Importantly, it could mean a lot of other things too. There is a lot of information. Any of us who pulled up our bank accounts know you can see who are the merchants, where's the money going, uh, what are the dates that it was sent. Sometimes it's timestamps. So there's a lot of non-financial data in that bank account picture, but what, what regulators and we and others in the broader financial stakeholder sector want to know is, does the information, that very timely information about what's coming in and flowing out of a bank account, that transaction data information, is that potentially a way to better assess these individuals and these businesses for access to credit? And so what we've done is we have sought to build an experiment over the past year that actually seeks to answer that question. We've been able to get loan level data from one, two, three, four, five lenders. Um, we have an additional lender who's sharing more aggregated information with us. But these are small dollar lenders. These are not, um, they are credit card provider, um, an installment loan, and also a provider of an overdraft alternative product, but they are all using cash flow information in order to credit risk assess and extend their credit, uh, some would say certain types of non-credit products to consumers and small businesses. And with that information, we are setting out to answer three questions. One, first and foremost, does that data and now the, allow the lender to extend credit to those borrowers? And we have performance data, and so we can then assess how effective, how accurate was the uh, prediction according to the cash flow data. And we're comparing that then to similarly situated consumers who are not assessed with cash flow. The second question is, does that, uh, do the borrowers actually perform better with uh, the cash flow underwriting. And then the third really important question from a policy standpoint is, do we see differences between protected and non-protected classes? Do we see indications of disparate impact risk? I don't want to get out ahead of my skis. I will use this to, frankly, whet your appetite to come to the FinReg Lab website where we will actually be releasing the findings from this research in May. Um, but it really, it's come and learn what we learn, I would say. And so then a part of this process, in addition to the experiment, is doing this deep dive around these policy issues. And what we did is we convened 60 people around the table last June and said, and these are the <coughs> policymakers, the regulators who are sitting at the table with us, the large banks, the fintech lenders, the non-bank lenders is what we used to refer to them as. What are those specific policy and legal issues that we need to deep dive, think about, assess, and consider what may be the um, options in terms of evolving those laws and those policies? And not surprising, the credit information ecosystem we're now talking about a very different flow of a very different type of data for underwriting. We're talking about cash flow data from a bank account flowing to what we call an end user, which are these lenders, but flowing through these intermediaries, which are known as data aggregators. This is not something, some would argue, that was contemplated under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So these are the ecosystem questions that we are digging deep into. 
fair and inclusive access to credit. This digs deep into the issues around fair lending. And really, it's been, it was a very engaged and engaging conversation with banks, uh, with academics, as we were thinking about how is fairness defined, defined? What are the expectations? If you do see differences between protected class and non-protected class. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the topics that we spent a fair bit of time talking about is what if we see results where Hispanic females had been assessed at, say, 50% under FICO, but yet with the cash flow data, we're now seeing more Hispa or, uh, Hispanic females being assessed at a greater rate, up to 70%. But in comparison to white men, we're at 70% Hispanic female, but 100% on white men. What do we think about that? That's a societal policy important question that we all really need to push ourselves and consider. And so those were the type of topics that we were digging into with the Fair and Inclusive group. And then the third working group was rarely focused on important <coughs> issues around, and we heard a bit of this too, informed consent and disclosures, and how in the world does that happen when we're talking about a non-credit reporting agency system and consumers are having data pulled from their bank account, moving through a third party to an end user, and of course issues around who's then got responsibility when that data is flowing. Um, more on that one too. So. I am happy to share this deck. It's got some of the pointed questions that we're digging into in each of these working groups. Um, but I think the real sort of note for you all is we will be releasing this report in May. We're looking for feedback. We're looking for a conversation that this generates. But we really do hope that the research findings combined with the deep dive evaluation of these policy issues is going to help to further the conversation as we think about how we're making sure is the policy uh, or is the state of technology and data in financial services evolves that we are really thoughtfully considering how we're um, uh, balancing uh, the trade-offs. All right, and then here is the team. I want to point out because many of you know some of the people uh, in this team. But it is quite exciting. We have Kelly Cochran, who has joined us as our deputy uh, about a month ago, and Wayne Full, who comes with a background from DARPA and Lincoln Labs, and Steven Stoltzenberg, who was actually working for FS Card, which is a, um, a uh, credit card product that was specifically aimed at low and moderate income households. Um, so it's a great team and a great board and I look forward to hearing your questions. That's it. We'll go through each of the presentations and then come back for Q&A. Okay. Thank you. Sure. This is a loose seat. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Lisa Servan, I teach at the University of Pennsylvania and I've been doing work on consumer financial services for about seven years. Um, and when I thought about coming today, I really was thinking about uh, the title of the conference, which is Consumer Protection in the Age of Uncertainty. And I think a lot of the panelists today and the speakers have really been talking about the protection piece of consumer protection, the laws, the regulations, the ways in which we protect consumers. Um, and so I really want to focus on the consumer piece put a little bit of a personal face on some of the people that we're talking about, and also the uncertainty piece. Um, and I, when I was thinking about this, I really thought, well, you know, there are really two kinds of uncertainty that are important in the conversations that we're having. One is this uncertainty in the political environment that's really changed the context in which consumers are being protected and the way that we're thinking about consumer protection. 
And the second, which is the one that I want to spend a little bit more time talking about, is financial uncertainty. Um, so in terms of financial uncertainty, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how it's become increasingly widespread so that we have more and more families who are feeling as though they're living in financially precarious situations. Um, and that is changing. So we know from research that 40% of Americans could not come up with $400 in the event of an emergency. That doesn't mean, that means that it's not just that they have, they don't have $400 in their bank accounts, but there's no one even that they could ask for. They don't have a credit card that they could charge $400 on. So imagine the kinds of things that happen to us on a regular basis. An appliance breaks down. Classic example, a car breaks down. There's a medical emergency. 75% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. So when we think about, as Melissa was just talking about, some of these laws not having changed since the 1970s, the world in which people are working and earning an income and trying to make ends meet has really changed a lot. But the financial situation, the financial tools that they have to manage that, and the policy situation haven't really changed to accommodate those, this change. There are really three key trends that are driving this widespread financial uncertainty. The first is declining wages. So since the 1970s, wages have been going down for people. The second is increased income volatility. And income volatility is defined as a shift of more than 25% in someone's income over the, from one year to the next. Right, so because of that, people are much less able than they used to be to be able to figure out how much money is coming into the household from week to week or month to month. Um, a lot of this is because there's less attachment between employers and employees, because people have shifted from full-time to part-time jobs, and that many of these jobs are scheduled in a kind of on-demand way, so that people don't even know from one week to the next if they're working at a, an hourly job, whether they'll be scheduled for 10 hours a week or 40 hours a week. Um, income volatility has doubled over the last 30 years. That's created a huge change. And the third change is the retraction of the public and private safety nets. So we know that the social welfare situation, uh, the social welfare safety net is much more frayed than it used to be. And um, even if you do have a good, stable job, it's very likely that your costs of health insurance have gone up, that your retirement um, plan is much less secure, it's much more defined than what you can by what you contribute than what you'll get back from that employer. So all of these things have combined to create a situation in which people have a very hard time spending, planning, saving, figuring out how they're going to manage their financial lives. Um, I wanted to really understand how those situations were affecting consumers um, on the ground. And I really also wanted to know, along with those three trends and this increasing financial instability, um, I saw the data that showed that many more people were using alternative financial services like check cashers, payday lenders, pawnbrokers, et cetera. And in order to understand that um, in a different way, I got a job as a teller. I worked for four months at a check casher in the South Bronx in New York in one of the poorest zip codes in the country. And I also worked as a payday lender and um, loan collector in Oakland, California. Um, I also staffed a hotline run by the Predatory Loan Help, it's called the Predatory Loan Help Hotline run by the Virginia Poverty Law Center to talk with people about how they were having difficulty paying back those payday loans um, and loans that were made to them even that were illegal. And one of the things coming out of that research that was most surprising to me, and this was particularly true for the people who had taken out small dollar credit, was how many of those people had the attributes of middle class Americans. So um, I think when we think of the group that we are protecting from the practices, whether they're mainstream or alternative financial institutions, we often think of low and moderate income people, we think of people of color in historically disadvantaged neighborhoods, and that's true. But the surprising thing to me was how many of these people were people who owned their homes, had college educations, and were making more than fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year. That group, those three attributes I just described, 
is the fastest growing group of payday loan users. Um, and that's because of this increase in financial instability and the lack of good options for people who find themselves in those emergencies that are becoming increasingly and increasingly common. I want to tell you um, just two stories uh, from the people, the hundreds of people that I've interviewed. Um, what I did was I, I worked behind the counters at both of these stores. I took the calls on the hotline for a month. And then I came out from behind the counter and interviewed hundreds of people who were the customers of these businesses, both the two that I worked with and others around the country. And I'll just talk about two of these themes that relate back to those trends that I talked about. One is low, wage, low wages and unpredictable income, and the other has to do with medical expenses, which is a huge driver of bankruptcy and of small dollar credit usage. Um, so for the stories that I'm going to tell you about today, two of them, we actually interviewed people um, at three points in time. We first got a huge data set from a subprime credit bureau called Clarity Services, which um, had uh, contracts with a lot of these small dollar credit users. And so what happened was when you applied for a payday loan, that lender would check in with this subprime credit bureau and find out whether you were credit worthy. So I didn't know before I did this research that those, that second tier of credit bureaus even existed. We got the data from Clarity, we cleaned the data, we administered a survey, and then we asked people on that survey if they would be willing to be interviewed. Um, we interviewed uh, people in three different states, in California, Texas, and Florida, because they have very different regulatory environments and we wanted to see the difference. And we interviewed them at three different points in time, um, kind of ground zero, a year later, and a year after that. And for a number of those people who agreed to be interviewed, they also agreed to give us access to their personal consumer data. So I'm not going to show this because I don't really have enough time today, but I can send you a paper if you're interested that actually create a timeline and maps that consumer data um, together with the kinds of events that people said were happening in their lives that were driving the use of the small dollar credit. So let me tell you about Anna first. Anna lives in central Florida. She works for a major hotel chain that also sells timeshare properties. She's the primary breadwinner in her family. She is married. She has a couple of children. Her husband works um, in and out of construction, but he is the primary caregiver for the family. So Anna's salary works in a way that she gets a base salary and she also gets a commission based on how many properties she sells. And for her, she had calculated that the way that they manage their finances was that the commission that she got was always enough to pay the rent. And everything else that she made and her husband moving in and out of construction paid for everything else, the food, the lights, the phone bills, et cetera. Um, what happened was uh, on a particular day after Anna had been working there for five years, the company decided to change the commission formula. Um, and her income dropped precipitously. This is interesting, right? Because here's someone who has a stable job. Um, a lot of her situation stays the same, but her income changes dramatically. She goes from a stable situation to an income shock where her income is unstable. That drives her to start using um, payday loans, which she has a hard time paying back because her income is never going up commensurately with the cost that she's incurring. Um, eventually, by the time that we interviewed her the third time, her husband had gotten a full-time job because he needed to in order to stabilize the family's income. However, when we asked Anna how she was feeling and how she had managed to get out of debt because she was no longer using these loans, she told us that she'd cashed out her retirement account in order to pay off the debt and start with a clean slate. Right, so I interviewed a lot of people who were making one expensive decision to take out loans like this, which they didn't really want to do, and then um, sometimes trading that off for another decision that's also um, going to affect her negatively over the long run, which was cashing out in her entire retirement plan. Sometimes when we look at the data on payday lending use or other small dollar credit and we see somebody stopping using it, we may think of that as a good outcome, but oftentimes people are making other bad decisions at the same time. Not a great story. 
Um, the second story I want to talk to you about is, medical, is Paula's story, and it has to do with medical debt. And we heard story after story after story about people who could not manage medical expenses. And um, while we often think about health care in terms of who has insurance and who doesn't have insurance, many, many of the people that we talked to had insurance and still couldn't manage. So Paula has worked for the same telecommunications company for 20 years. She and her husband both work full time, and when we asked her how she felt their salaries were, she said, you know, we make decent money. Um, they chose where to live, which was outside Dallas, because it had a good school system. Um, her youngest son has a medical condition that requires ongoing medical attention. I think I just did that. There we go. Okay. Um, ongoing treatment and medication, and some providers don't take her insurance. Right, so she's in this situation where he has a lot of providers. Um, some of them are really working. Her son is stable. And while some of those, um, she's worked for the same company, but some of those providers have gone from taking her insurance to not taking her insurance. But she doesn't want to switch because her son's condition is stable using the providers that she uses. Um, she has to pay up front. Even though she, some of these, cover, these uh, expenses are covered, she has to pay up front for many of the costs. Um, and then it takes a long time to get reimbursed. So this is another subcategory of problem that many people experience was a mismatch between their income and their expenses, or having expenses and when those expenses would get reimbursed. Um, meanwhile, there were budget cuts in the public school district that um, changed the ability of the school district to accommodate her son's condition. So her family then moves her son to a private school, which adds to their expense. Um, at the same time as all this is happening, the employer provided health insurance that she and her husband get changes dramatically so that their costs are increasing, but their income is not. So what used to be a very small deductible is now $2,800 um, that they have to cover every year before they can start to get things covered. And so what I want to kind of pull out from those two examples is that these are two very common kinds of situations that people are finding themselves in if you think back to the income volatility issue and the retraction of the public and private safety nets. Sometimes they're invisible, but they're increasingly happening to what we think of as middle class families. So just to wrap up, I would say that what we need now is a consumer financial services system that ensures access to safe and affordable financial services for all Americans. I had the honor of serving on the Consumer Advisory Board at the CFPB when Rich Cordray was director, and um, I'm saddened by the direction that that agency has taken in terms of its leadership. We need a regulatory environment that truly protects consumers but I also think that whenever we're having the kinds of discussions we're having here today and tomorrow, we also need to think about the macro trends that enable people to attain financial health. We need to be focused on consumer protection and the regulatory environment, but we also need to be thinking about living wages and a supportive safety net for when work doesn't work. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to sit here and do more of a conversational piece, I think. Um, maybe because I'm tired, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so I think this is a good fit where I'm coming in at on this conversation. Um, uh, I, I'm actually like rewriting my, my talk in my mind now. I am going to give you a copy of my, my original talk, so you can post it if you like. It has a little more detail. But I'm kind of going to talk about, I, I see, see my uh, objective as two, two objectives, really. One is just to, to end where you, uh, start where you left off and to talk a little bit about why assets are important in thinking about protection that uh, a lot of our, it's not just about regulations and, and creating all these laws, but it's about having people in a position where they don't have to rely on predatory lending in the first place, right? So that they have some assets and, and these kind of things. And then I'm going to quickly talk about a uh, basket of tools uh, that maybe we could use to at least start a conversation around how we might build assets for people so that they have some uh, reserves for um, uh, when things come up and they can plan their lives out for their futures. 
So, so the first thing is, and, I, and I, I wish I had it ready for today, but we're doing a paper on uh, white wealth and equality. I want to emphasize that uh, oftentimes in our conversations right now, we talk a lot about the black-white wealth gap. And that kind of makes us think as though uh, wealth inequality is somehow a, a black problem or, or limited to certain segments of people, or Hispanics or other groups. But really, it's an American problem, right? I mean, there, there are tons of uh, white households who lack wealth. And, and, and as I said, we're, we're going to put a paper out next week uh, on that topic. Um, and, and, it's, and I was doing a book, and I was looking for data on it, but there really isn't data that looks specifically at uh, or very little data, I couldn't find any, so maybe you can, that specifically looks at uh, within household, uh, you know, white families' debt. I mean, not debt, but assets and wealth accumulation. So uh, that's important for us to understand, is that assets uh, are important in, in that it's an American problem, and so therefore hopefully we can get some united uh, effort in trying to create policies around um, things like redistributing wealth, Right? Uh, wealth transfers, things that have become very un-American to talk about, uh, but yet fit within our um, system of beliefs, I believe, around uh, effort and ability leading to desired outcomes. If you don't have the necessary uh, assets in your portfolio in a capitalist society, you really can't uh, achieve the same with your effort and ability that others can. And we've seen that just recently in a newspaper with the, with the colleges, right? That, that's a, a really uh, unique I say unique, um, flamboyant uh, 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 way of looking at it, but, but that happens all along the system. Um, so, so let me jump into kind of the solution. So understand that, that assets are important, and oftentimes we focus on income. Even low-income people focus on their income and not on their wealth, but it doesn't allow them to be able to uh, weather storms, right? And it has it's helped us create a system in which we only think about people's survival. Do they have enough to make it through the day? And that's not really allowing them to thrive and to take part in the American dream. Uh, and so we have to do something with wealth and equality. And that becomes a bigger problem as we innovate and, and so much becomes automated. And so it, uh, wages are stagnant and, and you have so much global competition that people can't totally rely on their income. So they have to have access to assets. So what I'm going to talk about today are uh, a package of tools. And, and one is a children's savings account. What is a children's savings account? I'll keep it simple. In, in its most basic root, it is... Uh, providing a child, a family, a household with a savings account, right? Now, oftentimes, these children's savings accounts are, are, are administered through the 529 program, if you've heard of it. It's a state college savings plan because uh, these have been thought of as or have more recently become focused on providing college access, right, a way for people to save for college. Though they're really meant to be for overall economic development right, throughout the child's lifetime. And so while we focus them very much on paying for college, uh, we can think about them as ways of building assets, not only for college, but for buying a home, starting a business, retirement, and other things throughout the, throughout the life, lifespan. But, but right now, because of the policy uh, interest is really around college, uh, they've been focused more so on college enrollment. And, and not only do they get a bank account, but uh, usually they get a one-to-one -one match, uh, sometimes it's a higher match, even a five-to-one match, but that typically is when they start later in life. And, and so you get a one, every dollar you put in, another dollar is put in. There's incentives. Uh, these programs uh, uh, really were streamlined in the beginning. We're just about having an account, having the match, and having an initial deposit. Uh, that initial deposit right now can range anywhere from $5 to $1,000 uh, in those accounts. They typically start at birth. Uh, but some start at kindergarten as well. Many others start at kindergarten. Uh, and there are some um, that start even later in life, around eighth grade or so. But, but the, the plan is really for them to be early on so that people can accumulate as, uh, wealth over time. And so even when they're saving small amounts of money, if you save small amounts of money over a long period of time in an investment account, it can turn out to be quite a bit of, bit of, of money in the end. Um, 
And, and I should say that there's a, there's a good <laughs> body of research developing around these. And, and how do, when I say a good body of research, what do I mean by that? Are there questions that have not yet been answered? Certainly. There's many questions that still need to be answered. Uh, but there are a number of randomized control trials, several, I shouldn't say a number, but several randomized, randomized control trials now in existence. One is CEDO case in, uh, uh, in Oklahoma, and uh, the Center for Social Development runs it. And it's been going on. The, the kids are just starting to hit uh, teenage years. It started from birth. And so uh, the third wave is coming up, and we'll start getting some data more around the, the, the education outcomes and stuff like that. Previ previous analysis I'm not going to go into, but it's important to understand that, that when we think about these savings accounts, we initially think about how do we accumulate assets in them. That's what I started talking about. But we found that they also have a lot of indirect effects. And what I mean by that, so for instance, in a randomized control trial, they found that it improves kids' social emotional development at age four, right? That it Im improves parents' um, uh, expectations for their children to go go to college, right? So increases their expectation, changes the way they think about their futures. And we think this is one of the reasons why I think in particular that CSAs might be a really good tool for a wealth transfer in the future, not only because of the, the um, ability to accumulate assets in them, but also it works very well with existing systems. So our Head Start program and our objectives there, uh, in, in our social emotional development programs that we create, right? It works in conjunction with all these things. And, and so I think that can be even more important than just giving people cash. Secondly, people can uh, add money to that account. Well, I've talked to you somewhat about, in a small way, about individual families being able to save in these accounts. You can also think about third parties putting money into these, into these accounts. For instance, like with initial deposits even, uh, a lot of times those come from foundations, sometimes they come from city funding, sometimes they come from state funding. There's a plethora of different ways that people can channel money into these, into these accounts. And I think the really uh, innovations in these areas will be where employers think about how they can put money in these accounts too. So we shouldn't think about it simply as in the individual saving on their own, because what your research really tells us and what we know, uh, all of us in the room, is that low-income people have small amounts of money to save, right? And so at the end of the day, they're not going to save their way out of poverty. And so I don't want to imply to you that these savings accounts are a way to, for individuals by themselves to lift themselves out of poverty, but they are a vehicle for us to figure out other ways to get money into these accounts at the same time, they themselves have the ability to contribute to that, which we think is important in and of itself. So one of our topics for the, and you're going to hit me with time, I know, so, so I, want to, I want to make sure I watch you because I'll, I'll get, I can get sidetracked, um, is, is around inclusion. And what we found with these uh, savings accounts is that the best way to do them is have them automatically enrolled into the program as opposed, and this is not novel in some senses, we know this from 401Ks and other, other research on behavior economics, uh, but what we found uh, through, the, the, and testing it in randomized control trials and such, is that automatically enrollment is the best way, right? That way you get everybody in. You would think, and we thought in the initial days of children's savings accounts, oh, if you offer families $500, everybody will take advantage of it. But there's all kinds of reasons why people don't take advantage of it. But if you put them in it, they won't leave. Right or, or very few, less than 1%. When I say less, usually like one or two families because of religious reasons have left these programs when they've been automatic enrollment. And so a place like Maine, the state of Maine, gives every kid $500 at birth into their account. And then uh, and they have about 80,000 kids at this point in time, about uh, $50 million they have put in and another $68 million that families have saved into these accounts. Uh, so, so it's actually and it's over the last uh, 78 years. So, um, but, but they started off as an opt-in program, and about 40% of people uh, took up the program. Then after, in 2014, retroactively, they added the 2013 people in, but the policy was initiated in 2014. They gave everybody the accounts, and, and now like 99.9% .9 of the people have an account with $500 in, in, in Maine, the kids born. Uh, and so when we think about inclusion, we do have to think about how do we get everybody in? Because there's many reasons why low-income families in particular, but, but many other families won't uh, uh, start up these types of accounts. Uh, beyond inclusion, so typically the way these programs work now, which I think is a policy thing that could be changed, and I like to separate that out. Sometimes we look at things and we think, well, this is the way it's happening, but really that's a 
it's because of policy and we could change that policy. But the way it works now is that with these accounts, the families, if they want to save their own money, have to open up an additional account. So you open up an ominous account that the foundation, the city, the state owns in different scenarios in which the $500 or whatever initial deposit is put in. And then the families they want to save, they have to open up another account, right? And so it's the same account, but it's another account within that account, right? So they have their own 529 in their own name, or if it's a bank account or credit union in their own name. Um, five minutes, I'm going to do it. Because um, I have some other pieces I want to add into this. And so what we have found is that low-income people can and do save, and there's been a number of randomized control trials, not only within uh, the CSA rule, but within an individual development account rule that have shown that is the case. But they save infrequently. Uh, less frequently, I should say. They're not like us where we can save every month regularly on, on, on a schedule. And so that savings might be sporadic. Uh, also, there's a number of them that just uh, don't save. And so that brings up an interesting question. You know, um, I think the problem with many of our asset building pro pro programs is that they rely on people's current income. And their income is not good, even even like tax time savings, right? That's or EITC. A lot of these things are are developed because people don't have very much money, and then we ask them to take out of that money and save. And so so there's there's problems that in that. So one of the innovations that we've we are starting and looking at are rewards cards. What are rewards cards? I wish I had my keychain with me, but if you had a keychain, you probably have some loyalty card on it, right? And uh, these loyalty cards allow families, when they go to the grocery store, to get a rebate in their account. And so every time they save, it's a 1% to 4% based upon collective spend of the group. Every time they purchase an item at the store, and that's even with food stamps or whatever else, however they purchase the item doesn't matter, uh, they get a rebate that goes into their, their, their savings account. Now, I would argue with you that the, the intent of this is not to build huge amounts of assets in a short period of time, but over time they can get $600 in their account per year. Right? And so over a number of years, that can turn out to be a substantial amount of money. And we do have some randomized control trials that we're doing around the rewards card program, and, and it's showing uh, strong uh, early results. Uh, certainly, we want to see more evidence, but, but the, the early results are strong. One of the strongest that is around engagement. And so the interesting thing about thinking about, when we think about low-income people, we have a narrative in our society that they somehow have different sets of values. And so they uh, might not uh, be future-oriented or they don't want to save or these kind of things. But really, it's not that they don't want to save. They don't have money to save, right? They're, they're making trade-offs that most people aren't asked to make. Do I eat today or don't I eat today? Do I buy, you know, pay, put money away for my kid's college education or do I um, get transportation to go to work, right? So these, these are very hard trade-offs that most people aren't going to make. Most of us who have money say because we have 401k plans and we have, it's very easy. We're not, we're not deciding whether we go on vacation or not. You know, we're, we're putting away extra money, and that's not the case for them. But one of the great things we see about the rewards cards is that it really increases engagement in the accounts. And so it, it signals to us we, that these people want to save for their families and for their kids, and if we provide them with the kinds of means that work for them, they'll make decisions to do that, right? It's not that they're not making decisions for their kids or in their best interests, right, when they, when they don't save in their savings account. It's the fact that they have little money. But if you give them avenues to do that, they will do that. We've seen this in other areas, too. Some programs have incentives where if you do certain things, they'll put money into your account for doing those things. These low-income families do these things at an equal or higher rate than high-income families. Same thing with the rewards card program. The effects are strongest among the low-income families. And so it's not a matter of a value system. It's really a matter of providing them with the kinds of tools that would work within their environments and their worlds, right, with their incomes. Um, beyond that, I think we should think about, so, so that to me is a way of, of really uh, helping families be engaged. And there's, there's even evidence to show that there's important reasons for why we want, to, we want people to have the opportunity to be engaged because it produces other effects, right? We're not just trying to give them money, but we want to create a, a whole a, a number of other effects. And so by allowing them the opportunity to participate in saving for their kids to go to college helps improve their expectations, do other kinds of things that are really viable and important, more so than just handing out the money per se, right? You still got to give them money, though, right? Because at the end of the day, they still got to be able to pay for that asset, whether it be a business, a home, or that emergency. And so uh, I don't want to – sometimes we get, like, fixated on, like, financial education. Well, financial education with no money, 
I don't know what it does for you, right? Or if you get somebody a savings account and you don't put some money or provide them ways to get money in that, it won't have the full effect. And so we have to really be conscientious of that. So some other ways quickly, and then hopefully we can have questions and answers. I can talk about research or whatever else you want to. But some other ways, so, so while these rewards cards help increase engagement, give families a way to contribute to their kids and feel like they're partaking in it, which is really important to the whole value system of that individual effort and those things, uh, they're not enough, and I recognize that. And neither are the CSAs alone enough, even though they can produce many effects that are really important that we spend lots of money on in other ways. Um, additional ways to think about it, one way is uh, early award scholarships. And what is that? What that means is uh, the College Board, if you're familiar with it, is a think tank in, in D.C., and they do a lot of work around um, uh, college trends and stuff. Anyhow, they suggested taking a piece of the Pell Grant, for instance, uh, five to ten percent of that, putting into the kid's account when they're about fifth grade, start putting it in then uh, into a child savings account as a way of building uh, building assets in that account, right? And so what that does is, I don't even think we fully understand, uh, because what it does is, is it empowers kid. If you grew up with an asset, we can talk about free college, which you get the money on the other side. I'm a high school dropout who, who was homeless for periods of time, and I can tell you, I didn't think about 18 in the same way that most of the rest of you did. I, even now, I still don't – I graduated my Ph.D. program in three years, not because I was especially smart, because I wasn't, but I was one of the few people to do it, one of one other person at that time, because I always felt like something was going to happen, because that was my life experience. And so I felt like i got to get out before things fall apart on me, right? And so I want you to understand that giving people who grew up with an asset, you say what Mitt Romney says – or well, just borrow the money, right? And people, and that's, we criticize in some ways, but people should grow up with that sense of, and that gives you something that allows you to navigate your surroundings and your world in a different way. So it's not just about providing them assets on that far end, but it's also about providing them assets up front so they grow up with what everybody else grows up with and so they can start thinking about their futures in an extended time period in planning for it. And so this is, this is really, and I, we, we haven't even begun to really study those types of bargaining power issues that having assets and growing up with assets creates. And so by taking a scholarship in our whole mindset right now, our challenge is, is to convert that mindset. Instead of giving the money on the back end, and it's partly how we perceive a people and what they'll do with the money, give them the money on the front end. And in these accounts, it's protected. So they can't use it for other types of things anyhow, but you allow them to, to grow up with that asset. So early award scholarships is one way, and not only thinking about the federal uh, scholarships, but also thinking about your foundation, right, and, and the local places that can do that. Uh, P cards, what are P cards? It's kind of like a rewards card for uh, a company. If, you know, you have a purchasing card even here at the school or the university, and I would like for the university to start thinking about how they might leverage their P card. There are... Um, fees that credit card companies charge you and that financial institutions charge you. And, and a part of that fee is actually taken, the, the bank institution agrees to put, to give back a portion of that fee and put it into an account for the kids for college savings accounts. So like in Long Beach, California, uh, they, they have taken a piece of their procurement, and this is a pilot that starts in the fall, so I don't have actual data from it yet. And, and they can estimate fairly accurately because they can base on last year's expenditures. And if they, they take these expenditures, they spend them this year, how much they'll have? They'll have about $15 million a year just from using a P card. As a, and they'll put that into the to a children's savings account to help build assets, right? So I think these kinds of things, and I don't care if you decide on rewards cards or P cards or whatever else. It's important that we just begin to think about what are ways to help low-income families build money in these assets, in, into these savings accounts, and, and, and help them build for the future. I know I'm out of time. So, so don't think about it as, as we have to do rewards cards, we have to do P cards, but think about how can we innovate? A lot of you are bright and young here, right? And you can find new ways to innovate on these programs to find ways to help low-income people build assets because assets are, are, are tremendously important for them to have stable lives. I want to say more. Do we have? So I know we'll probably have some audience questions. I actually wanted to kick us off with one because I think each of you touched on this theme of we see the the disparate impact of wealth inequality, income inequality on 
poor communities, communities of color, but it's obviously a much wider spread issue than that. And so I'm wondering, for this room of community advocates and, and policymakers, how we think about this, this discussion, right? There, there's obviously groups of people that are disproportionately impacted by the wealth gap, by the income gap, and there's other structural inequities that contribute to that, right? We think about people with ethnic names on the same resume with, uh, like that, on a white name, right, and who's more likely to get that job. You think about, you know, um, a formerly incarcerated person who's white having a better chance of getting a job than a black person who's never been incarcerated. So there's these other structural inequities. But I, I'd be curious to get each of your takes on as you're framing the conversation with regulators and policymakers, as you're thinking about your research, how do you sort of navigate this tension between focus on those that we know are disproportionately affected, not just for financial reasons, but other structural reasons, and making this, this, these set of issues more broadly appealing and more broadly important to, to a group of stakeholders? I mean, I, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, when you say more broadly appealing, I'm assuming you're meaning to like the broader it's, you know, public, it's a bigger the problem, public, the right, people who, right. right? Because it's really hard to, um, unfortunately, it's really hard to pass laws that target a particular disadvantaged group, right? right? We see a lot of pushback against affirmative action. Congress won't even audience a conversation about reparations. There's, you know, we know that. And so one of the things I think of in answer to that question is um, there's a political theorist named Theda Scotchball who talks about targeting within universalism, which is the idea that if you make, uh, you make good policy that will protect everyone, like the CFPB does, for example, just in terms of this conversation, um, it will disproportionately help p those people who are suffering disproportionately, which isn't to say that we shouldn't have conversation about targeting or focusing on particular groups. I think, you know, recognizing that black and Latino families lost much more in terms of their assets and the financial crisis, like we keep needing to tell that story. But I think strategically, I often think uh, that it we might get farther um, if we push forward those kind of universal policies that will help everyone. But like like child savings accounts, right? They're gonna they're gonna help lots of people. Some people would say like, well, why are you gonna start that savings account for someone who's already wealthy? Because that's what you need to do to get the lo the legislation passed, right? But it's, those accounts are gonna disproportionately affect the kids who wouldn't have any savings when they graduated from high school. Yeah, I would jump in on that. So, um, and so this is maybe, so, so Michael Shred, you know, you, you know Michael Shred. Uh, he would talk about, and I think it's relevant and important, I'm not, uh, is, is universalism, getting everybody to count. And I, I also think it's important to get everybody to count because once you get the infrastructure in place, his argument is, then you can pump resources. So once everybody has an account, you can pump resources into a variety of ways. But I also do think that, um, A, we live in a moment that's different, thank God. And even though it's very scary in some ways, politically, uh, we see now the opportunity to talk about free college and other things. And that, that this, we do need to change our, our frame of thought because we're not gonna ever solve wealth inequality uh, by giving everybody the same thing. And so even, I don't wanna use names, uh, but anyhow, um, <laughs> uh, talk about reparations. Uh, if we, everybody has an account, we can pump money in, but we do have to think about, here's, here's the best example I can give. If we're all sick and have the flu, right? Now, it, or something worse than the flu. We're going to die if we don't get the vaccination. I have it and you have it. I have it worse, but in either case, we're both going to die. So I need a bigger dose of it than you do, but we both need that vaccine. And so we have a common interest in that vaccine being made either way because we're both going to die without it, even if I need more. And, and really, that's the kind of the case with wealth. And that's kind of the reason why we get this white wealth paper coming out, is really to say that, you know what, this affects us all, that we all need this. Even if someone else needs a bigger dose, you need a dose too. And so we have a collective interest in developing policies like that. And I do think that's the biggest challenge, right, is how do we begin to have converse, it not just taking a position of, well, we can't get this passed. What do we need to do to get it done? And how do we have to change the narrative in order to make it happen? How does it work with effort and ability? How is it still, you can't just tell people to, to forget their values, but how does a wealth transfer 
fit within American values so that you and I, all of us, can grab a hold of it and take it and move, move it forward, right? So I don't want to say too much. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, uh, I think that um, part of the challenge probably is a systems issue still, and this is where data may actually help to overcome it. So we think about, I mean, uh, the 45 million people who don't have a credit history, they may not have a credit history because there wasn't a cosigner, there wasn't the ability to get credit when they were younger. I mean, lots of factors in that massive number of people, but yet the ability to get credit is predicated on having a history um, at some level. And so, I think about access to the financial system and the way that people are identified to get into the financial system and in a very simple way, that is your bank that you may be approaching to open up an account with is going to ping one of the credit bureaus. Well, are you in the credit bureau? Or maybe you're in the credit bureau but your address has changed a lot because you happen to move a lot more and that happens to be something that is actually more common among lower income individuals and families, and so then you're red flagged. So I, I tend to think about um, that part of what we're trying to sort out is where can more nuanced information in these different uh, applications potentially overcome what are processes and systems that have tended to exacerbate sort of the differences and the divide that exists by income or by um, uh, ethnicity, uh, race. Yeah. Do audience questions? I wanna Wake up, everybody. Come on. We got the side arms up. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. My name is Jessica Kaplan. Okay. Um, uh, several of you alluded to behavioral economics and decision making. Um, can you all elaborate a little bit on that? You talked about the opt in versus opt out and that huge differential in percentage. Um, I would be curious to hear your thoughts and your work on that. Do you want to go first? Or? Go no. I can. Um, sure. I think uh, one of the ways that I see that playing out in the in terms of the behavior that that I saw in terms of people making their decisions I think when people are using um, expensive alternative financial services um, there's a perception that they don't understand that the costs how high the costs are and that if they knew better they would make other choices um, in many cases oh I would use a bank instead of a check casher um, and so when I was really trying to think about the theoretical underpinnings like how to explain what people did in many cases it was actually rational behavior so that's not behavioral economics it was sort of like it's actually cheaper to do what they were doing than to than to do what I would do um, but in other cases I felt like the um, the scarcity theory that was that's been put forth by Elder Shafir and Sudhir um, Mullenathan actually help to explain and that idea is really that people when they're in a scarcity mindset when they have um, a, a problem which is kind of like what you were talking about in terms of making a choice between buying groceries or um, or saving or paying the rent or doing something else that that creates uh, a pressure on that decision making moment in which they're deciding what will relieve the pressure in the very short term without necessarily thinking as much because they don't have the it's, it's actually something psychological that's happening that makes the decision to relieve the pressure in that moment make more sense I'll try to be quick because I wasn't last time so um, I, I do think I think it's an interesting question and, and one that I grapple with uh, really with the, the to respects of institutional theory of saving in a way and in behavioral uh, approaches. And, and I would say this in, in, with regard to that, two things. One, one is that uh, I think most of our mainstream institutions work. We see them work every day for upper income families. Uh, and so I think even sometimes when we talk about getting everybody included, that's an incomplete question uh, because it's not just about getting them included, but then giving them the means 
to be able to use those institutions effectively, right? So, so don't just give me a bank account, but then give me some money so that I can leverage that bank account and use it in ways that are productive. So the tension in my mind with behavioral economics is, and though I respect and, and appreciate it, is are these things about one changing their behavior? On some level they are. Or are they about institutions, chicken or the egg, right? I, I tend to believe that it's about giving them access to the institutions and not about the behavior. Uh, but at the same time, so, so one more quick example, and I'll be quiet, uh, is Michael Sheridan would talk about if, like savings accounts being an institutional solution. However, the reality is we can't make it, people save out of their checks. And so there's still a certain amount of behavior that has to take place. So I think that behavior economics has a lot to offer, even within these kinds of models, because at some level there's behavior that will have to uh, take place, and they can inform that. But they shouldn't be, but they're kind of, for me, they're on the second tier instead of on the frontier. Oftentimes we want to say, just do the behavioral thing. Hey, teach them financial education or, or whatever else, right? And that in and of itself is not sufficient, but it really isn't an either or argument. It's about, it's about both. And things like mental accounting and stuff around behavioral economics and thinking about those things will be really, is really enlightening on how people structure and use their money. Uh, but we still have this problem of people don't have money and we still have this problem they don't have access to institutions and we have to solve those two problems and then the behavior can come along with that. I don't know if that's very helpful, but. It's a real tension. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Dan Mellett. I'm a retiree, but I have uh, 30 years of uh, corporate finance experience and worked extensively in the capital markets. Uh, thank you very much for your, your, your talk here. But Professor Elliott, I, I have to say I'm somewhat disappointed. That's but I thank you for your talk, but I am disappointed. And we don't seem to be addressing what the real issue is here. And this is coming from my own experience is that modern finance is parasitic. Okay, you, this savings plan that you talked about, what would prevent a, a, an earnest young person, now he has a savings account, he, so he's gonna go to some for-profit school, get some sort of crappy degree, suck all his savings away, and he's got nothing. I mean, that, I think what we've seen is, since the late 70s, with the advent of deregulation, and advances in, in uh, micro, uh, finan microeconomics and finance like Black Shoals and efficient uh, market. And with the advent of PCs, we, finance took off. And what happened? Well, global economic growth went down. Right? The BIS, uh, the IMF, you know, bastions of neoliberal finance recognized that finance is too big, right? Even the um, the chief economist of the Bank of England, Andy Haldane, would recognize, and he's written extensively, that finance provides no value. So maybe what we need is financial repression. Now, I know this is quixotic, you know, because the, the powers out there are, are pretty powerful, but, you know, maybe we need uh, a change in the bankruptcy law. The bankruptcy law has changed in 2005, completely in favor of the creditors. Maybe that needs to change. You know, maybe we need a financial transaction tax. Maybe we need massive increase in capital requirements for banks. And that's what needs to be addressed here. And I think you're around at this. Um, sorry. That's, that's my thoughts. I appreciate that. And I would, I would say that uh, I would call that tinkering around to some degree. I, I would rather not go into bankruptcy. So I, so I think you need to have bankruptcy laws, right? So I think it's... No, I think they need to change. You need, well, even, even something around college debt. All that, all that stuff around bankruptcy needs to be changed. I agree. So I'm not arguing that. But there is, it would be nice, and I'm someone who has gone bankrupt before, uh, to not go bankrupt, in, regardless of the laws, and have to be in a position of growing up in a family with wealth. And I don't think we should think about these accounts exclusively for college. And they should be, not to spin to that in the beginning, as way, and, and really as a, just a, a platform for additional assets to be in there. But that doesn't mean that we also don't need to address financial regulations and other things and make a good system so that once they get the money, it's not all taken from them 
through corrupt laws, right? And so it's like behaviorism and institutionalism. You don't want to argue the two. They both are needed. In this case, these both are needed. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Amelia Rourke Owens. I'm with America Saves. And um, Professor Elliott, I have a very specific question for you, and then I have a broader question for the whole panel. Um, I am interested in hearing some of the nuts and bolts of the loyalty card. Um, you know, it, it doesn't sound like it's a credit card, but if it wasn't, um, how did you get different businesses to agree to engage in this, and how did you build that infrastructure? Um, and then kind of taking that more broadly to the panel, a lot of what we're talking about on this financial inclusion panel is how people are being excluded or are not benefiting equally from other people from the institutions that do exist. And I'm curious to hear y'all's thoughts on using different institutions and programs and partnerships as I'm wondering if you did with the loyalty card to try to capture different segments of the population to pull them in to these systems that do exist and how can we be using these partnerships and engagements to be ultimately building more inclusion. I, I, I've taken up a bit of time. I won't take too much on this. I'll simply say that the nuts and bolts maybe we can discuss afterwards. There's a group called Community Link that created the rewards card. It is not a credit card, and that's what makes it a little bit distinct. Uh, and so let's talk about that afterwards. Um, I'll just talk about one example from my own research uh, in terms of thinking about other institutions and how to pull people in. So um, everything that we've talked about today has been either mainstream or alternative financial services, and there's a whole other segment of the consumer financial services system, which is informal financial services, that were used uh, broadly and widely in the communities where I worked. Um, one of them, some of you probably, one of the mechanisms some of you probably know, which is rotating savings and credit associations. Anybody not know what those are? Okay, wow, a couple of you. Okay, I'll be very quick. So let's say a group of 10 people decide to save together. Um, Melissa is the banker. 10 of us give Melissa $100 this week. With a fee. No fee. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. <laughs> You're messing up my example. Um, I'm making so a point. <laughs> Melissa is the uh, Melissa's the banker. She's going to keep the thousand dollars that she collected. That first, she's put in a hundred dollars too. <clears throat> the next week, I get the pot of a thousand dollars, and the next week, Billy gets the pot, um, and so it goes. So there's kind of for us a free. No cost, short term, small dollar loan for Melissa and me, the people at the front of the line, and it's for savings at the people at the end of the line. Um, those work incredibly well in a lot of communities. There are people who are um, upper middle class who've been doing them for generations, and they continue to participate in them because, for lots of reasons. Um, there are problems, right? One, one problem is Melissa could run away with the money, I could run away with the money and disappear, and then there's hard to hold me to account because there's no paper, right? Um, also, my credit report, my credit score is not getting built by paying into that, even though I've been doing it for 20 years. Um, there's a program in the Bay Area called the Mission Asset Fund. Maybe you've heard of them, right? Okay, so Mission Asset Fund kind of took this idea that's happening informally and formalized it. Jose Quinones, who started it and won one of the MacArthur Genius Grants, and what they're doing is creating these lending circles. Um, making sure that if somebody doesn't pay back, there's some insurance and they're reporting to, um, to credit bureaus and trying to move people into banks once they're stable enough to do that. So I think uh, there are lots of examples like that. The reason I like that one is that it, instead of trying to change people's behavior, it was building on something people were already doing and saying, how can we make this more robust and really work for people? And the one that I'll add is um, it's thinking about especially for um, lower income uh, people and households who are receiving federal benefits or state benefits. Uh, and then, of course, there's the annual tax refund moment where um, some of us in government at the federal level have really sought to try to leverage those money transfer payments as an opportunity to drive savings activity um, uh, as well as my RA product I was talking about earlier. I haven't kept up with this as much. Um, and there were challenges with these things, which I think, you know, we actually probably need to push ourselves to think about why didn't some of these efforts work well. How much of it was on the realities of the household and what they're dealing with, because I don't think we had 
the level of research of Lisa's and others, um, Rachel Schneider, for instance. And so I'm not sure who's thinking about how we calibrate the learnings we've had over the past half decade into then thinking about those significant institutions who are on a very routine, even bi-weekly basis, distributing monies, <coughs> distributing benefits, and trying to think about then how to leverage those money, mo money moments either if it's around trying to facilitate even emergency savings accumulations or financial management types of tools. But I do know that there's been more effort recently at the state level thinking about state benefits. Um, there are some interesting, dare I say it, fintech companies who are trying to build yeah. products and offerings in that way. Um, so probably more to sort of think about and sort through. Yeah. But partnership, especially with foundational institutions that are credible, right, and that are trusted, feel like an important potential lever to do things at scale. Do we have time for one more? Um, so my question would be the structure of all that, like we've started to get to that in some of these questions, is something like, Postal banking or partnerships with bank. Like, I mean, how do you get these accounts? Get someone to even manage these accounts? If we, if one of the goals is to make sure more and more people have access to some sort of financial account. Right. And I come from technology law, where all these people are promising so many different things outside of fintech, even. But you know, automated vehicles is the, what I work on day to day, and it's mm -hmm. like, oh, it's going to change mobility. But you have to have a credit card to use Uber, and these systems are all based off of Uber, and that's just one area where. Every, you know, people developing a lot of this advanced technology that's supposed to improve everyone's lives, and even when they say they're going to improve low-income people's lives, they forget that when you don't have access to banking, you don't have access to a credit card or a debit card, right. you're not, you know, the unbanked seem to be a huge, at a huge disadvantage. So I'm just wondering, you know, politicians throw out postal banking as an option, but is it, is it easier to just incentivize local banks or credit unions to already work with these people? Does it take postal banking? I have, I Actually, have the panelist who's missing was is an expert. Um, well, we had somebody who couldn't come today. We actually have an expert in the audience, too, Terry Friedline here, Dr. Terry Friedline. She does a lot of postal banking. But, uh, yeah. Terry? But, but, uh, Refer to the panel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but the post, you weren't talking specifically about postal banking. You were just saying, what can we use in, in someone like, uh, CSD and Michael Sherrod really look at the 529s as a, as a platform because every state has one now. So, so that's already in place. There, there needs to be some policy tweaks to them. Right now they really favor higher income families and stuff, but if you tack the CSA portion onto it, it can be used more widely. Uh, but, but there are other systems we could think about. And then once you do automatic enrollment and you put everybody in the account, then they're banked, right? Um, and then you might change the flexibility is not only used for college, but for other assets and things like that. But, but the system is kind of in place. Now it's a matter of getting everybody hooked up to it, right? I think, too, one other thing I would say is just, as I, I said something at the beginning of my remarks, just about how we haven't really altered the banking or the kind of the, the financial services system to meet the kind of realities of work. Um, and I, I think one of the things that was really important to the people that I waited on was that they could get their cash as quickly as possible. So the fact that you have people who are living, many more people who are living really close to the edge, and they would, many of them had bank accounts actually. Half of the people who came to the check cashing store also had a bank account. Um, but if they deposited their check in the bank account, they wouldn't get it for three or four days. And in the meantime, they had to buy food, pay the rent. They risked actually having late fees on a lot of things um, if they couldn't pay those things. So it was actually worth it to pay the almost 2% of the, the face value of the check to cash it in order to do those other things. Now, there's some really interesting technology. Ripple in San Francisco is using blockchain technology to try to create a distributed ledger system that would allow um, payments, any kind of value to be transferred immediately and without cost. And so I do think that there are some of those things, and frankly, banks, you know, banks can take up to a day to, to put cash into your account and make it available. You show up to your bank with a pile of cash and it won't be immediately available. To me, that's crazy, right? So here's a role for policy, I think, where there's, it, it, you can 
require banks to shorten that window, and we haven't done that. Um, so so I, I don't know that it needs to be an entirely different kind of institution, but I think there are ways that we could uh, implement to make the institutions that we have work work better and, cre and reduce some of those barriers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so with that, we are going to call it a wrap for today. If the speakers could hang around um, and come up so we can talk a little bit. But for the rest of you, please come back tomorrow. Uh, we will start at uh, breakfast again, 8.30. Good breakfast. Um, 9 o'clock, uh, Federal Trade Commissioner Rohit Chopra will be in conversation.